This is a lecture series on the biology and pathology of bone. We're going to begin with a lecture on the normal structure and function of bone, followed by a discussion of a series of the diseases of bone, beginning with developmental disturbances, uh, then followed by vascular diseases of bone, metabolic diseases of bone, infectious diseases, and finally, if time permits, a discussion of the neoplasms of bone. If we could have the lights off, please, and the slides. The first discussion involves the development and growth of bone. Bone is a tissue. Bones are organs. This is important that you bear this in mind as we think about the specific diseases associated with bone as a tissue compared to those diseases that are associated with bones as organs. And as a tissue, bone consists of a specialized connective tissue which consisting of collagen fibers and sulfated mucopolysaccharides uh, allows these tissues to become mineralized. This is in contrast to other such connective tissues which, while containing similar elements, do not undergo mineralization. And just to have everyone working from the same basis as far as terminology is concerned so that we get the terms straight before we begin discussing long bones, we have the epiphysis at either end of the bone, the growth plate in the immature animal that separates the epiphysis from the metaphysis, and then the shaft of the bone referred to as the diaphysis and the medullary cavity, which forms the central, central cavity of long bones. The surface of the cortex being covered by the periosteum and the epiphyseal ends of the bone covered by articular cartilage. If we consider bone formation, there are two types of bone formation enchondral formation or cartilage model formation, as it may be more properly termed, and intramembranous formation of bone or collagen model. In the first, bone forms in a prior cartilage model, and the long bones are classic examples of this type of bone formation. In the case of intramembranous bone formation, bone is formed in a connective tissue framework without the intermediate form of cartilage being produced. And the classic example here are the facial bones of the skull. In enchondral bone formation, you have cartilage, which undergoes a maturation process. The matrix remains behind and becomes a model or a scaffold on which new bone is deposited on the surfaces. In contrast, in intramembranous formation, the bone forms directly out of the connective tissue framework. So we go directly from loose connective tissue elements, which are the white areas that you see here, to the pink areas, which represent bone which has been formed by the intramembranous process. The cells of bone and the composition of bone are as you see them here on the screen, in the case of dry, fat-free bone. The cells comprise only approximately 5% of the total bone matrix. And these consist of the osteoblasts, the osteocytes, and the osteoclasts. And we'll discuss each of these individually in a few moments. The matrix of bone consists of both organic matrix and mineralized matrix. In the case of the organic matrix, or the osteoid, this comprises approximately one-third or 30 percent of the bone matrix and consists of collagen and the mucopolysaccharide protein complexes, or the so-called proteoglycans of bone. The mineral comprises nearly two-thirds of the total bone matrix and consists of predominantly hydroxyapatite and other ions such as sodium, uh, citrate, and so on that make up the remainder of the mineral matrix. Discussing the cells specifically, the osteoblasts are protein-producing cells which contain a, an abundant complex of rough endoplasmic reticulum a prominent Golgi apparatus and large numbers of mitochondria. They're classical cells that are involved in the production of a protein matrix. 
The matrix that they produce is referred to as osteoid, and it may be laid down in either a woven or a lamellar fashion. In the case of the woven matrix, it consists of co collagen fibers which are laid down in burlap fashion, in contrast to collagen fibers which are laid down in lamellar fashion, laid down one layer upon another layer to give the lamellar arrangement. And we'll be referring to this later on as we discuss the formation of the organic matrix. And finally, the osteoblast is a direct participant in the mineralization process that's involved in the deposition of mineral within the organic matrix once it's been produced. The osteoblasts form a layer of cells on the surface of bone, and about 10 percent of that population of osteoblasts become embedded in the matrix that they produce. The remaining 90 percent are thought to undergo a modulation process where they de-differentiate, if you will, to a less differentiated cell and go back through this cycle of a less differentiated cell back into the production of new osteoid and the formation of new matrix. So that the 10 percent of those cells that become embedded in the matrix become the osteocytes that we'll refer to and discuss later on. Here is an undecalcified section of bone in which we have osteoblasts on the surface, a layer of osteoid depicted here in red beneath the cells, and beneath that the green or the blue-green representing mineralized bone matrix. You're seeing the same section, only a modified von Kassa stain at the bottom with the osteoblasts here, the layer of osteoid here, and the junction of that unmineralized osteoid with the mineralized bone beneath, represented by this ragged line that you see between the two, which is referred to as the mineralization front, or the area in which new mineral is being deposited as mineralization follows along behind this layer of unmineralized osteoid that's being produced by the osteoblasts. Here's a little higher magnification of unmineralized bone depicted by the green, the layer of osteoid, and a layer of very prominent osteoblasts on the surface. The remainder of this consists of loose areolar connective tissue, small vascular spaces, and mononuclear cells that give rise to the developing osteoblasts that form on the surface of the bone. The schematic of an osteoblast here depicting the prominent endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, the mitochondria, and the fact that the tropocollagen units that are produced by the endoplasmic reticulum are extruded into the extracellular space from the surface of the cell. The mucopolysaccharides are packaged in the area of the Golgi apparatus, transported to the surface of the cell in vesicles, and then through a process of exocytosis, extruded into the extracellular space. So the two primary components of the organic matrix, the collagen fibers, or the precursors of the mature collagen fibers, and the mucopolysaccharides, are extruded into the extracellular space, and the final maturation process of the mature collagen fiber takes place extracellularly. And then mineralization of that matrix, once the maturation process has taken place, occurs and we have mineralized bone. If we look at that in an electron micrograph, here we have an osteoblast, another, and a portion of another. You can appreciate, I think, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex in this area here of this cell and over in this region here. The precursors of the collagen fibers are extruded into the extracellular space along with the mucopolysaccharides and that thus forms the osteoid seam interposed between the layer of cells and the mineralized bone beneath. And in the upper left of the screen is a less differentiated cell that's a pre-osteoblast developing at this point a fairly prominent rough endoplasmic reticulum and as that maturation process continues will become more like the osteoblast that you see here adjacent to the osteoid seam. To discuss the development of the collagen precursors, we begin with the tropocollagen unit which has a protein end piece 
which is cleaved away in the process of hydrolysis, leaving the typical triple helix of precursor collagen. These units aggregate to form microfibrils, and so we get an aggregation of approximately five or six of these precursor units. These become in a, laid down in a staggered array so that we have spaces between the ends of the collagen fibrils or the precursor units. This leaves spaces which gives the periodicity that we normally associate with collagen fibers either microscopically or ultrastructurally. The microfibrillar units then proceed to become aggregated into a larger unit that forms the mature collagen fiber. And with the continued occurrence of the spaces between the ends of the collagen fibers, we develop the full collagen fibril. Notice that in addition to the spaces between the, between the ends of the fibers, which become filled with mineral, which is deposited, and thus the mineralization process takes place within the collagen fiber as well as on the surface of the collagen fiber. Initially, it was thought that the mineral that was deposited within the collagen fiber was deposited totally within the spaces between the microfibrillar units. It's now known that the majority of the mineral within the collagen fiber is in the central core that's formed as a result of the aggregation of the microfibrillar units. So it not only is between these end pieces, but it's also between, within the central core of the collagen fiber. Light microscopically, we have the collagen fibers with the typical periodicity. And as you can see, a lot of space in this area, which is unoccupied by collagen fibers. And schematically shown here, we see what makes up the majority of the spaces between the collagen fibers. And these are structural units referred to as proteoglycans, which have this spider-like arrangement that make up the majority of the ground substance that fills the spaces between the collagen fibers. And here is an illustration of the structure of the proteoglycan aggregate. It contains a central core of hyaluronic acid, which is covered, covered by link proteins. So it's a protein-covered core of hyaluronic acid, which in turn is covered by subunits of keratin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate. And so this makes up the proteoglycan aggregate that surrounds the collagen fibers. And here, an electron micrograph negative image showing the proteoglycan subunits. The function of proteoglycans are primarily that of inhibiting mineralization. And that is one of binding cations to inhibit the mineralization process, primarily to allow time for the maturation process to take place within the collagen fibers so that those fibers are mature at the time mineralization is initiated. Now, if we divide bone formation into two processes, it's one of the formation first of organic matrix followed by the mineralization of that matrix once it's been deposited. The mineralization is a series of steps that terminates in, one, the extraction of water from the collagen, the conversion of collagen to a phosphoprotein that's mediated by the presence of phospholipids, and finally, the active cellular delivery, primarily by osteoblasts, of mineral to the transformed organic matrix. So the mineralization process then, like the bone formation itself, can be divided into a two-step process, primary mineralization and secondary mineralization. The first step is one of the deposition of amorphous calcium phosphate within the collagen matrix followed by conversion of that matrix into hydroxyapatite. So that's the two-step process of mineralization. The formation first of amorphous calcium phosphate followed by the conversion to hydroxyapatite. Here is an osteoblast in the upper left, mineralized bone in the lower right, 
the osteoid seam interposed between the cell and the mineralized matrix. And if you notice, we have multiple loci of dense mineral deposits within the osteoid seam. Notice also that the size of these is much larger as you approach the mineralized interface than it is back toward the cytoplasmic processes of the osteoblast. This process of mineralization begins with the extrusion of vesicles from the surface of the osteoblast, primarily from the cytoplasmic processes. So we have membrane-bound vesicles that are extruded into the osteoid seam and the extracellular space. These take up amorphous calcium phosphate and concentrate calcium and phosphate ions within them and on the surface of the membrane. And as this occurs, we see the increased density of mineral deposition on these vesicles. That's what we were seeing in the previous slide that, that had the multiple loci of mineralization within that osteoid seam. As mineral continues to accumulate within the membrane-bound vesicles and hydroxyapatite formation is initiated within that vesicle, as the apatite crystals grow in size, they rupture the membrane of the vesicle. And at this point, the exposed crystals continue to grow rapidly in size and increase in number, and you get a very rapid mineralization of the collagen matrix of the osteoid seam. This process is referred to as epitaxy and is the rapid formation of mineral within the collagen matrix of the osteoid seam. It's a process very similar to that that one experiences if you cook candy beyond the critical point and it suddenly becomes crystalline and turns to sugar on you. Very similar process. Once the membrane vesicles, uh, membrane of the vesicles rupture and the process continues at a rapid pace. And so we convert then collagen fibers with their proteoglycan ground substance from unmineralized tissue to a mineralized tissue with mineral deposited both within the central core, within the whole spaces of the collagen fibers, as well as on the surface of those collagen fibers. The various nutritional factors that take, play a role in the mineralization of the matrix include the things that I have listed here. Calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, I think we all associate those three nutrients with bone mineralization. Protein as a factor in the formation of organic matrix and vitamin A and vitamin C. And as you'll see when we begin discussing the diseases, the deficiencies or excesses of either vitamin A or vitamin C play an important role in either the formation of the organic matrix and or the mineralization of that matrix. To move on then to the second cell of the three in the cells of bone and discussing the osteocytes, we said earlier that about 10 percent of the population of osteoblasts become osteocytes. These cells function in the formation of bone as well as the resorption of bone, a process that's been referred to as osteocytic osteolysis. So they have the capability of both forming and resor resorbing to a limited degree bone matrix and therefore in the process play an important role in mineral homeostasis. And probably their most important role is that of controlling the calcium and phosphorus levels in the blood, the fine-tuned control of calcium phosphorus homeostasis on an hour-to-hour -hour basis where we contribute both calcium and phosphate ions to blood or remove calcium and phosphate ions from the blood and deposit it in bone as needed. Here we see osteocytes contained within their lacunae. The dark red areas that you see are the osteocytes which with a basic fuchsin stain in this undecalcified section of bone take up the intense red staining. The feather-like projections that you see extending from each of those dark red lacunae containing the osteocytes are the osteocytic processes that extend out into the canaliculi in bone. And of course the soft tissues of the central canal of this osteome also take the intense red stain. 
ultrastructurally, we have osteoblasts on the surface of bone, the loci of mineralization occurring within the osteoid seam, a cell here that is becoming entrapped in bone and about at this point 50 percent in, encased in mineralized bone, and three other cells that now have been completely surrounded by the mineralized bone matrix. So these are mature osteocytes by definition. And even here you can see the difference in the cytoplasmic makeup of the cell on the surface compared to those in the tissue beneath. As the cells become entrapped in bone, they lose their large complement of cytoplasm that's character characteristic of the osteoblast, losing a large percentage of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, and the mitochondria so that there's a marked reduction in overall cytoplasmic volume of the osteocyte compared to the osteoblast. The spaces or the holes that you see in this black mineralized bone matrix are the canaliculi that contain the osteocytic processes of the osteocytes embedded in bone that allow the cytoplasmic processes of these cells to interconnect with osteoblasts on the surface so that we have a communication network set up then between the cytoplasmic processes of the osteoblasts and the cytoplasmic processes of the osteocytes. Here's a mature osteocyte. You can see the mitochondria, few profiles of endoplasmic reticulum, no Golgi complex present in this particular section. The paralacunar space that's contained between the membrane of the cell and the surface of the mineralized bone. And it's in this area that the exchange of calcium and phosphate ions takes place between the surface of the cell and the surface of the surrounding bone. A schematic here to point out that the cytoplasmic processes of one cell make contact with the cytoplasmic processes of other cells to maintain this communication network and that between these cytoplasmic processes there are dense junctions that occur between the plasma membranes of the adjacent cells. And another schematic to show the difference in concentration of calcium ions particularly between the extracellular fluid and the fluid that surrounds the osteocyte within the osteocytic lacunae. And you'll notice that that concentration is about three times greater in the extracellular fluid than it is in the fluid surrounding the osteocyte. The calcium ions cross first the plasma membrane of the osteoblast, are transported across the cell, and either through transfer across the dense junctions of the cytoplasmic processes or by their transfer through the plasma membrane into this extracellular space around the osteocyte. By one route or the other, or perhaps both, these ions are transported to the vicinity of the osteocyte or then either transport into bone or out of bone takes place. And so that transport process is one of going from bone to osteocyte to the osteoblast and to the extracellular fluid. And this suggests also the fact that the osteoblasts form an envelope of cells on the bone surface, basically separating the surface of bone from the extracellular matrix or the extracellular space and becoming the first line of communication between that extracellular space and the cells embedded within the bone. <clears throat> the last cell of the bone series is the osteoclast. And these cells are involved primarily in remodeling of bone and secondarily in mineral, mineral homeostasis. Certainly their primary process is one of removing large amounts of bone matrix when remodeling of the bone structure is needed. These cells are unique in that they're multinucleated cells, uh, very typical of multinucleated giant cells in any other area of the body. They're most active over bone surfaces where osteocytes have evidence of osteocytic osteolysis. And here, osteoclasts on the surface of bone over concavities in the surface of bone that are referred to as Hauschip's lacunae. 
and the slide be no, be, beneath has these concavities in the surface of bone. There are no osteoclasts present, but it indicates that by looking at a surface of mineralized bone, one can tell whether or not there's been osteoclastic resorption or not, because these resorption cavities in the surface, in this very scalloped appearance, is indicative that osteoclastic resorption has recently taken place, in contrast to bone forming surfaces, which are very smooth and uniform on the surface. Here's an osteoclast, you can appreciate the multiple nuclei, hanging ten here over a ledge of bone. The next slide's a little higher magnification. You can see the nuclei here. You can get some suggestion that there's a large number of vacuoles present in this area of the cytoplasm, immediately adjacent to the bone. And you can even appreciate the ruffled border that's present beneath, between the cell and the mineralized bone surface. Schematic of the osteoclast indicating the multiple nuclei that are present fairly large numbers of mitochondria, and the area adjacent to the ruffled border, which contains large numbers of vacuoles. Notice also that there's a sealing area of the osteoclast that more or less attaches this cell in sucker-like fashion to the underlying bone matrix, so that it isolates this area of the ruffled border adjacent to the mineralized bone. And these finger-like projections of the ruffled border, then with the vacuoles, which release collagenase and hydrogen ions that provide an acid environment, provide all the necessary ingredients for both resorbing the mineral phase of the bone as well as the organic matrix of the bone. As the resorption process takes place, the breakdown products and the degradation products are taken up in vesicles adjacent to the ruffled border and the vesicles transported across the surface of the cell and extruded into the extracellular space as either calcium ions, phosphate ions, or peptides which eventually give rise to the hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine that are breakdown products of collagen matrix. Here's an electron micrograph of an osteoclast. You can see the modified border here in this area, which is rather homogeneous on either side where the cells attach to the underlying matrix of bone, the ruffled border in this area here, and the very vacuolated cytoplasm immediately adjacent to the ruffled border. Very dark areas are the multiple mitochondria that are present within the cell. A higher magnification, the nucleus here, mitochondria in this area, vacuoles adjacent to the finger-like projections of the ruffled border, and then the frayed appearance of the mineralized bone matrix here beneath in the lower right-hand corner. Notice also that the nuclei of the osteoclast is surrounded by a perinuclear Golgi apparatus, and almost every nucleus of the osteoclast will contain a perinuclear arrangement of the Golgi apparatus. This is a higher magnification of the area of the ruffled border, showing the numerous finger-like projections that extend down to the bone surface, constantly teasing away at this surface, more or less standing the collagen fibers up on end. And if you look closely, you can see needle-like crystal arrangements here be between the finger-like processes that are the hydroxyapatite crystals that are in the process of resorption, picked up at the plasma membrane and taken into vesicles, transported across the cell, and extruded from the surface on the opposite side. So these are polarized cells with all of the activity directed against the surface immediately adjacent to bone. Types of bone. We'll talk about woven bone, or in some instances you'll read in the literature fiber bone, the terms are synonymous, and lamellar bone. I've already indicated the difference between woven and lamellar, and the fact that the woven is burlap, uh, haphazard arrangement of collagen fibers, whereas lamellar is succeeding layer of collagen fibers laid down one upon the other. You can find either woven or lamellar bone in both cancellous bone and compact bone. The compact bone being 
represented by bone of the cortex of long bones compared to the cancellous bone that is characterized by that which we find in the metaphysis of long bones. So you can find either woven or lamellar bone in either of these areas. In general, bone that's laid down very rapidly under either endocrine influences, uh, fracture repair, or whatever, if it's laid down rapidly, it usually is laid down in the form of woven or fiber bone. Bone that's laid down more slowly is laid down usually in lamellar fashion. So you can get some idea when you look at these different types of bone as to the nature of the process that's been ongoing and whether it's been a fairly slow insidious process or whether it's something that's been laid down very quickly. And it suggests even that nature, if it has to do things in a hurry, does it in somewhat of a haphazard fashion and when it has a time to do a, a more uh, elaborate job, uh, lays the bone down in the Meller fashion. Here's a slide to simply illustrate both of these situations. Early bone was deposited in the form of fiber or woven bone, and when this occurs, large numbers of osteoblasts become entrapped within that matrix, and therefore you get large numbers of osteocytes. And if you see the pattern here around these holes or spaces that we see, there are large numbers of osteocytes in a matrix that consists of woven bone matrix. The spaces that then persisted between that area of woven bone began to fill in a bit more slowly, and the, co the collagen was laid down in lamellar fashion. And so if you notice these circumferential areas, there are far fewer cells present within that matrix, and if you were to look at this in polarized light, you'd see that this material is laid down in lamellar fashion, whereas this does not polarize light and is laid down in a much more haphazard fashion. So it's a combination of both woven and the Meller bone being deposited within the same general area. Okay, now that we've talked about the different types of bone formation, the different cell types that are involved in the deposition of bone matrix, let's move on and discuss the development of the limb bud where all of these processes begin to come together in the development of a bone as an organ as opposed to bone as a tissue. The development of the limb bud begins with a mesodermal condensation containing a central zone which will become the bone and an outer zone that will give rise to muscles, ligaments, tendons, vessels and so on. The sequence of developments in this is one of a proximal distal sequence so that as this process evolves, it evolves in a proximal distal fashion in terms of the length of the bone uh, to give rise to eventually the development of a gro growth plate, epiphysis, and so on. The process begins as a cartilage model, a process of chondrification, and then terminates with the process of ossification of that prior cartilage model. Here's a human embryo. You can see early proximal limb bud development here, only small enlargements for the distal limb bud which lags behind somewhat. Did that slide not drop? We can just move on to the next. That's just a, uh, an intermediate fine. There was another <coughs> embryo that showed a little more development of the proximal and distal limb buds uh, prior to this one. And by the time you get out to about uh, eight weeks or so, you begin to get early mitten development now in the proximal limb bud, a little further developed than the distal limb bud, which constantly lags somewhat behind that of the proximal. At this stage, if you look at this histologically, the bones of the limb consist of mesenchymal condensations here and here. And this dark red inner zone between this developing bone and this one will become a joint cavity eventually. A little higher magnification showing this mesenchymal uh, condensation here and here, the inner zone between. Not cartilage at this point, but just simply a condensation of mesenchymal cells at this point in time. 
<coughs> if we look at the entire spectrum of changes that will occur in this area, we go from the early onlaga or the mesenchymal condensation to a cartilage model and that cartilage model then begins to ossify in the mid-shaft region or the diaphysis so that the first or primary ossification center begins at the diaphyseal area and that progresses proximally and distally until we have a cartilaginous epiphysis on either end with what gives rise to the developing growth plate as we normally think of it in terms of a longitudinal section and finally ossification of the ends of the bone give rise to the ossified epiphyses or the secondary ossification centers and finally with closure of the growth plate we have a completely ossified mature long bone with articular cartilage on either end. At this point the trabecular pattern of the metaphysis becomes arranged according to uh, stress planes that are applied to the ends of the long bone and so there's a remodeling process that takes place from the time of closure of the growth plate until you get the mature metaphyseal bone developed at the ends of either end of the long bone. So we go then in the development of the primary ossification center from one of chondrification to a form to the formation of a sleeve or collar of bone around the mid shaft region associated this is with this is vascularization and the development of a blastoma or ingrowth of vessels into the diaphysis of the long bone and then modulation of cells within that area between osteoblasts, osteoclasts, chondroclasts that completely remodel this prior cartilage model to one of totally osseous form. We've talked about the proximal distal extension and then the formation as a result of that of the growth plate. Here's the mid shaft of the cartilage model once we have a completely cartilaginous bone. We begin to get a formation of a sleeve or collar of bone beneath the periosteum in this region at the same time that we begin to get a maturation process of the cartilage of that cartilage model. And so we go from immature cartilage here to mature chondrocytes and the dark purple areas you see between the individual cells is mineralized cartilage matrix. So we have mineralized cartilage matrix interposed between these mature chondrocytes. At this point, vessels begin to penetrate and open up the mineralized cartilage through the action of chondroclastic activity. Here you can see the sleeve of bone that's being laid down beneath the periosteum in this region on either side. So we're beginning to now encircle this cartilage model with intramembranous bone that's been formed beneath the periosteum. And in cross section, you can appreciate that better, here's the collar of bone that surrounds the prior cartilage model which the cells are beginning to degenerate and the spaces enlarged as a result of chondroclastic activity and the active periosteum that surrounds the collar of bone in that area. Higher magnification of the area within that cartilage showing multinucleated giant cells which if they're resorbing cartilage are chondroclasts and osteoblasts on the surface that are going to begin laying down bone on this prior cartilage model that persists in those areas where the class do not completely remove that cartilage. And as this process extends toward the proximal end and distal end, we begin to get the arrangement of the cartilage on either end that begins to look more like the typical growth plate that we associate with longitudinal sections of bone. The cortex, the developing cortex becomes a little better delineated here and so we begin to get a, a denser shell of bone that surrounds this cartilage on either side but notice that it begins to fade away as it approaches these bulbous cartilaginous ends on either end of the long bone. Still higher magnification showing the periosteum here and here the collar or sleeve of bone that surrounds either side. Now we've removed almost all of the cartilage here we have some cartilage fragments remaining 
with new bone that's been laid down on the surfaces. So we now have a mixture of both collagen, cartilage, and bone in the trabeculae that persist in the mid-shaft region surrounded by the developing cortex. We'll come back and talk about the cortex and the development of the cortex and its remodeling later on. For now, we'd like to stop and look at the, the growth plate or the physis specifically and its development as it leads to the formation of bone from the cartilage model. The zones of activity, if one looks at a growth plate in longitudinal section as we move from the end of the bone toward the metaphyseal area, can be divided into a resting or a reserve zone where there's very little proliferation of cells or production of matrix by the cells to the area that where there is active reproduction and proliferation of the cells, the so-called reproductive zone, and then a zone where there's active secretion of matrix and production of a large volume of matrix around the individual cells, the secretory zone, and then the zone of hypertrophy where the cells begin to enlarge and hypertrophy, and finally beneath that a zone of calcification or mineralization of the cartilage matrix immediately adjacent to the metaphysis and the developing bone of the metaphyseal area. Here's a schematic. The epiphysis would be at the top of the screen. Vessels from the epiphysis are nutrient to the cartilage of the growth plate. They provide the necessary nutrients to allow the viability of the cells within the growth plate to persist. The vessels that extend up from the metaphysis to the zone of hypertrophied chondrocytes beneath are important in bringing the necessary nutrients to allow mineralization of the cartilage matrix beneath, but they are in no way associated with maintaining the nutrient, nut, bringing nutrients to the growth plate or maintaining the viability of the chondrocytes within the growth plate itself. Again, the zones are divided from the resting zone to the proliferative zone to the secretory zone where there's a large amount of matrix produced to the area where the cells are hypertrophying to finally the zone of calcification or mineralization. Now the usual way of looking at the growth plate is to look at it in longitudinal section. But if you notice the lines that are drawn across at A, B, C, D, and E, if we begin at the epiphyseal side of the growth plate, and work our way through the growth plate in transverse section, we get a much different impression than what you usually see in longitudinal section. In the resting zone, there's a large amount of matrix and very few cells, and most of these cells are small individual cells, single cells within an individual lacunae, and no particular pattern to the matrix that surrounds them, a very homogeneous appearing matrix. In the area of the reproduction or proliferative zone, the cells begin to proliferate and you begin to see two or four or more cells within individual lacunae. So you now see large numbers of cells in cell nests and you can even begin at this point to see some differentiation within the matrix surrounding those cells. Light zones separated by darker zones of material surrounding the nests of cells. And as you progress further into this zone of proliferation, you still have the multiple nuclei of chondrocytes within the lacunae, but you have even more exaggerated now the territorial matrix that immediately surrounds the chondrocytes, separated by the lighter zones of interterritorial matrix. So begin to get a differentiation and a distinction of matrix immediately surrounding the chondrocytes. As you progress on further toward the metaphysis, you have the zone of hypertrophy where the cells begin to enlarge and compress even more the matrix around each individual chondrocyte and you begin to get some evidence of degeneration of chondrocytes even at this stage within some of these lacunae. But this zone here is characterized primarily by hypertrophied chondrocytes. Further down we get more degeneration of individual chondrocytes, even to the point that at this stage we have some ingrowth of vascular buds into the spaces that were previously occupied by the chondrocytes. So as these chondrocytes degenerate and die, vessels extend up and occupy the space that was previously occupied by the chondrocytes. 
moving still further toward the metaphysis. We have matrix, which now has become mineralized, and here we have a chondroclast that's removing cartilage matrix. So as the vessels come in and extend into the spaces that were previously occupied by the chondrocytes, they bring with them the mononuclear cells that can either differentiate to class, either chondroclast or osteoclast, and to cells that will form eventually osteoblasts and deposit new bone on the surface of this cartilage scaffold. Still further into the metaphysis, we're now developing what is uh, metaphyseal bone, and the light pink areas that you see are cartilage covered with bone that's been deposited on the surface of that cartilage. It's laid down in these concavities formed as a result of chondroclastic resorption. And because it takes on the appearance of small globules, it's sometimes referred to as globular bone that's been deposited on the surface of these cartilage trabeculae. But it's simply osteoid that's been deposited by osteoblasts on the surface that fill in the spaces of these cartilage trabeculae that remain behind. The lighter areas are areas that contain the loose connective tissue and the vessels that give rise to either the chondroclast or the osteoblast. And still further into the metaphysis now, the bright pink areas are bone that's deposited on the surface. The paler pink areas are the cartilage cores that persist in the center of the trabeculae of bone. Now bear in mind, all of these sections are transverse sections as we move from the epiphyseal side of the growth plate into the metaphysis. Now if we go further still, we have almost entirely bone trabeculae and only small remnants of these light purplish areas of cartilage core that persist. If we look now at the growth plate in pretty much longitudinal fashion as we normally look at the growth plate, the epiphysis is here, the vessels that I said were nutrient to the growth plate, the vessels from the metaphysis that I indicated were important for mineralization of the matrix that persists within the between the columns of chondrocytes, and look at it as we again move from the epiphyseal side toward the metaphysis. Here you have chondrocytes present, condensation of matrix between these chondrocytes, even in this area as they become lined up in columns, and the cells within that matrix ultrastructurally looking very much like osteoblasts. In this case, a chondroclast, large amount of endoplasmic reticulum, fairly prominent Golgi region, and production of collagen matrix. Only in this case, it's not, not polarized, as is the osteoblast, but producing matrix around its entire circumference. Like the osteoblast, these cells extrude membrane-bound vesicles in which there's preliminary mineralization with amorphous calcium phosphate, followed by the formation of apatite crystals. Still further down, the cells become hypertrophied. And I think at this point, we do have to change carousels. And ultrastructurally, the hypertrophied chondrocytes are characterized by cells which simply imbibe large amounts of fluid dispersing the profiles of endoplasmic reticulum and a cell that's beginning to look like it's about to undergo degenerative change as a result of taking on all of this fluid. At the same time this is occurring, it's beginning to compress the collagen matrix between this cell and the one adjacent to it. Light microscopically, looking at the zone of hypertrophied chondrocytes, with the metaphysis being right in this area of the photograph, the prominent chondrocytes, compression of matrix between, and in this case, a spatial stain indicating the presence of mucopolysaccharides surrounding each of these individual chondrocytes. If we look at this ultrastructurally, here we have a column of chondrocytes that have hypertrophied and begun to go undergo degenerative change. One here, one further degenerated here, and as you move down, complete dispersion of the cytoplasmic organelles of that particular cell. 
Notice also that minerals deposited in the vertical columns of matrix that persist between each individual column, but the transverse bars that separate individual chondrocytes have not undergone mineralization. A higher magnification showing a hypertrophied chondrocyte here in the upper left and a degenerating, degenerating chondrocyte in this region here, mineral that's deposited within the vertical matrix that persists between the columns of chondrocytes. Moving on down to the area of the metaphysis where you have ingrowth of vessels up into the area where the hypertrophied chondrocytes had persisted. Once you get degeneration of this chondrocyte, you'll have an empty space, as you see here from the cell that's already disappeared in the, in the lacunae preceding it. As that occurs, the vessels can extend up and the capillaries can extend into the space that was previously occupied by this chondrocyte. And as this happens to succeeding cells within each column, the vessels simply follow along behind and take their place. Here it is ultrastructurally. In this column, we have a degenerating chondrocyte, the matrix interposed between, and on this side, the column over here, the cell has already disappeared, and these are red blood cells that you see within a capillary that's already extended into that chondrocytic lacunae. So while it's a fairly uniform process at the light microscopic level, ultrastructurally, it's not necessarily all that uniform in that vessels can be up into this area here, whereas we still have a degenerating chondrocyte in the column adjacent to it. Here it is again at a little lower magnification, the degenerating chondrocyte, the transverse bar that separates that cell from the one that preceded it, but this cell is gone and now we have a capillary extending into the space immediately beneath this degenerating chondrocyte. The next step in this process will be for this area here to degenerate and break down, and as it does, that capillary will extend on into this space here. And again, I point out the mineralization that's occurring within the vertical matrix compressed between the columns of chondrocytes. Here's a one micron thick toluidin blue stain section showing the hypertrophied chondrocytes at the top, and notice the cytoplasm of these delicate capillaries that extend up beneath each individual column of chondrocytes. Electron microscopically, here's the capillary extending here to this area, a little remnant of the transverse bar that still persists, and a degenerating chondrocyte in this area. Higher magnification showing the attenuated cytoplasm of the capillary as it extends up adjacent to the transverse bar which is beginning to degenerate as this cell undergoes degeneration as well. With the capillaries come mononuclear cells which give rise to either chondroclasts, which will destroy this mineralized matrix of cartilage or give rise to osteoblasts that will lay down new bone on the surface of the cartilage matrix. And for those who laugh at the cartoon that I have of the osteoclast chewing away at bone, this is just to show that really this is what exists because here's the mouth right here and the eye and here's the chondroclast as it's eating away at the mineralized cartilaginous matrix. The final step in this process is the mineralization of cartilage matrix between the columns of chondrocytes that allow these trabeculae to persist into the metaphyseal area and on the surface of these cartilage spicules will there be new bone deposited to form the primary trabeculae of the metaphysis in the first bone of the metaphyseal area. Here it is at higher magnification. The capillaries extending into the columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes and the persistence of spicules of mineralized cartilage on into the metaphysis. And even here, I think you can appreciate the proliferation of cells on the surfaces of these cartilage trabeculae that will give rise to osteoid on their surfaces and the primary trabeculae. I think perhaps this is a good point to stop and take a five minute break or so, and we'll pick up and begin discussing the bone of the metaphysis in a few minutes.
underneath the growth plate uh, gives rise to the metaphyseal bone. And this bone forms on the surface of the cartilage trabeculae that persist, uh, that extend from the growth plate as a result of the uh, extension of, of cartilage trabeculae into the metaphyseal region. The formation of bone on the surface of these trabeculae follow the invasion of capillary buds in the form of a blastema, which then deposits new bone on the surface of the cartilage trabeculae, giving rise to the primary trabeculae. This, followed by osteoclastic remodeling, converts the primary trabeculae to secondary trabeculae. And then in the area of the cutback zone, which is in the periosteum beneath the growth plate, we have the osteoclastic remodeling that gives the typical funnel shape that we assume. Right in. If we look at this schematically, the, we've already discussed the growth plate and the formation of the columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes in the growth plate itself. We said that mineralization occurred within the matrix that was compressed between the columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes, and that a certain number of these trabeculae, about one-third, as you'll see later on, of these cartilage trabeculae persist on into the metaphyseal region. The capillary buds extending on up into the columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes, where the cells have degenerated and died, and that both chondroclasts and osteoblasts form from the mononuclear cells that then allow removal of a, about three-fourths of the cartilage trabeculae, and osteoblasts then deposit bone on the surface of the trabeculae that persist and extend into the metaphysis. Let's look at that a bit more closely. The vascular activity that's associated with this remodeling in the metaphysis consists of two bursts, or three bursts, if you will, of vascular activity. The first immediately beneath the growth plate, where the mononuclear cells give rise to the chondroclasts and the osteoblasts that will form the primary trabeculae. A second burst of activity, vascular-wise, in this region, which gives rise to a large number of osteoclasts which then remodel the primary trabeculae and result in their conversion to secondary trabeculae. And the third area of vascular activity being further toward the diaphysis in the area where the hematopoietic elements are formed and red bone marrow essentially is developed. Now if we look at the growth plate at the top, the mineralized cartilage spicules that persist in this zone of calcification we see that about a third of those trabeculae persist and extend on into the metaphysis. And the dark purple areas that you see on the surface of those cartilage spicules is new osteoid that's been deposited on their surfaces. So we've now formed, once that osteoid is deposited, primary trabeculae, the primary tra trabeculae or cancellous bone of the metaphysis. As I had indicated earlier, about three-fourths of these are removed by chondroclastic activity. And you can see that activity taking place here. Here are chondroclasts that are removing about three out of every four of the mineralized spicules of cartilage. And about one out of four persist, and on their surface is deposited new osteoid. This is the area that we saw earlier in cross-section or horizontal section, where it was primarily bone with small central cores of cartilage. And that's what you see here in these light pink areas that are in the middle of these dark purple osseous trabeculae. Schematically, this is illustrated here so that we have consistent reduction in the number of trabeculae that extend into the metaphysis. And as that reduction in number takes place, we get progressively fewer and fewer trabeculae as we move toward the diaphysis. But at the same time, the caliber of those trabeculae increases in size as you move from the growth plate into or toward the diaphysis. Here is an undecalcified section, modified pentachrome stain, indicating the 
columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes where the vessels are extending up into them. The mineralized spicule of cartilage, which here is depicted by the green color. Bone that's been deposited on the surface, mineralized bone, is characterized here by the yellow that you see on the surfaces. And in a So this is the primary trabeculae of bone in the metaphysis consisting of the central core, mineralized bone, and osteoid on the surface. And you can appreciate the number of mononuclear cells that are there to give rise to either osteoblasts or chondroclasts depending upon the need at the time. The next phase in the development of the metaphysis is the conversion of the primary trabeculae to secondary trabeculae. And if we look at C here on the right, if the central car cartilage core is depicted by this area in the middle with osteoblasts here on the surface, depicted by the white dots, laying down osteoid on the surface that then undergoes mineralization. So these crosshatched areas represent mineralized bone covering a central core of cartilage. Osteoclasts move in and remove bone and cartilage as they cut across this primary trabeculae. They could care less whether they're looking at mineralized cartilage or mineralized bone. And so they remove this bone and are eating away on one surface of that trabeculae. And on the opposite side, osteoblasts are laying down bone and forming new bone over here. This is related to mechanical stress factors that are involved, charges, positive negative charges that stimulate osteoclastic activity on one side and osteoblastic or bone formation activity on the opposite side. The net result is that you've cut off this central cartilage core here and from this point on the bone that persists on into the metaphysis toward the diaphysis consists entire <coughs> entirely of bone with no central cartilage core. So we convert the primary trabeculae with its central core to a secondary trabeculae that's solid bone. <coughs> here you can see this histologically. The cartilage cores that extend into the metaphysis, the removal of about three out of four. Here's one that extends down, another one that extends down. Chondroclastic activity has cut this off in this region here. This one's been cut off here and with bone formation occurring on either side, on the opposite sides of those trabeculae, they've come together and formed one solid bony trabeculae. From here up primary trabeculae, from here down secondary trabeculae. Here it is, a little higher magnification. The primary trabeculae has been cut off here and here, and here we have a solid bony trabeculae extending in this area. Now bear in mind we're looking at something in three dimension, and you'll always find some other trabeculae that extend a little further down where this process that's taking place here is happening in some further distant site in other trabeculae. But in general, that's the process that takes place in converting primary to secondary trabeculae as you move from the growth plate to diaphysis. As a result of in the formation of bone in the metaphysis beneath that growth plate, the growth plate, in essence, grows away from the developing bone. All the growth and length of this bone is accounted for by proliferation of the cartilage cells in the growth plates, the growth at the ends of the bone. And so whatever activity is taking point, place at this point in time, eventually that end of the bone will be in this region here. And that means that if the bone was this wide at this point in time, and it now is extended to this area and it's as narrow as it is at these points, something had to be done in the remodeling of the width of that bone in order for it to be 
the width that it is here compared to here. Now this is to further illustrate the growth in length of the bone. If we look at two points, point A and point B, we see that we have the columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes, we have the persistent cartilage trabeculae and osteoid deposited on their surfaces, the primary trabeculae here. Point A is here and point B is here. With continued growth, as the cartilage continues to proliferate and these cells that here are in the secretory zone now become hypertrophied chondrocytes and degenerating chondrocytes. As that occurs, these cells are going to be further into this area. So we now have the end of the bone up here instead of here, and we have our last column of hypertrophied chondrocytes at this level as opposed to this level. But look at point A and point B. They're exactly where they were before. So there's nothing changes in terms of the relationship of points A and point B. They simply have stayed in the same place and have become covered up with bone here, whereas here they were simply naked cartilage trabeculae. But the cartilage has continued to grow and the bone has grown in length away from that developing bone matrix. The point being that growth in length is entirely related to the proliferation of cartilage in the growth plate. The section on the left illustrates the blood supply to the metaphysis and the epiphysis, blood vessels coming in and supplying the epiphysis and also providing the nutrient vessels to the growth plate, the vessels in the metaphysis coming in and be giving rise to the capillaries that in extend into the capillary bed. And it might be worth noting at this point that This slide is to illustrate the growth potential at the end of the long bone. The cartilage that covers the end of the bone, the articular cartilage, gives the potential for growth in width and length throughout the life of the animal because it's viable cartilage and it always has that potential for enchondral bone formation. Growth in width is provided by the perichondrium in the area of the growth plate. Growth in length, as we just got done talking about, gives rise to growth in length of the bone and it's in this area that we have to have osteoclastic remodeling and so-called cutback in order to trim away the width of this bone otherwise we'd end up with bones that look like stovepipes rather than the typical funnel shape that we associate with the mature bone and in the area of the mid shaft in the diaphysis we have growth in width as a result of osteoblastic activity in the area of the periosteum giving rise to growth in width, while osteoclasts continue trimming away bone on the end osteal surface to maintain the size of the medullary canal as the bone increases in overall width. And at the same time, it maintains a uniform thickness to the cortex of the developing shaft. <coughs> Another schematic illustrating the epiphyseal end, the articular cartilage, the growth plate, and here, osteoclastic activity along this surface, the so-called cutback zone, that trims away at the trabeculae beneath the growth plate, giving the funnel shape to the bone, osteoblastic activity that's forming bone on the outer surface of the cortex, while osteoclasts on the inner surface of the cortex are maintaining the thickness of that cortex and giving rise to the central medullary cavity. Here's that same area shown histologically. Here's the old remnant of the sleeve or collar of bone that was surrounding that area of the primary ossification center. This is still a primary ossification center here. It's just that we now appreciate it as a growth plate. You have the trabeculae of the primary trabeculae of bone being converted as we move further down to secondary trabeculae, and the intense osteoclastic activity in this region results in trimming this away so that you get the funnel shape to the bone and you have virtually no 
developing cortex in this region at all. It's the weak link in terms of the developing growth plate and the developing cortex beneath. And it's a result of this that often results in so-called slipped epiphyses, where there's no cortex there to maintain that epiphysis in its position. You don't, it's like a scoop of ice cream sitting in an ice cream cone. And in this case, it's a scoop of cartilage sitting in a very delicate, uh, bony cone. But you have virtually no cortex or cone here to hold that in place. The secondary ossification center. The process in the secondary center is essentially the same as it is in the primary ossification center. The same processes take place, have the normal proximal distal sequence that demonstrates itself to the extent that you see it in the primary ossification center. And as a result, once the secondary ossification center is fully developed, we recognize the articular cartilage on the end of the bone overlying the growth plate, at least still in the immature animal. Prior to the development of the secondary ossification center, the end of the bone is a bulbous mass of cartilage. You then, within the vascular channels that are present within the, the cartilaginous epiphysis, begin to get the development of an early secondary ossification center. As I said, this is the limit now of the primary ossification center, which has given us a fully developed long bone with shaft, metaphysis, primary, secondary, trabeculae, and so on. That process extends where we develop the articular cartilage, the growth plate, the cutback zone, and the metaphysis in this region, with the bone of the epiphysis being the secondary ossification center. Once the growth plate closes at the time of puberty, we have what remains an epiphyseal scar. And that scar is simply a plate of bone that was laid down as an epiphyseal plate adjacent to the growth plate on the epiphyseal side. This is the cancellous bone of the metaphysis. And now with time, once that growth plate has completely disappeared as a result of mechanical stresses, the architecture of these trabeculae will be laid down according to tra trajectorial patterns that coincide with the mechanical stresses applied to the end of the long bone. <clears throat> now let's go back to the cortex and talk about the development of the cortical bone. We left that at the point where we had a layer or uh, shell of bone immediately beneath the periosteum that surrounded the primary ossification center. And we stopped and we followed the development of the primary ossification center through the growth plate development at either end. The cortex develops as a result of appositional growth of bone. The growth of bone in length is referred to as interstitial growth, and that's the growth that's given rise to as a result of the proliferation of cartilage. So now we're talking about bone form from the periosteum without a prior cartilage model, so we're talking about intramembranous bone formation at this point. The outer layer of the periosteum is a fibrous outer layer. The internal layer is referred to as the cambium layer, or the cellular layer that gives rise to osteoblasts that form bone on the outer surface of the cortex. The first bone that's laid down is laid down as woven bone so-called spicular or osteophytic bone or fiber bone, whatever you prefer, highly cellular, usually in a woven burlap type arrangement. Here's the periosteum here, the developing cortex, which is really cancellous in type at this stage of development in the fetal stage. Opposite side in the lower portion of the photomicrograph. Here's periosteum. The cambium layer is this bluish layer that you see between the bone here and the outer fibrous layer of the periosteum above. And you'll notice this is really trabecular type or cancellous type bone at this early point in formation. <clears throat> we pointed out that when bone grows in length, if you had two points within the, the developing bone, they stay in the same distance apart and they don't move uh, from each other because of the growth in cartilage. By the same token, if you were to drive two nails in the outer surface of the cortex at a given distance apart and allow that bone to grow as it grew in width as a result of deposition of new bone beneath the periosteum, the nails become more deeply and deeply embedded until finally they're covered 
with bone, very much the same as if you were to drive those nails into the bark of a tree, yet two nails remains the same. The point being that, again, growth in length is not contributed to by the development of the growing cortex. Growth in width is contributed as a result of new bone forming beneath the periosteum, but there's nothing contributed in the way of growth in length of the long bone as a result of the intramembranous formation beneath the periosteum. A cross section here of a developing long bone. Here's the original sleeve or collar of bone. This is the primary ossification center where we had early vascular invasion or extension into the area where cartilage was removed with some persisting trabeculae of mineralized cartilage and or primary trabeculae. The periosteum out here has grown from this surface to this point and in the process has laid down the spicules of new bone as it grew from the surface of the collar of bone out to the point where we see it now. With continued time, the spaces within these trabeculae of bone begin to fill in with lamellar bone. And so now you begin to take on the features and the characteristics that look more like dense cortical bone because now the spaces within those trabeculae have filled in and we have a central medullary cavity and now we have the periosteum surrounding very dense cortical type bone. But still not mature bone as we see it in the adult animal following cortical remodeling and the formation of osteones which is the point to which we are now. Cortical remodeling is influenced by vascular factors, circulatory factors, metabolic factors, nutritional, hormonal, and so on, and mechanical factors. The resorption that results in the cortical remodeling is a process that's carried out predominantly by osteoclasts and the morphologic feature that characterizes the osteoclastic remodeling of the cortex is referred to as the cutting cone that gives rise to the cortical remodeling process. This process results in the formation of haversion systems or osteons, which is the basic structural unit of cortical bone and is characterized by concentric lamellae of bone that are laid down in alternating fashion as opposed to bone laid down upon another in the same general direction and we'll refer to that later on. And the osteon is characterized by six to seven rings of osteocyte that circumscribe the central canal. Here's an osteon, the central canal, and if you count about six or seven concentric rings of osteocytes that make up the limit of that osteon. Most osteons will measure 300 micron in blood supply's ability to diffuse through this canalicular system and maintain the viability of cells in the periphery of the osteon. And here's a schematic to illustrate in a section of cortical bone in which osteons are present. Here's one showing the concentric rings of osteons with the central canal. Another section illustrating the central canal here, a canalicular system that really allows this cell to be just as much in communication with that central canal as the inner one or two circles of osteons. It takes, in the dog at least, about 90 days for an osteon to form from the time you have a resorption cavity until a mature osteon is developed about 90 days, which takes about seven to 10 generations of osteoblasts to result in the formation of such an osteon. You end up then with the central haversion canal and the Volksmann's canals, which are the transverse canals that maintain communication between the endosteal surface of the bone and the periosteal surface. <clears throat> if we look at the development of the cutting cone, we have osteoclasts that begin resorbing bone in this area here. Their growth in direction or the growth in the direction of that resorption cavity is from the lower portion of the screen toward the top. 
following behind those osteoclasts are a layer of osteoblasts that then begin to form bone and lay down bone on the surface of the resorption cavity, the width of which extends from here to here. So we now begin to refill that cavity that's been formed by the osteoclast, and we end up with the alternating lamellae of collagen laid down in the typical fashion to give rise to the mature osteon. Now, in addition to the osteo, there's a remodeling, remodeling of the vascular supply. Here, we have a blood vessel extending within the bone matrix. Osteoclasts form in the vicinity of that vessel as a result of high-speed blood flow, high oxygen tension. In the presence of high oxygen tension, mononuclear cells will develop into osteoclasts, and so you get osteoclastic remodeling. Following behind that, the vessel breaks up into a capillary network, out of which we get, like we do in the blastoma that follows behind the growth plate, mononuclear cells that will give rise to the osteoblasts that begin to refill this cavity. At the same time, as we follow the vascular pattern back, it becomes sinusoidal in its arrangement. In the vicinity of this sinusoidal arrangement, the blood flow is much more, much slower and more erratic, and you have low oxygen tension. And so in the presence of low oxygen tension, the mononuclear cells tend to differentiate toward osteoblasts, and you begin to get a refill of that resorption cavity. So you go from high oxygen tension and osteoclast formation to low oxygen tension and osteoblast formation, and from resorption to that of formation. Here it is in a histological section, undecalcified bone stained green. The osteoclast, the cutting head of these osteoclasts, forming the resorption cavity. Here's the full width of that resorption cavity. You can see the sinusoidal network that we have in this area mononuclear cells, undifferentiated cells, giving rise to osteoblasts here and the formation of an osteoid seam on the surface of that resorption cavity. You have osteoclasts here. You have an empty resorption cavity except for the connective tissue and vascular network here. And down here you have osteoblasts and osteoid on the surface. If you look at that schematically, <clears throat> depending on where you take a cross-section in a cortical bone, will determine what you see in the way of the formation of osteons or the cutting cone. If you were to take a section, I just lost my pointer, if you were to take a section through level A, you would see only a small cavity with perhaps a cross-section of an osteoclast. If we were to move to point B, and take that section in this area, you'd have a little larger cavity and perhaps three or four osteoclasts in section. If you were to move on down to point C, the cavity begins to enlarge and you have larger numbers of clasts. If you come on down to D, you're in that area that's acellular. We have neither osteoclasts nor osteoblasts, so you have an empty resorption cavity at about its full width. If you move further down into E, you begin to get the early osteoblastic activity and you have a layer of osteoblasts surrounding that resorption cavity. At F, about a half-filled osteon, and at G, in this area, a fully developed osteon. So it depends where you take the section through one of these cutting tones and developing osteons as to what you see in transverse section. Here's a mature bone. This is osteonal bone, dense, solid osteons. In an area of a fracture, where you have marked remodeling, we have empty resorption cavities. We have some resorption cavities at the very tips, where there don't happen to be any osteoclasts in this case, to others where there's almost 50% fill of that osteon. Here's the outer limits. The bright red areas are the osteoid, osteoid seams that are lining the surfaces of those osteoids, osteons as they fill in. And the same thing in fluorescent stained undecalcified section. Here's the original dense bone with very little remodeling. Here's a new osteon that's filled with tetracycline labeling present within it. The bright yellow are osteons in which there's been virtually no mineralization occurring. 
The dark green are those which are relatively mature osteons at this point in time. Illustrate the concentric rings of osteocytes within the osteon, but at the same time, the alternating pattern in the direction in which the collagen fibers are laid down, in that one layer of collagen fibers is laid down at almost 90 degree angles to the next, so that they're laid down in this cross-hatched fashion, which gives increased strength to that osteon compared to simply laying down those lamellae of, of collagen in a circumferential arrangement. Mature osteon and cross section that you've seen earlier, the central canal, the concentric rings of osteocytes in their lacunae, the canalicular system, and just for what it's worth pointing out here, that here's a viable osteon. Notice that the osteon up here in the upper left hand corner contains a central canal with a vessel in which thrombosis has occurred. And notice how white the osteon is, devoid of any of this spider like arrangement around the osteocytic lacunae. The cells have degenerated and died as a result of the thrombosis in the central canal, and so we no longer have any cells present. And since this is a basic fuchsin stain of mineralized bone, only the unmineralized tissues take up the stain, and there's no viable cells here to take up the basic fuchsin stain. And just a point that whether we look at human rib in cross-section here or an elephant rib in cross-section in which there's considerable difference in the overall size. The osteon is essentially the same size. You have human osteon on the left and elephant on the right. And the size is essentially the same, mainly because of the limit of the blood supply to maintain the viability of cells within the osteon so that the maximum size is still about 100 micron, whether you're talking about human or elephant. The cortex, as you look at the entire thickness of the cortex, has an outer surface where we find outer circumferential lamellae laid down beneath the periosteum. Beneath the endosteal surface are in inner circumferential lamellae, and these two areas bound the osteonal bone, which is located between these two surfaces. And then within the osteonal bone are interstitial fragments or interstitial lamellae that you'll see described in the textbooks that result from the remodeling that occurs through cutting cones that remodel either pre-existing osteons or pre-existing uh, cortical bone. And obviously, as cortical remodeling begins to take place in the neonate, and it continues throughout the life of the animal, the animal with increasing age is going to have increasing numbers of interstitial fragments. Here in the schematic, the outer circumferential lamellae are here beneath the periosteum. The inner circumferential lamellae are on the immediate endosteal surface, and the endosteal bone, or the osteonal bone, is located between these two layers. And here, osteones showing again the alternating direction of the collagen fibers and the central vessels that are contained within them. The Boltzmann canals provide a transverse canalicular arrangement that allow vessels to move from the endosteal surface to the periosteal surface and thereby providing interconnection between periosteal blood supply and the blood supply of the medullary cavity. An unmineralized section of bone showing osteones central canals here and the osteones that are present as a result of cortical remodeling. The interstitial fragments are these sections that you see here where there's about half of an osteon. This has had a cutting cone come through and a new osteon has formed here and we've left behind about 50 percent of an old osteon. In other cases there's even smaller fragments left of pre-existing either pre-existing osteons or just lamellar bone matrix that never was osteonal in type before the remodeling occurred. These are the so-called interstitial fragments or interstitial lamellae. And just to finish off the discussion of, of bone and, and as a lead in to the next discussions that we'll have on diseases of bone, throughout the life of an animal, even after the longitudinal growth of bone has ceased, 
the cancellous bone and the cortical bone are constantly being replaced by resorption and deposition of new bone throughout practically all areas of the skeleton. So there's a constant remodeling and turnover to the point of the, in the case of the human, of about 80 percent of all bone matrix being turned over within a year's period of time. And just to finish off the normal development of bones and joints, to go back and reconsider the joint in the area of the mesodermal condensation that we discussed earlier, we have the two areas of condensation here, this dense inner zone in between where the cells are much deeper staining. If we look at that at higher magnification, there's a solid layer of cells interposed between these two mesodermal condensations even before they become cartilaginous in type. But as you begin to get chondrification of the two developing bones, the space in this inner zone begins to form that was the early development of the joint cavity as a result of enzymatic degradation and destruction of cells and matrix within this inner zone. <coughs> and here you can see different stages within the same developing or series of developing bones. We still have dense inner zones here, but we have the early joint cavity formed in between these two opposing long bones. And moving well ahead in the stage of development, we have here in the knee joint the developing cavities here, but still dense inner zones between the joints in these bones, which later on will progress to develop typical joint cavities. Even at this stage, you can see the early development of menisci at this, this stage. Here, a bone which we still have no secondary ossification center. We have totally cartilaginous epiphyses, but we have a fairly well-developed joint cavity here in the, pro in the femoral head and the acetabulum at this stage. And that concludes the discussion of normal uh, bone and joint development. There were some questions earlier regarding the genesis of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And we talked about osteoblasts resulting in uh, formation of bone matrix with about 10 percent of the cells becoming entrapped in the matrix, becoming osteocytes. And the question is, what happens to the other 90 percent? The current thinking, by most people at least, is that these cells de-differentiate, and I don't like that word, uh, and I prefer to use the term modulate, back to a less differentiated cell with the potential to go back through a cycle and form bone again at a later point in time. There are those who would argue that that 90 percent of, of osteoblasts disintegrate or degenerate or blow up or whatever, but if that were the case and 90 percent of the cells that were involved in the formation of matrix were in fact degenerating and dying, one would expect, I would think, to see a lot of cellular debris in the vicinity of, of the surfaces of new bone matrix and you don't see that. And I think current dogma tends to support the concept that these cells in fact modulate to a less differentiated cell and have the potential to go back through a cycle. The other question was relative to the origin of osteoclasts. And the current thinking there is that these cells originate from the blood monocyte and like other giant cells in other parts of the body uh, are formed by monocytes that are carried in by the blood supply and these cells then become multinucleated giant cells. We'll discuss this some more when we talk about congenital osteopetrosis because the work in that disease has shed more light on the origin of the osteoclast than most anything else has in the past few years. And it leaves little doubt but what these cells are or have their origin in spleen and bone marrow as blood monocytes. As to what happens with the osteoclast, there's differing opinions within uh, the cell biology group as to whether the, these cells have the ability to uh, break up with individual nuclei having potential to become osteoblastic uh, or whether they, uh, once they go through the cycle, never return into the osteoclastic cycle again. And uh, I think that leaves a little more question at this point in time as to the exact situation with the ultimate fate of the osteoclast as opposed to its origin, which is a little better defined. Another question that was asked was the, 
what happens to the proteoglycans that are located in the ground substance in the matrix of collagen uh, at the time mineralization occurs. The point that we made was that proteoglycans tend to interfere with the mineralization of the matrix. And at the time mineralization is occurring, the reason that it begins to occur at the mineralization front is because enzymatic activity, prim primarily through alkaline phosphatase and similar enzymes, inactivates the proteoglycans so that mineralization can then go ahead and proceed. Now, this is an oversimplification of a very complex process. But in general, the proteoglycans are simply destroyed by alkaline phosphatase activity. And as a result, their inhibitory influence is no longer present, and mineralization of that matrix will go ahead and take place. The other question I may have answered as we discussed the development of the metaphysis, but that was the vessel extension into the columns of hypertrophied chondrocytes. And the point was that do these vessels actually invade the cartilage? And I think I answered that when we talked about metaphyseal development in that the vessels do not invade the cartilage, but simply extend into the space that was provided as a result of a degenerating chondrocyte, which left an open space in those columns of chondrocytes for the vessels to extend into. And so as the cells degenerate, the vessels move up into their place and allow the influx of new cells to form either chondroclasts that will remove the cartilage trabeculae or to form osteoblasts that will lay down bone on the surfaces of those trabeculae that persist. Are there any other questions? Dr. Yes. Can you the difference between osteoclast and chondroclast in either origin or anything else? Okay. The question was, are, is there any difference in the chondroclast or the osteoclast, either in origin or their behavior or whatever. I think the only way you can identify a chondroclast from an osteoclast is by the company it keeps. And if it's resorbing mineralized cartilage matrix, it's a chondroclast. And if it's resorbing bone matrix, it's an osteoclast. And I think as far as the cell of origin, I think the, the blood monocyte is the cell that gives rise to both of these cells. And if it's in the vicinity of mineralized cartilage in the area where you develop chondroclastic activity, it's a chondroclast, again, by the fact that it's associated with chondroclastic resorption. But I think that same cell, if it were found in an environment where there was only bone, would probably resorb bone just as efficiently as it resorbs cartilage. Any other questions? You said that the blast both originate from, or all originate from monocytes as well. Is that correct? All the blast cells? The current, well, the, the blast cells, while they can originate from, from monocytes, can certainly arise from immature uh, fibrous connective tissue in those pluripotential cells that are located within the mesenchymal tissue, which has that ability to either develop a bone-forming cell, a cartilage-forming cell, or a fibrous, a fibrocyte in the production of, of just collagen matrix that does not mineralize. So those cells, if you consider the blood monocyte as capable of that kind of differentiation, yes. But I think that the current thinking with the osteoclast is that that cell comes from a blood monocyte that gives direct differentiation into multinucleated osteoclast. Does, uh, does its normal function require some sort of T cell activation? Specialized situation. Does the blood monocyte? The osteoclast uh, activating factor play a role in the routine function? Okay, the question was does the osteoclast activating factor uh, or the T cell influence have an effect on the activity of the osteoclast? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I, there's been a lot of activity relative to, again, uh, the influences of these types of things on osteoclastic activity and osteoclast activating factor and you can find a lot of disagreement in the literature as to specifically which, what influences what in the way of activity. Um, I'd hesitate to attempt to answer that because I think that's in such a state of flux that there's no one specific answer to it. We concluded our discussion yesterday uh, with uh, osteoporosis and introduced that subject and said that uh, there were several conditions that were characterized by osteoporotic 
lesions in animals and that vitamin C deficiency or scurvy is one of the classic uh, diseases that is represented by osteoporosis. And if we could go to the slides now, we'll discuss that condition in more detail. The vitamin C requirements uh, are of an exogenous source in primates, subhuman primates, the guinea pig, and birds. And so in terms of the animals that we routinely deal with, it's the subhuman primates and the guinea pigs that we are primarily concerned with an exogenous source of vitamin C. In the case of the domesticated animals, vitamin C is synthesized in the liver and we don't normally expect to see scurvy or a vitamin C deficiency in these animals. I have uh, the comment at the bottom that says bone disease due to vitamin C deficiency and a question mark based on the recent findings relative to hypertrophic osteodystrophy in the dog which have suggested that perhaps this may be related to vitamin C deficiency. And we'll discuss that in more detail when we take up the subject of hypertrophic osteodystrophy in the dog. Vitamin C is a cofactor in the hydroxylation of proline and lysine. And so in the presence of a deficiency, you have failure of hydroxylation of the collagen matrix necessary for normal bone formation. The deficiency results in a reduced osteogenic activity by osteoblasts and a defective production of procollagen. At the same time, we don't have normal differentiation of osteoblasts so that the mesenchymal cell population doesn't develop into mature osteoblastic cells, as you'll see in some of the histology that we show you. In addition to that, there's a reduced production of the proteoglycan complex, the mucopolysaccharides, and at the same time, it affects tooth formation with reduced dentin formation. So that the clinical signs that one would expect to see are those of osteoporosis, hemorrhages relative to the gingiva, the skin, and the periosteum due to this defective collagen matrix that's produced. Here is a growth plate, epiphysis at the top, and metaphysis in a normal guinea pig. Again, the nice vertical trabeculae of primary spongiosa perpendicular to the overlying growth plate. Compare that to the guinea pig with a vitamin C deficiency in the relatively early stages of the condition. The growth plate is relatively normal, although there's some attenuation of uh, cells within the uh, growth plate itself. But notice the proliferation of mesenchymal tissue here and the reduced number of primary trabeculae in the metaphysis. This is the osteoporotic lesion that exists. But the more important thing is that in addition to reduced numbers of primary trabeculae, we have this proliferation of loose mesenchymal tissue that you normally wouldn't expect to see in this area of the metaphysis. Normally, it's filled with primary trabeculae and hematopoietic elements. This area in the lower right-hand corner is more nearly normal to what one would expect in the area of the primary spongiosa. This becomes even more severe as the disease, disease progresses. And so we get this intense proliferation of spindle, loose mesenchymal tissue cells in this area and complete failure to produce any bone. And these have been referred to as frustrated osteoblasts in that they don't undergo complete maturation. They don't form normal bone matrix. And that collagen that is produced is abnormal. <clears throat> Here's a stain to point out the trabeculae of both cartilage cores and the globular bone laid down on the surface, and this loosely arranged mesenchymal tissue with this prominent spindle cell population that fails to lay down bone on the surfaces and continue the normal enchondral bone process uh, beneath the growth plate. Now, if one at any point during the development of the disease as corrects the deficiency and administers vitamin C, you immediately begin to get conversion of all this population of cells to osteoblasts. And that's what's happened here. About 96 hours after administration of vitamin C, you begin to get large populations of osteoblasts developing in this milieu of mesenchymal tissue. And at that point, you get very rapid bone formation occurring. 
<clears throat> but as you can imagine, you don't have the normal proximal distal sequence developed here in terms of the nice spicules of cartilage to lay down new bone on, and therefore these cells are very haphazard in their formation of new bone. And so you can actually get an area of osteosclerosis in the reparative stages of vitamin C deficiency simply because of this haphazard arrangement and you get this intense proliferation of osteoblastic cells and the intense production of new bone. Notice too that at the time you had the weakened metaphysis when there was very little bone here, there's obviously been some motion and perhaps even stress fractures in the cortical area because we've got cartilage formed out here in the periphery in addition to subperiosteal new bone that's been laid down. So you immediately begin conversion to osteoblasts and new bone formation. At the same time these events are taking place in the metaphysis, similar changes are occurring in the subperiosteal area. Here's the outer fibrous layer of the periosteum. Normally that would be this area right here would be immediately adjacent to the underlying cortex. Instead, you have this intense proliferation of spindled mesenchymal cells that are failing to form new bone at the normal rate. And so you have a much thickened periosteum. And it's a result of that loose attachment of those cells to the underlying periosteum that allows hemorrhage to occur because of the defect in, in the collagen matrix of the vessels as well. So you have weakened vascular structures. So hemorrhages are common. And when you get that hemorrhage in this area, you simply get a dissecting hemorrhage that dissects the periosteum away from the underlying cortex of bone. <clears throat> as in the metaphysis, once you correct the deficiency, the cells that are proliferating in the subperiosteum, and I apologize, the periosteum is below here and the bone is above, you get this intense proliferation of osteoblasts and new bone laid down beneath the periosteum. Laid down as it almost in invariably is, although with, with a little less organization than normally occurs with these spicules perpendicular to the underlying cortex of bone. So at the same time you're getting the excessive proliferation in the metaphysis, it's also occurring in the periosteal region. Yes. There is evidently no fibrous differentiation of the mesenchymal element in an effort to shore up. I was, I was under the impression that fibroblasts are formed because there's no imperfect osteoid formation that the fibroblast tried to shore up that area. But that's not true then. Well, <clears throat> the question is, uh, do fibroblasts form in an effort to shore up the area that's devoid of, of bony trabeculae in, in providing support? And I guess if you want to look at that proliferation of cells as being stimulated to a certain extent by the weakened <coughs> metaphysis, that some of that proliferation may in fact uh, represent that type of proliferation as a result of mechanical weakening of the metaphysis. But the point that I would make is that in the case of uh, fibrous osteodystrophy, for example, or other conditions where you have osteoporosis, protein calorie deficiencies, where you get almost as severe or perhaps more severe osteoporosis in the metaphysis, you don't get that type of, of mesenchymal cell proliferation. And while you get some fibrous proliferation, it looks more like mature fibrous tissue or more like the fibrous proliferation <clears throat> that you would expect in fibrous osteodystrophy. And in this case, you get this very immature population of mesenchymal cells that is really characteristic of scurvy. I don't think that I can recall any condition where you have osteoporosis or even with fibrous osteodystrophy, which is going to, we're going to discuss next. And I think if you compare what you saw with scurvy to the loose connective tissue that proliferates in the case of fibrous osteodystrophy, you'll still see the difference in that population of cells. Far more cellular larger population of cells and more mesenchymal in nature, more undifferentiated in nature than even that what you see in, in FOD. Okay, fibrous osteodystrophy. <clears throat> the point that I should make here is that in any osteodystrophy, any osteomalacia, uh, almost any of the bone diseases, these diseases are preceded by an osteoporotic phase. In other words, osteoporosis is almost invariably a component 
of any osteodystrophy or osteomalacia. The reason for that is that if we consider these diseases to be, represent this balance between bone formation and resorption, almost all of the conditions we're talking about are a result of either excessive resorption, reduced formation, or vice versa. And so the first phase of these diseases is usually either greater amounts of bone or lesser amounts of bone. And in those where the, bone, the amount of bone is reduced, the earliest lesion is osteoporosis, atrophy of bone, too little bone, or osteopenia, if, as some people would refer to it. The point is that by the time we recognize these diseases clinically, and by the time we usually look at these conditions, that osteoporotic phase is masked by all of the other changes associated with the disease that we're looking at. And so we, we see osteomalacia or we see the fibrous proliferation when in fact there's still a net decrease in the total amount of bone. All right, fibrous osteodystrophy results from and is a result of hyperparathyroidism either as a result of primary hyperparathyroidism due to hyperplasia or neoplasia of the parathyroid glands or secondary hyperparathyroidism due to renal disease or nutritional deficiencies. And we should not leave out the non-endocrine neoplasms which produce uh, parathormone-like substances or vitamin D-like uh, steroids that result in similar conditions and the lesion of fibrous osteodystrophy. I'd like to begin by discussing the forms of hyperparathyroidism because they've become uh, well ingrained in the literature and they can be somewhat misleading. Uh, hyperostotic, isostotic, and hypoostotic forms of fibrous osteodystrophy have been described. And while they use the term ostotic, uh, in most instances they're more of a fibrous lesion and a lack of bone than they are one of excessive amounts of bone or normal amounts of bone. So perhaps the terms would be better described as hyperfibrotic, but that's neither here nor there. These are the terms that have been applied, and I'd like to show you characteristic lesions of these three different types. Here's the hyperostotic form that we usually see in the subhuman primate, uh, occasionally in the dog, but the dog can be represented by either the hyperostotic or the isostotic forms. And you can see the excessive proliferation of fibrous tissue that's elevated the lip here. Uh, the teeth are displaced downward out of the alveolar area of the maxillary region. You'll have enlargement of the mandible as well, although it's usually not as spectacular as the changes in the maxilla. Cross-section of that area of the maxilla, and you can see the marked increase in size of the maxillary region. The modeled appearance, the dark red areas and the lighter areas represent areas where there's soft tissue, the red areas, and areas where there is some osteoid production and some bony proliferation that gives the lighter areas in this mottled appearance grossly. An isostotic form in the dog. Here's uh, the maxillary area of the dog, the mandible down here. You can simply move this nose back and forth. We had complete resorption of all the bone in the maxillary and nasal region without the excessive replacement with fibrous tissue. And this is referred to as the isostotic form. Here's that maxillary region in section, and you can see it consists almost entirely of soft tissues at this point with very little bone present. So no overall loss in mass, but at the same time not this excessive proliferation. The cat and the kitten are represented by the hypoostotic form, and hypoostotic fibrous osteodystrophy really radiographically and microscopically is represented more as an osteoporosis than it is a fibrous osteodystrophy because you have neither proliferation of fibrous tissue to any extent or proliferation of bony elements. And here's a poor doing kitten down in the hocks and and in the carpal areas, and that's about all you can appreciate grossly, except that it doesn't appear very well doing. And radiographically, you have marked rarefaction of all of the bones of the skeleton. The appendicular skeleton has lost a considerable amount of the normal mineral, but you don't see excessive proliferation of fibrous tissue, which will be evident in some of the other radiographic specimens that we look at. So the hypoostotic form in the cat. Here's the lesion in the cat subgross specimen, 
and I think you can appreciate even in a fairly low magnification that we have marked resorption within the cortices. So we have cancelization of the cortices. You don't really recognize normal compact bone in the cortex and on either side. You have subperiosteal proliferation, so you have some exostoses here that are reparative in nature in that they're there as a compensatory uh, phenomenon trying to reinforce this weakened metaphysis and cortical structure. But you don't have excessive proliferation of fibrous tissue anywhere in this lesion. So the classical hypoestotic form in the cat. Let's take these different forms of hyperparathyroidism one at a time. Primary hyperparathyroidism usually will give us the most extensive and severe forms of fibrous osteodystrophy, simply because the levels of parathormone are considerably higher than that that is produced either by the renal or nutritional conditions. The etiology is either functional chief cell adenomas or adenocarcinomas or hyperplasia of the chief cells of the parathyroid gland. <clears throat> Here's the thyroid and the parathyroid gland. This area here is relatively normal, but this area <coughs> is represented by an adenoma. In primary hyperparathyroidism, looking at the, an oversimplification of the situation that occurs as far as serum calcium and phosphorus, you have progressive increase in calcium levels and excessive hypercalcemia and progressive loss of phosphorus by dumping of phosphorus in the urine. So you have excretion of phosphorus, but continued production of an, an increase in calcium levels in the serum due to the effect of parathormone on both the intestine and bone. A radiograph of a dog with the hyperostotic form of fibrous osteodystrophy. Notice the marked enlargement again of the maxillary area to a lesser extent the mandible. The teeth here are displaced downward. Normally they should be sitting up here in the dental alveoli. Notice the loss of the lamina dura dentins, both in the maxillary area and in the mandible. Here's that lesion grossly, the teeth displaced downward here, this fibrous enlargement of the maxillary area. Radiographically, the cross-section of these specimens give you this mottled appearance, and this goes back to the gross specimen that I showed you earlier, those lucent areas represent areas where there's excessive resorption, uh, osteoclastic activity, and so we have little or no bone and only fibrous tissue or hemorrhage in these areas. And the more radio-opaque areas represent areas of poorly mineralized, but to, uh, to some extent, mineralized osteoid that's been produced within this proliferation of fibrous tissue. Gross specimen, again, showing the modeled appearance same area as we just looked at radiographically, and a large cyst that's developed as a result of hemorrhage and degenerative change that's occurred within this area of fibrous proliferation. This is what uh, has given rise to the term in man of osteitis fibrosa cystica because of the occurrence of these cystic changes within the fibrous proliferation. You're replacing normal skeletal tissue with fibrous tissue, and as a result of motion and weakened structures, it's not uncommon for these cystic areas to develop. We may have a beginning one here in this area. Microscopically, the radiolucent areas are characterized by areas such as this, where there's old hemorrhage, some connective tissue, marked osteoclastic activity. Each of these cells at the periphery here are osteoclasts that are resorbing the trabeculae of bone that have become mineralized to enough extent that they can be resorbed. And the radiopaque areas that we see radiographically are characterized by these areas where there is bony trabeculae formed out of this connective tissue that's present in this area. Here's a higher magnification of the osteoclast. Some of these become quite large and bizarre. Uh, to the extent that if you were to look at an area such as this by itself, a small punch biopsy or something of that type, one could very easily suspect that you were looking at a giant cell tumor. And it emphasizes the importance of either looking at relatively large specimens or multiple specimens out of such sites. 
Here's the calvarium from the dog that we started out looking at that has primary hyperparathyroidism, and you can see this moth-eaten appearance of the calvarium. Mark osteoclastic resorption, parathormone stimulating osteoclastic activity, and as the bone's removed, it's replaced by fibrous tissue. An isostatic form here, the gross specimen showing the thinning of the calvarial plates, but no excessive thickening or excessive proliferation of fibrous tissue, but simply that moth-eaten appearance. The long bone radiographically, and I would point out that the cortex over in this area is close to being normal, but still not as dense as it should be. It fades out a bit in this area, but the opposite cortex is hardly definable at all. You can see a line here that uh, outlines the endosteal surface of the pre-existing cortex. But that cortex has virtually been cancelized by osteoclastic activity, cutting cones that run up and down through that cortex and simply convert it from cortical bone to cancellous bone and a failure to reform osteons as that remodeling process takes place. At the same time, the medullary cavity is denser than it should be, and that's because of fibrous proliferation and the formation of some bony trabeculae within that area that would normally not be present. Here you see that specimen grossly. Here's the cortex on this side and on the opposite side. And you can even appreciate grossly the porous nature of the cortices of these long bones and the medullary cavity that instead of being filled with red marrow is filled more with uh, loose connective tissue and, and fatty elements and so on. Microscopically, Here's the cancelization of the cortex that I was referring to. You don't see nice, net, dense cortical bone. Not much proliferation here in the medullary cavity. Much of the soft tissue has, has fallen out in the process of sectioning. And some subperiosteal reinforcement due to the weakening of the area of the metaphysis. Higher magnification showing the, prolifer the cancelization of the cortices. And a point that I would make here is that and even in an animal, and we're looking at the same animal, these are the specimens from the dog with primary hyperparathyroidism, the same one that had that excessive proliferation of fibrous tissue in the maxillary area. While you get that excessive proliferation in the region of the skull, you seldom see proliferation of fibrous tissue in the long bones to the same extent. So for one reason or another, that's manifest more in the flat bones of the skull than it is in the tubular bones and the long bones of the appendicular skeleton. Some suggest that that's because of the mastication in the dog eating. I don't buy that with dogs this day and age that don't have that much difficulty in masticating their food because most of them are eating soft diets and they still develop this fibrous proliferation. So I think it's a difference in the uh, structure and the form of the bones in which the fibrous proliferation is occurring. Higher magnification still of this cancelized cortices in the long bones of this dog with primary hyperparathyroidism. Out on the surface of the cortex, beneath the periosteum, you get this intense osteoclastic resorption. So you're removing bone on the outer surfaces of the cor cortex. At the same time, you're having cutting cones removing bone within the center of that cortex. And here again, the resorption within the cortex. These are all cutting cones reaming out that cortex. And here, a layer of loose mesenchymal fibrous tissue lining the endosteal surface within the medullary cavity. OK, let's go to nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> NSH is a result of diets that are low in calcium and usually high in phosphorus, normally a, a calcium-phosphorus imbalance is the normal usual cause for this condition. In the case of the dog, those being fed all meat diets, which are low in calcium and high in phosphorus, with an imbalance of about somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 20 to 1 in favor of phosphorus, will result in nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. And as I pointed out earlier, the form of the fibrous osteodystrophy can be either the hyperostotic form or the isostatic form. In the case of the cat, again, all meat diets, imbalance in calcium and phosphorus. But I'd like to point out here that age and the level of the hyperparathyroid state 
influence the kind of lesion that one sees. Uh, in the case of the kitten, we usually will see fibrous osteodystrophy. Now, I pointed out the kitten earlier and said that it was a hypoostotic form and it was primarily uh, a lesion of osteoporosis. There is some fibrous proliferation in the younger animals, usually, and therefore it is fairly typical fibrous osteodystrophy. In the adult cat, you get very little, if any, fibrous proliferation, and the lesion is certainly one of predominantly osteoporosis. But relatively, comparing the kitten to the dog and the other species that develop fibrous osteodystrophy, even it is more osteoporotic than it is fibrous osteodystrophy. In the case of the horse, we've applied the terms big head because of the enlargement of the uh, skull in horses with fibrous osteodystrophy and bran disease because of the tendency for this condition to occur in horses that are being fed bran, which is excessively high, and phosphorus, and produces the disease. But again, it's the same cause as all the others, either a low to normal calcium and a high phosphorus. Here's an example of a horse with an enlarged nasal area. You can see the Roman nose appearance that this animal gets as a result of enlargement in the maxillary area. And another one with not only enlargement in the maxillary nasal region, but also you can see the prominence of the mandibular rami as a result of enlargement of the mandible. Now, to look at calcium phosphorus levels in the serum in nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism, in contrast to the situation in primary hyperparathyroidism where calcium levels increased persistently and phosphorus levels declined, here as a result of the excessive phosphorus in the diet and either a low or normal calcium, phosphorus levels increase, calcium levels decline, and in the case of normal calcium, the calcium levels dec decline because of the mass law equation that says that as phosphorus goes up, the calcium ion concentration must go down. So the calcium declines, phosphorus increases to the point where the calcium levels become low enough that they stimulate parathormone secretion. And once the parath parathyroid glands are turned on, then the calcium levels start to come back to normal. And assuming that we have normal renal function, the phosphorus is excreted and we come back to an isocalcemia and an isophosphatemia. That would not happen in the primary condition where the calcium levels persist until either the neoplastic condition or the hyperplastic condition is corrected. Osteoporosis versus osteodystrophy. We've already pointed out the situation in the cat, that it depends on the degree of hyperparathyroidism the more intense the parathormone secretion, the more likely to see this excessive fibrous proliferation. Depends on the species, the cat being the one that's characterized primarily by an osteoporotic lesion. And it depends on the time that has gone by until the animal is evaluated either radiographically or histologically. In that if you looked at these lesions, at any of these lesions, early on, the lesion is primarily one of osteoporosis. Even in those that become intensely fibrous in, in nature. And so it goes back to what I was saying earlier that osteoporosis precedes any of these osteodystrophies or osteomalacias. Nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism in the New World monkey. The New World monkey must have vitamin D3 in its diet. It can't utilize vitamin D2. And until that was recognized uh, a few years back when uh, one of the companies that provided uh, monkey chow commercially uh, put vitamin D2 in its diets. Uh, a large population of monkeys developed nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> that doesn't happen very often anymore because the condition's been recognized. And when you see this condition in monkeys nowadays, it's usually pet monkeys that have been fed uh, imbalanced diets, diets that are high in phosphorus and low in calcium, usually as a result of people thinking that they have to feed monkeys bananas and fruits and things of that nature. <clears throat> Again, an even more extensive hyperostotic form of fibrous osteodystrophy in the monkey than we saw earlier. Excessive proliferation to the point that these animals can't even uh, uh, take in food. 
enlargement of the mandible as well, displacement of, of teeth, loss of teeth in some situations because the teeth are simply sitting there in soft fibrous tissue. Here it is from a lateral view. You can see the excessive proliferation that occurs in the maxillary region. Here's a classic hyperostotic form in the calvarium. Mark thickening of the calvarial plates and you get this ground glass appearance with some areas of radiolucency, but not that excessively moth-eaten appearance that we saw in primary hyperparathyroidism. So even though it's an excessive hyperostotic form, it's still not, we don't have that intense osteoclastic resorption that occurs in primary hyperparathyroidism with the higher levels of hormone. Here's the gross specimen. You can see the mark thickening that you have in this area. The long bones from this monkey, and you can appreciate why the term osteitis fibrosa cystica has been applied to the disease, because you have all of this fibrous proliferation within the medullary cavity. You have these large lytic areas that appear cystic grossly. At the same time, you've got some relatively good density in the cortex on the one side, but you've virtually lost all of the cortex on the opposite side. The gross specimen. Cortex on the one side, thinning of the cortex on the other side, and there's enough red marrow still present that you really don't appreciate grossly the fibrous elements. <clears throat> this just happened to be a monkey that had a vitamin D deficiency. And we're going to talk about the interrelationship of nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism and D deficiency later on. <clears throat> but if you notice in the metaphyseal area, we have islands of cartilage sitting down here in the metaphysis. We're going to talk about rickets next, but this animal has rickets in addition to having fibrous osteodystrophy. You'll see that specimen later on. <clears throat> An isostatic form in a subhuman primate. Instead of that marked thickening of the calvarium, here you have a relatively normal appearance of the calvarial plate but you still get this ground glass appearance in some areas of radiolucency within that calvarial plate. <clears throat> and just to point out that this isn't restricted to the domestic animals and the subhuman primates and that you get animals, wild animals that are taken in as pets or whatever and fed imbalanced diets and you get uh, hyperostotic fibrous osteodystrophy, in this case in the opossum, uh, the same as you do in any of the other species. Okay, renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> the etiology of this disease is chronic renal disease, and it can be either the result of interstitial nephritis, glomerulonephritis, nephrosclerosis, uh, amyloidosis. Any of these conditions can result in sufficient renal disease to give you secondary renal hyperparathyroidism. This occurs primarily, these first four lesions occur primarily in older animals. In young animals, you may have renal cortical hypoplasia, polycystic kidneys, or bilateral hydronephrosis. So in the younger animals, the latter three are more likely to occur, whereas the others are more likely to occur in the older animal. The serum calcium phosphorus profile looks like this. In this case, as a result of reduced functional kidney, we have failure to excrete phosphorus. So the phosphorus increases persistently. Calcium levels decline to the point that the parathyroid gland again kicks in and responds to the reduced calcium levels in the serum. And then it begins to return to normal. Now, depending on the severity of the hyperphosphatemia, you may or may not get back to an isocalcemia. So you may have either a iso or hypocalcemia that persists throughout this condition. But in this case, we have persistent hyperphosphatemia. Now in this slide, we can spend the remainder of the hour on uh, this one slide, but it won't really take us quite that long if we take it piecemeal. Here we're seeing the progressive hyperphosphatemia that approaches 15 to 25 milligram per ml. The calcium level declines, parathormone kicks in, and we come back toward isocalcemia. Let's concentrate now on what's happening at the intestinal level in this situation. 
in the presence of the excessive phosphorus levels in the serum, we have increased excretion of phosphate ions into the intestine. And therefore, you form insoluble complexes of calcium and phosphate in the intestine itself, so that the dietary calcium is tied up by the phosphorus that's excreted into the intestinal lumen. So you have reduced absorption of calcium from the intestine. In other words, you have reduced available calcium, available dietary-wise, for absorption across the intestinal wall. In the liver, where we normally produce from vitamin D, the 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, we have in the presence of uremia a reduced production of that 25 metabolite. And at the kidney level, where the kidney cells normally convert the 25 metabolite to 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, we have a failure to produce the active metabolite of vitamin D, the 125 form. As a result of that, the primary effect of the 125 metabolite at the, in the case of the intestine is on the absorptive cells and the production of calcium ATPase, and in the goblet cell and its production of calcium binding protein. So with the reduced availability of these products, we have reduced intestinal absorption of calcium. So we have two things that are interfering with normal calcium metabolism and uptake from the intestine. The net effect then is, first of all, the mass law equation, which says as phosphorus ion increases, calcium ions will decrease, and that stimulates parathormone activity. We have loss of calcium from the kidney because of abnormal renal function. We have calcium phosphorus complexes in the gut that reduce the amount of available dietary calcium, and we have reduced intestinal calcium uptake and absorption the net effect being a severe calcium deficiency, all because of renal disease. Now, if we look at the pathogenesis that results in the bone, the bone lesions that result as, as a consequence of this reduced calcium uptake, if we begin at the top with reduced functional kidney parenchyma, we have the reduced production of the 125 metabolite, and we have phosphorus retention. In the case of the phosphorus retention, the consequence is excessive phosphorus levels in the plasma. If we follow the changes that result from the reduced 125 metabolite, we've talked about the reduced intestinal calcium absorption, which the net effect is reduced levels of plasma calcium. At the same time, the 125 metabolite is permissive in bone in that for normal osteocytic osteolysis and osteoclastic resorption to take place, one needs to have the 125 metabolite. So if you don't have that, you don't have normal bone resorption, that also contributes to the reduced plasma calcium levels. If we follow that line on down, we have increased parathormone secretion due to the reduced plasma calcium levels. We have increased bone resorption, even in the absence of normal levels of the 125 metabolite, bone resorption does proceed under the influence of the parathormone. So you get continued resorption of bone and you get fibrous osteodystrophy. The same sequence of events that occurs under any condition where you have reduced plasma calcium levels. The thing that makes renal osteodystrophy different is that in addition to having the reduced plasma calcium levels here, which reduce the mineralization of osteoid, you fail to mineralize bone matrix that's produced, you also develop osteomalacia. And osteomalacia, by definition, is failure to mineralize the osteoid or the organic matrix of bone. So renal osteodystrophy is characterized by both fibrous osteodystrophy and osteomalacia, or this failure to form osteoid to, to mineralize the osteoid seams. Question. Is the 125 needed only for osteocytic osteolysis or for all kinds of bone resorption? The question is, is the 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol required only for osteocytic osteolysis or all forms of bone resorption? The answer is that active metabolite is required for all forms of, of 
bone resorption and for normal bone formation. In other words, that 125 metabolite has a permissive effect on all the bone cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. And the normal resorptive processes, the driving and the direction and the normal uh, resorptive processes that occur either by the osteocyte or the osteoclast are reduced in its absence. By the same token, bone formation is influenced by a lack of that. And when we get to rickets, I'll allude to that in what happens if you have a vitamin D deficiency and you treat that deficiency with calcium or phosphorus and you don't give the animal vitamin D. You don't have normal mineralization patterns and mineralization doesn't occur at the mineralization front as it normally would. So that active metabolite has a very widespread influence on all bone cell activity. Let's talk about rickets and osteomalacia. <clears throat> we said earlier that calcium deficiency or calcium phosphorus imbalances will give rise to nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. In other words, if you have reduced calcium levels in the blood, you're going to stimulate parathormone secretion and develop nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. In the case of a phosphorus deficiency, you get rickets or osteomalacia. And rickets is the condition that occurs in the young growing animal that has a growth plate. Osteomalacia is the same condition occurring in an animal after the growth plates have closed and you only can look at osteoid seams and the bone that's laid down on bone surfaces. Vitamin D deficiency, basically a deficiency of the 125 metabolite, the active metabolite of vitamin D, will give you rickets and osteomalacia due to the D deficiency. But at the same time, if you think back to the renal condition, the failure to produce that 125 metabolite and therefore the failure to absorb calcium at the normal levels gives you a calcium deficiency. And so superimposed on the rickets and osteomalacia that occurs in a vitamin D deficiency, you'll also have nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. So that the D deficiency is going to give you both of these pictures. And you may get carried away, as in the monkey that I showed you, with the lesions of fibrous osteodystrophy, when in fact the lesions of rickets or osteomalacia are there as well. The pathogenesis of rickets or osteomalacia is failure to mineralize osteoid, failure to mineralize cartilage. And if the growth plate is present, then a failure to mineralize the matrix surrounding the hypertrophied chondrocytes. You should be able to anticipate what's going to happen if you don't have mineralization of those cells. They don't degenerate and die. You don't have the open column for the vessels to extend into. And you simply have cartilage that extends into the metaphysis as a result of failure of mineralization and degeneration of the hypertrophied cartilage. At the same time, you have abnormal matrix produced. This comes back to the fact that in the presence of a vitamin D deficiency, you, the osteoblast produces a matrix which is not capable of being fully mineralized. There will be some mineral deposited in it, but you don't get normal matrix. And therefore, in the presence of an abnormal matrix, you don't have normal osteoclastic remodeling. Osteoclasts can only attack bone surfaces that are mineralized. And if you have an unmineralized bone surface, the osteoclast isn't going to be able to do a thing with it. And that matrix is simply going to sit there. And in the case of rickets or osteomalacia, that's exactly what happens. And you have, therefore, reduced either reduced chondroclastic or osteoclastic remodeling because of this failure of mineralization. <clears throat> a monkey, normal monkey with classic long bones. Notice the width of the growth plate here in the, between the epiphysis and the metaphysis and compare that to the next slide that we're going to show you. Normal growth plates, normal length of long bones, and density. Compare that to the, this next slide. Notice the shortened long bones, both in the forelimb and hind limb. Notice the flaring of the metaphyses and the widened growth plate. That lucent line between the epiphysis and the metaphysis is much wider than in the normal situation. And the classic so-called rachitic rosary, the enlargement of the costochondral junctions as a result of the rachitic lesion. Here's a 
metaphysis at the costochondral junction. That is widened. If you were to look at it grossly, you'd appreciate what gives the, cost, the, the rachitic rosary effect. But in addition, you have these cores of cartilage that extend into the metaphysis. This is about, well, this is probably nearly two times as wide even here in this narrow region. So this is wider than it should be in terms of the, the developing growth plate. But all of this cartilage is hypertrophied chondrocytes that extend into the metaphysis as a result of failure of that matrix to mineralize and therefore allow for normal enchondral bone formation to occur. Here's the microscopic specimen of the monkey that I showed you when we were talking about fibrous osteodystrophy. And these are all islands of cartilage here that extend into the metaphysis. And you have this very haphazard appearance to the growth plate where normally there wouldn't be a nice uniform band in that region. A calf with rickets, growth plate here. This is an undecalcified section. These are areas where there is mineralization of the cartilage. This is not a severe case of rickets. And there is mineralization occurring in the cartilage trabeculae. And in general, this was pretty good enchondral bone formation. In fact, to the extent that it suggests that the rachitic episode occurred at an earlier point in time, allowing these islands of cartilage to persist here in the metaphysis, and that the diet, for one reason or another, has been corrected over the past few weeks, and now you're getting normal mineralization, normal enchondral remodeling occurring in this area beneath the growth plate. Comparison slide, normal growth plate, normal metaphysis compared to a growth plate with all of the hypertrophied chondrocytes in these islands that extend into the metaphyseal region. Simply failure of mineralization of matrix. I said earlier that the matrix that's produced in the rachitic phase is abnormal. If one has a vitamin D deficiency or a phosphorus deficiency. And it persists for a period of time, and then one corrects that deficiency, either with vitamin D or phosphorus, assuming you pick the correct one or use both. Mineralization and ossification begin to occur in the area of the growth plate where it would normally be occurring at that point in time. In other words, if this cartilage was produced during the rachitic period, Mineralization doesn't begin just at this margin, but it begins up here, where normal hypertrophied chondrocytes would normally be degenerating, dying, and be in the capillaries extending into those columns. And so if you look at this over a longer period of time, rickets was present during this period to about right here. Then the diet was, the deficiency was corrected, and we have normal bone formation occurring in this region here. But all of this matrix is left behind indicating that that matrix is abnormal. Even now that the diet's been corrected, this cartilaginous matrix doesn't undergo mineralization and replacement with bone. And so you have this abnormal cartilage left behind. And the matrix is, in fact, abnormal in these situations. If you have rickets or osteomalacia that occurs as a result of a vitamin D deficiency, and you treat that with increased calcium phosphorus levels. And you don't recognize it as a vitamin D deficiency. If these are the osteoblasts on the bone surface, what will happen is you'll get patchy mineralization of the matrix in this region. You'll get amorphous calcium phosphate laid down, but you won't get normal mineralization as you would if you treated this with vitamin D. If you treat that condition with vitamin D, the osteoblasts lay down bone in the area of the mineralization front, this representing mineralized bone. The mineralization follows along behind, and you get the normal mineralization of that osteoid seam. But if you treat that incorrectly with calcium or phosphorus alone, you get this patchy mineralization. The point of this is that vitamin D and that active metabolite is important for this osteoblast to carry out its normal directive function of the mineralization of the organic matrix that it produces. Osteomalacia is, as we pointed out, an adult form of rickets. And we only have the bone surfaces where bone formation is occurring to look at. 
And if you look at undecalcified sections of a case of osteomalacia, you have the green mineralized bone and you have these very wide osteoid seams on the surface as a result of matrix that's been produced but failed to undergo mineralization. And you can appreciate that a bit better if you look at it with uh, fluorochrome labeled bone, in this case tetracycline. Here's an undecalcified section stained with basic fuchsin. This is the unmineralized bone that you see here in the margins. The osteoid seam is bright red here on the surface with osteoblasts aligning it. If you look at that same section with the fluorochrome labeling and separate two, the administration of two labels by approximately three weeks apart, the Mineralization that occurs three weeks ago occurs here in this region. Bone formation continues to occur, matrix is produced, and the second label is this dense yellow band that's laid down in this region. So we have normal mineralization following along behind as osteoid is laid down on the surface. In the case of rickets, with the undecalcified section, we have the mineralized bone here and we have this wide osteoid seam. And if we look at that with a fluorochrome label, we have no tetracycline label that's been laid down. Mineralization is not occurring in that osteoid. The tetracycline is deposited with the mineral and is part of the mineral. And therefore, you have no fluorochrome band represented as a result of this proliferation of osteoid and failure of mineralization. Clinical signs. Uh, this is a condition that occurs in young, large breeds of dog, usually between three and six months of age. Four months seems to usually be about the standard age where we'll see this most often. Uh, presents <clears throat> as a lameness, lameness and a reluctance to move. Usually these animals have a fever that will run into the area of 105 or 106, fairly high fever during the acute onsets. The animals are depressed. And clinically, there's been described albuminuria and leukocytosis, not particularly surprising in the presence of, of a fever such as we see with this condition. And the next series of, of diseases that we're going to talk about, HOD, canine panosteitis, and canine, canine cranial mandibular osteopathy, you'll see are all characterized by uh, evidence of fever, yet we don't associate these or have not identified infectious agents as being specifically the cause of these conditions. The presenting signs are usually those of swollen carpal and tarsal joints, pain on palpation when you palpate these animals in the region of the joint, no pain in the mid-shaft region of the bones, and we'll point out that that tends to differ from that situation that you see with canine panosteitis where the pain is in the uh, shaft region of the bone and not in the joints. Concomitant infections that occur with this condition are tonsillitis, pneumonia, pyoderma, distemper. Uh, the first description of hypertrophic osteodystrophy from Angel Memorial back in 1957 commented on the number of, a of their animals that had signs of distemper. And every animal that I've had the opportunity to ne necropsy, which is about four in number, I think, have either had distemper at the time, showing seizures and so on, or had a history of having had distemper prior to the animal going to necropsy. Now, what the significance of that is, I'm not sure. But more and more, we're coming to think that this is a disease that's a result of an infectious process and not a metabolic disease or a nutritional disease. The question of ascorbic acid levels in the serum. It's been reported that animals with hypertrophic osteodystrophy have reduced vitamin C levels or ascorbic acid levels in the serum. This was reported by uh, the Angel Memorial Group in the first report of the condition. Since that time, uh, with the advent of and popularity of vitamin C therapy for humans and otherwise for most everything that ails anyone, Veterinarians have been treating hypertrophic osteodystrophy with uh, ascorbic acid, and many have reported that megadoses of ascorbic acid, in fact, uh, cure hypertrophic osteodystrophy. The only problem that I have with that is that it seems to me that very seldom do they treat with ascorbic acid alone. Usually the diets get altered, uh, supplemental minerals are, are added, and if necessary because of the 
fever and so on, antibiotics are prescribed. So uh, I'm not sure that the conclusion that ascorbic acid therapy is really the thing that cures this disease is correct. The other thing about ascorbic acid levels and looking at them in uh, the dog is that they're highly labile. And if these samples aren't handled properly at the time of collection and until they get to the laboratory, the finding of low ascorbic acid levels in the dog, uh, too much credit should not be given to that because it's very possible that uh, uh, this is an in vitro loss of, of ascorbic acid rather than an actual deficiency as far as the animal is concerned. So more recently, the question of vitamin C deficiency has become uh, an issue. Prior to that, the most popular <coughs> consideration as far as the etiology was one of overnutrition, primarily over supplementation of vitamins and minerals in these large breed dogs, and the possibility that we were looking at a case of hypervitaminosis D. And the lesions certainly do have many features that are suggestive of hypervitaminosis D. They also have many lesions that are suggestive of vitamin C deficiency. So they have a a pattern of changes that could represent either of these two conditions. Uh, these large breeds are supplemented with everything imaginable, from the over supplementation with vitamins and minerals to having uh, quarter pound sticks of butter crammed down their throats two or three times a day, uh, to all sorts of various uh, uh, oil and fat sub sub supplements and so on. And uh, so it was reasonable that in these large breed dogs getting those types of supplementation to believe that maybe uh, we were doing something nutritionally that was the, the cause of this condition. And that the breed incidence is certainly high in such breeds as the Great Dane, the Irish Setter, and those large giant breed dogs. Here's a Great Dane with enlarged carpal joints pain, animals don't want to walk, they want to stay laying down uh, pretty much. And the reason the disease was referred to initially as hypertrophic osteodystrophy was the fact that the earliest lesions one saw were evidence of increased bone proliferation in the metaphyseal region as well as increased proliferation subperiosteally. As you'll see later on, the lesions that occur in the subperiosteum are compensatory and reparative, I think, to lytic changes that are occurring in the metaphysis. And while you'll have some increased density at times in the metaphysis, there's usually a lytic line, and you can even see a lytic band right here in this region, immediately beneath the growth plate, or in this case, above the growth plate. The, this disease has been referred to more recently by Grandenson as metaphyseal osteopathy. And it's probably a better term because it more appropriately describes the lesion and at least the location of the lesion than does hypertrophic osteodystrophy. Osteodystrophy being a catch-all term and the hypertrophic really being a misnomer because it's not so much hypertrophy as it is a lysis and destruction of bone. Here's the growth plate distally and we have above that a lytic band in the metaphysis. Same thing in this area up here. That's the hallmark of this disease radiographically, and that's this lysis of bone in the metaphyseal region adjacent to the growth plate. Here you see that grossly. Here's relatively normal growth plate here, and then here the growth plate becomes thickened, and we have this band of lysis that extends all the way across the full thickness of the metath full width of the metaphysis. The primary lesion is this lesion here in the metaphysis as a result of the destruction of bone and therefore vascular destruction in this area. You get hemorrhage in the vicinity. The metaphyseal vessels, if you stop to think that these vessels are coming in and the capillaries are extending up to the growth plate, you've simply dissected this area away from the growth plate. The vessels aren't crossing that lytic zone and getting to the growth plate. If that's happening, mineralization is not going to occur in the hypertrophic zone, and you would expect the cartilage in the growth plate to become thickened. And that's exactly what happens, and you get areas that are somewhat reminiscent of a rachitic lesion, because you have failure of the, those hypertrophied chondrocytes to mineralize, but only because you've 
remove that growth plate from the underlying metaphyseal blood supply. Distal ulna, here's the lytic band in the metaphysis, and here's the ulnar growth plate, which is normally V-shaped or conical, and you have all of this excessive cartilage proliferating here in this region. This necrotic zone is very similar to the so-called Trummerfeld zone that is seen in or hypervitaminosis D in man. And so that's one feature of the disease that is reminiscent of that condition. Here's the distal radial growth plate, the lytic band in the area of the metaphysis, normal thickness of the growth plate only over here in this one margin, the remainder of that gro growth plate markedly thickened over what it should be normally. Subgrowth specimen, normal thickness of the growth plate, necrotic zone here, thickened growth plate in this region. Still higher magnification, here's the hypertrophied chondrocytes of the growth plate. We have mineralized trabeculae of cartilage, so the cartilage spicules are present and are here, but you have a reduced cellular population because this necrotic zone has cut off the blood supply. So here's your area of necrosis of bone and soft tissues as well. If you look at that necrotic area, uh, higher magnification, there are focal accumulations of large numbers of neutrophils, plasma cells, lymphocytes, inflammatory cell population, fair number of osteoclasts in the region that usually accompany inflammatory foci and the associated vascular proliferation that goes with it. So you'll see fair numbers of, of giant cells or osteoclasts. Here's an even larger population. And you can appreciate, I think, that a fair number of these cells are neutrophils and so on. This has led people to conclude, and more recently, uh, Dr. Reiser and uh, uh, Carol Woodard at University of Florida have reported what they believe this lesion to be, and that is that it's an infectious process. They haven't identified an infectious agent, but more and more people are coming to accept the concept that this is an infectious process, and we simply have to look for the, the etiologic agent in the condition. Uh, it's hard to believe that the distemper virus doesn't somehow play a role in this with the frequency that uh, uh, this condition is associated in dogs that have hypertrophic osteodystrophy. I mentioned uh, when we talked about hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy that the subperiosteal proliferations that occurred ran the full shaft of the long bones. That contrasts with the situation with hypertrophic osteodystrophy where you have proliferation subperiosteally in the metaphyses, but the shaft is relatively clean and smooth. And so this proliferation is all in the metaphyseal regions. But that's a compensatory phenomenon to this weakened metaphysis in trying to reinforce that area of the metaphysis that's weakened by, by the necrotic changes that occur. <coughs> Canine panosteitis. Sorry. The uh, question is, does the deformities in the bone resolve in hypertrophic osteodystrophy? You're referring specifically to the subperiosteal proliferation or all of those lesions? If those animals uh, survive and uh, you correct the condition, you'll get remodeling and correction of that area. Uh, the growth plate, you may leave behind islands of cartilage as a result of mineralization beginning to occur where it normally should, and you'll leave islands of cartilage behind. But you'll get remodeling, and you'll get removal of the subperiosteal bone, and they'll return to a relatively normal state if, if you can nurse the animal through that acute phase. Sure. Question. Is the inflammation invariably present? The question is, is the inflammation invariably present in HOD? Um, to a greater or lesser degree, yes. I think that when one looks at that area of necrosis, you invariably see one degree of inflammatory reaction or another. Worse in some animals than it is in others. Uh, one could ask whether or not the inflammatory changes that you're seeing as a result of uh, the necrotic bone and the necrotic changes that are occurring, and you're getting inflammatory reaction to that. But uh, in looking at some fairly early lesions, uh, some of the earliest lesions I can ever recall seeing were in uh, some Y-mariners. And 
looking at those changes that were fairly early, you see an intense inflammatory reaction around vessels. It almost suggests that it begins as a vascular phenomenon and the inflammatory reaction beginning in a paravascular region and then extending on to the point where you begin to see necrosis of bone and that lytic change taking place. And it suggests in the location that, it's, that it is that it's some effect on those uh, end arteries that are coming into that area of the growth plate and that we're beginning with some kind of a vasculitis or something in that region. And I really think some good in-depth research would, would shed some light on what's happening with that particular condition and I think ultimately will prove it to be an infectious process. <clears throat> it, the question is, does it involve all long bones and is it symmetrical? The answer is yes to a, a great extent. It usually will involve almost all long bones, even the vertebrae in some situations, but it's much more spectacular in the long bones. And as you could see in those specimens that I showed you, I showed you a proximal humerus, a distal radius, a distal ulna. You'll see it in the tibia proximally and distally. You'll see it in the femur. Uh, it, it occurs pretty much generalized throughout the body with lesions that are more severe in one location perhaps in another, but usually they're present in multiple bones. Even sometimes when they're not present radiographically and you don't identify those lesions radiographically, if you look at them microscopically, they'll be present. Another question? Uh, two questions. One, uh, has there been any explanation of the sudden deaths among these animals, uh, apparently in the recovery phase? And if this is related to hypervitaminosis D, is there mineralization in the uh, parenchymal organs throughout the body? Would anybody look at that? Okay, the, the question was, I lost the first part of the question. The, the second part of the question was whether or not uh, if it was related to vitamin D, do you see the other evidence of vitamin, hypervitaminosis D with mineralization in the other organs and so on? The answer to that is uh, occasionally in some animals that have had this condition, uh, mineralization in the heart, stomach, other organs have been observed. Uh, that was what led Dr. Reiser a few years back to suspect that it was over supplementation of vitamins and minerals. However, there's always the possibility that in those animals that were being supplemented that we were seeing those lesions and those lesions were present but had nothing to do with the HOD lesion. And uh, I've attempted to reproduce this disease with excessive level of uh, vitamin D to the point that we got complete renal shutdown as a result of the renal damage that was caused by the hypervitaminosis D. We had the mineralization of the soft tissues and we had lesions that didn't come close to representing hypertrophic osteodystrophy. So I couldn't reproduce the, the condition with hypervitaminosis D experimentally. So if it is associated with vitamin D, then it must be some interaction with some other factor, whether it's infectious or what, I'm not sure. Would you restate the first part of your question? I lost Has it. there uh, been any explanation of the sudden death among some of these animals during the recovery mm. phase? The, the question is, has there been any explanation for the sudden death of some of these animals during the recovery period? And to my knowledge, no. I'm not aware that there is an explanation for that. Um, I just, I don't have an explanation and I don't know whether it uh, uh, is related to other processes that are ongoing at the time or related somehow to the situation with these particular uh, with the lesions that, that, that are present. I don't know. I don't know that that's a common uh, problem. I, I know that it's been reported, but I don't know that it's a common problem in the uh, recovery period in these animals. Uh, do you have any in indications of the numbers? That, has there been a report or anything on the number of these animals that have died acutely during the recovery period? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that may be uh, simply circumstantial, more circumstantial evidence for the fact that there's some other process ongoing that's responsible for the condition. Okay. Can canine panosteitis. <clears throat> the breeds that are involved here are primarily the uh, medium to large size breeds, the German Shepherds, the Golden Retrievers animals of that size, but it covers a somewhat wider range than, than the HOD lesions do. 
The etiology has covered a wide range of things, as has the, the hypertrophic osteodystrophy. Uh, heredity has been suggested in that there's some genetic uh, evidence for genetic predisposition. Uh, people have looked uh, long and hard for viral agents and have been unable to identify any. Uh, some of the most extensive work on this condition was done by Dave Van Sickle at Purdue, and he suggested that it's related to physiologic stress, that very often following periods of either running these animals in the field or some form of physiologic stress is the time at which the onset of this disease takes place, and that the primary change and the primary abnormality begins in the fatty marrow of the long bones and that the changes we associate with the skeletal structures are really secondary to an early degenerative process that, that begins in the adipose marrow. The clinical signs in these animals, we see the condition anywhere from two months to five years. Uh, there's only a few cases of animals out at the four or five year range that are involved. Usually these animals are somewhere in the neighborhood of nine months to a year, fairly young animals that are involved. Shifting leg lameness that may shift from one leg to another leg. Uh, pain in the diaphyseal region as opposed to the metaphyseal region com in comparison to HOD. A male to female, ma female ratio that's about four to one, so a higher incidence in males. It can occur in a single site and, or in multiple sites. It may occur in more than one leg simultaneously or as it, the shifting leg lameness suggests, the lesion may occur in the humerus this week, subside, and flare up uh, a few weeks later in the tibia, for example. These animals are usually inapetent and have fevers that are a bit lower than in HOD, but up around 103, 104 uh, degree fever. As far as clinical pathology, the white cell counts have been reported to be anywhere from normal to high normal. Uh, this disease was referred to at one time as eosinophilic panosteitis. I think that's a, a poor term because only about 15 percent of the animals with the condition really have an eosinophilia uh, that ranges somewhere from 20 to 38 percent eosinophils. Animals with the condition have been reported to have large platelets or larger platelets than normal and some have been reported to have increased clotting time. Here's the humerus of a dog with developing panosteitis, and you can see radio opacities that are present here within the medullary cavity. Cortices are normal, metaphyses are normal. Here's the nutrient artery where it enters right here, and you can see it well delineated. But you have bony proliferation immediately in the vicinity of the nutrient artery and on up into the medullary cavity. It's characteristic for this condition to begin in the vicinity of the nutrient artery and spread proximally and distally in the medullary cavity. Uh, it's a self-limiting disease in that it tends to subside over a period of weeks and when the lesion begins to resolve, it begins resolving at the two metaphyseal ends or at the outer limits of that bony proliferation and extends back and disappears last in the area of the nutrient artery. So it disappears pretty much in reverse of the manner in which it develops. Here's another lesion intense radio density here in this area of the medullary cavity, some fainter densities here uh, more proximal. Another one, radio density here in this region. And a subgrowth specimen, here's the nutrient artery where it enters. This is all cancellous bone that's formed within the medullary cavity. The lesion is not limited to the medullary cavity because if you notice, there's subperiosteal proliferation of new bone here and over on this opposite cortex as well. There's marked resorption of the cortex in the vicinity of the area in which the lesion begins. Here's radiographic uh, specimens, normal on the left, normal cortices, medullary cavity. Here's the cortex from a dog with panosteitis, and you see this fairly dense calibered trabeculae of cancellous bone that form in the medullary cavity. Cross section of that area showing the cortex here, the nidus of bone that forms in the medullary cavity, the subperiosteal bone that forms here. Notice the perpendicular spicules of bone that form typically beneath the periosteum when bone formation occurs in that location. 
So it's suggesting that the vascular changes are resulting in this resorption of original cortex. And at the same time, you're getting a reinforcement of the subperiosteal region at the same time that the nidus of bone is forming in the medullary cavity. Here's that at a little higher magnification. The nidus of bone in the medullary cavity, vessels here, the cortex, relatively normal density here, and that perpendicular spicule of bone that forms beneath the periosteum on the outer surface of the cortex. So we always concentrate on what's happening in the medullary cavity, but there are a lot of things going on in the subperiosteum and in the cortex as well. Higher magnification microscopically of that area, showing the nutrient artery entering here, the subperiosteal bone, the resorption of the cortices, periosteal bone over here, and the nidus of bone that forms within the medullary cavity. Still higher magnification of the nutrient artery, the subperiosteal bone, the cortex, and the margin of the medullary nidus. Cortex here on the right, some, a band of fatty marrow, which we'll look at a little more closely in a moment, some intense basophilia at the margin of the medullary nidus. So we have fairly broad set trabeculae of bone here with intertrabecular spaces that contain loose connective tissue elements. But there's an intense cellularity at the very margin of this where the new bone is being formed. Here it is at a little higher magnification, the cortex, fatty marrow, and this intense cellular proliferation at the margin of the medullary nidus. It's this cellular proliferation that got the attention of Dr. Uh, Van Sickle, and he suggested in the studies that he's done that these are the adventitial cells of the vessels, and that this proliferation of cells begins around vessels in the medullary cavity, and you get this proliferation of adventitial cells, which obviously have the ability to differentiate into osteoblasts, because you begin getting these spicules of new bone forming, such as you see here. Here's an early bony trabeculae developing in this region. And another feature of the disease is that the fatty marrow is not normal in appearance. It appears to be undergoing some degenerative change and abnormality within that fatty marrow. And that appears to precede the proliferation of adventitial cells. Again, the question is, is this primarily a vascular disturbance that results in some degenerative change in the marrow that's present that then we see a reactive uh, phenomenon to that that results in the medullary nidus. I don't think we know the answer to that at this point in time, but it's suggestive that that may be what's going on. Here is this abnormal appearing fatty marrow, and at the margin of that, this proliferation of adventitial cells, as Van Sickle has described them, and then the proliferation of bony trabeculae. And here it is a little further in. You've got your proliferation area out here, and these become rather uh, broader and denser as they move toward the center, and you continue having new bone formation through osteoblastic activity that continues to go on in the center of the medullary nidus. So, again, a disease that <clears throat> has some suggestions that it may be either uh, infectious in nature or at least vascular in nature, and the specific etiology and pathogenesis still not clearly defined. The, quest the question is whether uh, what happens to the periosteal bone when this condition resolves. It disappears. It, it's resorbed right along with the medullary nidus. Uh, whatever the inciting cause is apparently subsides. And one of the beauties of bone is that with osteoclastic remodeling, you remove that medullary nidus and you remove the subperiosteal bone right along with it. It's the same uh, situation as if you have uh, bumped your shin and gotten a little osseous proliferation on your shin bone, uh, you may feel it for a few months, but after a period of time, it begins to resolve and you go back to a fairly smooth surface, uh, cortical surface. And uh, so all of that subperiosteal bone will, will resorb right along with the medullary nidus. Canine craniomandibular osteopathy. Again, 
a disease that's characterized in, in certain breeds, primarily the terrier breeds, the West Highland White, the Cairn Terrier, the Schnauzer, uh, those breeds of the, the terrier group seem to be predisposed to this particular condition. That suggested that it's genetic uh, in origin because it occurs in those species. However, it's been described, uh, we should point out too, in the Labrador and some of the larger breeds. So it isn't specifically restricted to that breed. The nature of the lesion, the presence of inflammatory cells and so on, suggests that again, it may be infectious in nature. These animals often during the acute period do have fevers that run up in the neighborhood of 104 degrees. Again, it occurs in young animals between four and eight months of age. It's uh, characterized by pain on chewing because it's uh, a lesion that occurs primarily in the mandibular area. You get mandi a thickening of the uh, mandible and the tympanic bully. It also occurs occasionally in long bones, or at least we should say that lesions occur in the long bones at the same time the lesions are developing in the mandible. And I should point out, lest I forget, that in the case of hypertrophic osteodystrophy, now and then an animal with HOD will have some mandibular enlargement. And so you get some spillover of these two conditions that have some features that are characteristic of the other condition, even though the primary one may be HOD or CMO. You usually get atrophy of the masseter and temporal muscles simply because these animals are not masticating and, and chewing, and if you give them good nursing care and, and liquid diets and so on, you can nurse them through this uh, condition. Proliferations occasionally, as I point out here, in the long bones. Lab signs are usually normal. And it's a self-limiting disease in that by the time the animal is about a year of age, these lesions will begin to subside, disappear, and you'll not see them uh, after that age. Here's uh, a dog in which there's marked sclerosis and increased radiodensity in the area of the mandible, the tympanic bullae, and notice the increased thickness of the calvarium. It's very much like the monkey with hyperostotic fibrous osteodystrophy. This particular animal in the early stages of the disease was completely normal. After a period of a few weeks during the development of this condition also had some subperiosteal proliferations and some increased radio densities in the long bone. It's hard to get your hands on necropsy material from these animals because they don't die. And usually, if the owner's willing to nurse them through the period, knowing that it's a self-limiting disease, the pathologist doesn't get an opportunity to see a lot of necropsy material on these. And uh, so there's limited amount of, of information as far as the histology of the changes in the long bones to know whether they look like the HOD lesion or whether it's simply increased proliferation of, of new bone. Here's <coughs> a specimen uh, that you saw radiographically the proliferation of bone here in the mandibular area and also in the tympanic bullae. And if you look at that on the opposite side, the cut surface, here's the mandibular proliferation. This is all new bone laid down beneath the periosteum of the mandible, proliferation of bone in the tympanic bullae, and increased thickness of the calvarium. Subgrowth specimen showing the proliferation of bone that's occurred here in the mandibular region and the proliferation of bone back in the area of the tympanic bully. Histologically, if you look at these lesions, here's the overlying skin. You have a thickened subcutaneous area that's somewhat fibrotic in nature. You'll have this proliferation of new bone, the intertrabecular spaces filled with loose connective tissue elements, and very often foci of inflammatory cells. Lymphocytic, plasmacytic, few neutrophils, mostly mononuclear in nature, few and far between, not a, a finding that is present in a large percentage of the sections. You'll have to take multiple sections before you'll find areas of inflammation such as this. Higher magnification of the area of bony proliferation, you can see this loose uh, connective tissue looks very similar to that that you see in fibrous osteodystrophy and some of the inflammatory cells present here. And even at this magnification, you may be able to appreci appreciate some of the mosaic pattern appearance that you get to the bone trabeculae that are laid down. You get, this is obviously a, a condition where there's 
bone formation and resorption and formation and resorption alternating so that you get a lot of, of formation and removal of bone and each time that happens you lay down a cement line or a reversal line and so you get this pattern of uh, uh, topographic map and these reversal lines that occur and so you get a mosaic pattern that is similar to the situation you see in Paget's disease in man. It's about the only other condition that is characterized by this mosaic pattern to the bone that's formed and it's simply because of this rapid uh, and alternating formation and resorption process that goes on. <clears throat> Again, we have a condition that is characterized by fever, suggesting that it may be infectious in nature, some evidence of inflammatory reaction within the bone, and one that's characterized by an excessive amount of bone in a particular area of the skeleton without a definitive pathogenesis or specific etiology that's been identified. I might point out, I had some, some photographs, but I failed to put them in, that uh, there's been a lesion described at the University of Pennsylvania now in the bull mastiff, where there was tremendous increase in the thickness of the calvarium. Looks identical to the situation that we see in craniomandibular osteopathy, except that you don't have the proliferation of bone in the mandible, and yet the microscopic appearance of the lesion looks without question to be similar to craniomandibular osteopathy and it's without doubt the result of an osteoperiostitis or an inflammatory reaction in the periosteum of the bone because there's an intense inflammatory reaction and then there's all this bone formation uh, beneath with islands of inflammatory cells that are trapped within the bone that's formed. Uh, it looks like an exaggerated form of the situation that we see in craniomandibular osteopathy but looks even more like it's an infectious or an inflammatory uh, process. Question? Yes. Uh, a lot of this reactive bone you showed us have, have trabecularly perpendicular to the long axis, which to me would mean that it isn't really strengthening the bone. Is there some kind of a, have there been studies to show that that is not strengthening the bone? And that at least the second question, can you differentiate purely reactive bone from physiological remodeling where the subperiosteal bone is not perpendicular, but is more along the long axis. You understand my question? Okay. The, the first part of the question was, uh, does, is, is there anything, has anything been done to establish that the perpendicular spicules of bone that form beneath the periosteum, in fact, uh, are reinforcing the, the weakened bone structure beneath? Uh, I don't know that studies have been done, but you have to think back to normal bone formation and that process that's occurring when there's very active periosteal proliferation. You automatically get spicules of bone. As that periosteum runs away from the underlying cortex, you get spicules of bone form perpendicular to it. If you slow that process down, the spaces in between fill in. And if you think back to the developing cortex, that's exactly what happens. You had that, that ring of bone surrounding the, the cartilage model and then the periosteum began to proliferate and you got these spicules of bone that were formed beneath it and then as that process slowed down you filled in the spaces between and it began to look like a compact cortex. Anytime you stimulate the periosteum and you turn that process on you get these perpendicular spicules. So even though that's what we see here if we left that go for a period of time and that periosteal reaction slowed down, you'd fill in those spaces and you wouldn't appreciate that as just perpendicular spicules, but you'd appreciate it as more as dense compact bone. So if that process slows, you'll fill in those spaces and then if remodeling occurs later on, you've got to take all of that back out in that subperiosteal area. So I'm not sure whether it's reinforcing or not, but I'm sure that that's the intent and that's the reason that it's happening because you have weakened structures beneath, you get that reaction. And it depends on the point in which you look at it as to whether you see perpendicular spicules or you see a denser bone laid down beneath. Now, I'm, that's answering one part of your question, but you had another part. Well, does normal physiological remodeling, where you take away bone in one area and lay down more bone in another, does that look the same way? The question is, does normal physiologic remodeling, where you take away bone and then lay down new bone, does it react the same way and does it look the same way? Yes. Absolutely. Anytime the periosteum is stimulated, it doesn't matter if it's a dissecting periostitis, uh, 
if it's hemorrhage beneath the periosteum, if it's stimulation as a result of a weakened cortex beneath, any of those things that stimulates rapid proliferation of subperiosteal bone, it's going to be in the form of a spicule. If you have a slow-growing tumor and you get resorption of the cortex beneath and you get very insidious growth of that tumor, you'll start laying down lamellar patterns of bone beneath the periosteum and you get the so-called onion skinning effect over that tumor. And so it's all related to the rate of growth. If, it, if it's fast growth, then it, you get, it's just like you get streams of bone streaming out behind. If it's a fairly slow process, you either aren't going to have spicules that are as prominent, or you're going to get more of a lamellar pattern laid down beneath that periosteum. But usually it's the former, and usually you see the subperiosteal spicules. Okay, we've talked about three diseases that have uh, some suggestive uh, indications that they may be inflammatory in nature. So now let's talk about inflammation of bone and osteitis and osteomyelitis. Infection of bone can either be bacterial or mycotic. Uh, it can also, I guess, be viral, but we haven't proven very many viral diseases of bone. <clears throat> Osteitis, by definition, is inflammation of bone. We usually say osteomyelitis, and that's a misnomer, and I'll comment on that in a minute. What we need to bear in mind is that when you have inflammation of bone, you really don't have inflammation of osseous tissue, but you have inflammation of the vascular tissue within that bone. It's inflammation of the soft tissues of the bone. It's within the Volkmann canals, the Herversion canals, the periosteum, and in the medullary cavity. So it's the soft tissues that are undergoing the inflammatory process and not really the bone tissue itself. If you have progressive inflammation, you're going to involve all three areas of the bone. So an osteoperiostitis is inflammation which begins in the periosteum. And if you find an inflammation confined to the periosteum, it's an osteoperiostitis. If it's confined to the medullary cavity, it's an osteomyelitis. And very often, by the time we recognize these conditions, regardless of where it began, it's spread through the cortex, involved both the periosteum and the medullary cavity, and so differentiation of which of these conditions you have is difficult, unless you get it early in the condition or it's a non-progressive lesion. Here's an inflammatory reaction occurring in a vertebrae of a dog. And microscopically, here's the a trabeculae of bone within that vertebrae. Inflammatory reaction here in an organism, which I'll let you diagnose for me. Anybody? Coccidioidomycosis. Coccidioides in this particular case. Limited to that one particular bone. Here's a lesion that's occurring in the proximal radius and ulna. Here's the cortex of that bone, marked resorption, all related to vascular supply. You got an inflammatory reaction in the medullary cavity. You get increased vascularity associated with that at the margins, and so you start getting cutting cones resorbing the cortex. They ream out these holes in the cortex, simply making a pathway for that inflammatory reaction to extend through, remembering that the, the vascular flow is going from the medullary cavity through the cortex and out to the periosteum. And when it gets out to the periosteal surface, you get a periostitis. Periosteum's now up here, and you get all these specules of bone that are being laid down. And in this case, some areas where it's beginning to fill in those spaces, in answer to your question, Ralph, uh, other areas where it's pretty much still specular in nature. The in major portion of the inflammatory reaction is down here. Notice all of this area of necrosis and inflammation and a margin that is surrounded by cancellous bone. So there's a reinforcement process that goes on around this area of necrosis and inflammation even within the medullary cavity. And if you looked at this one uh, with spatial stains, you found out that the animal had candidiasis. It had been an animal that had been on steroid therapy for a fairly long period of time and developed a mycotic osteomyelitis. We talk about the formation of sequestra 
within bone as a result of fragments of necrotic bone that persist and remain behind. Usually in the case of animals, these are fairly small fragments and I suppose we see them most often in infected fractures and that type of thing. The most spectacular lesions are the ones that are present right here at AFIP. And here's a long bone from a fellow that was killed in the Civil War as a result of a cannonball hit. And here's a sequestrum, a fragment of the old cortex that's now necrotic. It's been completely surrounded by separative inflammation. So it's separated from any connective tissue elements, any vascular supply, and it simply sits there as this necrotic fragment. It's denser than the surrounding bone because the surrounding proliferative bone, as it begins to form, is cancellous in nature. It forms like that spicular bone beneath the periosteum. So it's going to be less dense than the old pre-existing cortical bone that's now a dead fragment. And so you see it as an increased radiodensity. Here's the specimen grossly. And here's that sequestrum, the old necrotic cortex, and the involucrum, that proliferative reaction beneath the periosteum that surrounds the sequestral fragment. Here's another smaller area. This is the involucrum. It points out the vascular supply, the vascularity of the involucrum, and the more cancellous nature of the involucrum compared to this dense cortical fragment that remains behind. <clears throat> Histologically, the sequestrum here, some artifactual separation, but the inflammatory reaction, purulent, separative inflammation that surrounds it. The only way that fragment, if it isn't removed surgically, will disappear is if we resolve the inflammatory reaction, connective tissue elements in the vascular supply grows in so that you get the connective tissue elements that give rise to osteoclasts to begin to resor resorb this fragment of bone. But as long as it's bathed in this pool of pus, it's going to sit there just the way it is, maybe with some proteolytic resorption going on uh, to a, a very minimal extent, and this surrounding involucrum forming around it. Here's a fragment sitting in this pool of purulent exudate. You can see before that exudate surrounded that fragment, there was a lot of osteoclastic resorption. Notice that ragged, scalloped surfaces on the surface of the fragment, indicating that there was osteoclastic resorption, but now it's not going to go any further as long as it's sitting in this pool of exudate. Just to finish off uh, the inflammatory reactions, here's uh, a fat-legged, bow-legged chicken. Uh, with what I prefer to term osteoperiostitis, even though it's known as avian osteopetrosis. Uh, I think we should avoid the term, if at all possible, because it uh, creates confusion with congenital osteopetrosis, and the two conditions are not at all related. This is not a congenital disease, but related to an inflammatory process. Here, uh, in contrast to congenital osteopetrosis, where the, the increased bone formation and density occurs within the medullary cavity, the proliferation of bone is in the subperiosteal region, and you get this intense proliferation that gives you this spindle-shaped bone. More intense, it seems, in the diaphyseal areas than it is even in the metaphyseal region. So you convert these bones to more spindle-shaped structures than the funnel shape that we normally have. <coughs> The lesion histologically, here's the cortices. You get some endosteal proliferation of bone in this region, but at the same time, you get subperiosteal proliferation of bone that begins in the area of the diaphysis and spreads proximally and distally. A cross section of such a bone after it's fully developed, here's the limit of the medullary cavity. We've completely filled in the medullary cavity in addition to forming subperiosteal bone and you no longer can define the inner and outer limits of the old cortex as it, pre as it existed previously. Here, <clears throat> I think, Ralph, this may help answer the question that you asked earlier. You get waves of new bone formation. The medullary cavity is somewhere in this region. You get a wave of subperiosteal proliferation, and you get spicules of bone laid down, another wave of reaction. Now we begin to fill in the spaces between these trabeculae, and it becomes a little denser in nature. Another burst of periosteal re reaction, more spicules of bone laid down. These are filling in, and here's the most recent burst of activity. 
These are the spicules that you see early on. Later on, as that process slows down, you begin to fill these in, and eventually this area will look like this one and like this one. And if you look at these areas of proliferation, you see a mixture of woven bone and lamellar bone. Good example, classic example of the first proliferation, very rapid spicular formation of bone. Those spicules consist of this very highly cellular, large number of osteocytes within this woven matrix. Then when that process slows and you begin to fill in the spaces between those trabeculae, you lay it in with the lamellar bone. And that's what we have here, 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 and here. And so simply a mixture of woven bone, very rapid bone formation, followed by lamellar refill of those intertrabecular spaces. <clears throat> this disease is a result of infection with the uh, RNA leukosis virus. And you have in cells within osteoblasts that stimulates intense osteoblastic activity in the periosteal region, resulting in this uh, intense inflammatory process and reaction of, of bone. Interestingly, it tends to occur mostly in the periosteum and to a lesser extent in the medullary cavity or in the metaphyseal region. And that's why I say it's important to differentiate the so-called avian osteopetrosis, which really should be avian osteoperiostitis, with uh, congenital osteopetrosis because they're two completely different uh, conditions and shouldn't, it shouldn't be called osteopetrosis even though there's increased amounts of, of bone and it's been referred to as marble. This morning, we're going to discuss uh, developmental disturbances of the skeleton uh, and lead on into vascular disturbances of the skeleton uh, at a later point in time. If we could have the first slide, please. <clears throat> in discussing generalized disturbances of the skeleton, we're talking primarily about chondrodystrophy or chondrodystrophia fetalis. And there are several synonyms uh, for this condition, achondroplasia, dyschondroplasia, chondrodystrophic dwarfism, and so on. All of the terms generally refer to the same condition, that being the condition of chondrodystrophy. The etiology is that of an inherited autosomal recessive disease, and usually this involves multiple chromosomal loci and, and results in a variety of phenotypic variations. So there's considerable variations in the kinds of uh, abnormalities that one can find with this inherited defect. The pathogenesis of the disease is primarily one of a defect in the growth of cartilage. And the defect is in interstitial growth of cartilage as opposed to appositional growth, which is normal. And if you think back to our discussion yesterday, we said that in the growth of bone, that the growth in length was a result of growth of the cartilage on both ends of the long bone. That's interstitial growth of cartilage, with you, if you will, which is essentially interstitial growth of bone, since it's growth of, of the cartilage at the growth plate. The appositional growth is beneath the perichondrium in that perichondrial area that surrounds the bulbous cartilaginal mass on either end of the long bone. And in this situation, the appositional growth is normal, but interstitial growth is affected. And so the areas where you would expect to find abnormalities are in the area of the growth plate, the articular cartilage, and in the basocranial cartilages of the skull, which results in the abnormalities that we normally associate with, with domed craniums and shortened heads and so on. The gross characteristics are that of a disproportionate dwarfism, and that's to distinguish disproportionate dwarfism from proportionate dwarfism, which really uh, has resulted in the development of the miniature breeds in which we simply have uh, animals which are proportionately developed but are much smaller in size and therefore miniature breeds. In the disproportionate dwarfism, we expect to see shortened limbs. The limbs are abducted and rotated. They're thicker than normal. You have normal muscles but reduced amounts of, of bone and enlarged epiphyses with a mushroom shape to the epiphysis. 
In the case of the cranium, you have enlarged domed crani craniums as a result of premature closure of the synchondroses of the skull. And this involves primarily the sphenoaccipital, the intersphenoid, and the interaccipital synchondroses. Secondarily, one often sees hydrocephalus, a secondary phenomenon to this change in the cranial development. The growth of cartilage in these cases ceases prematurely. You simply have an early synostosis developed. And in the case of the growth plate, you get premature closure. And as a result of premature closure of the growth plate, you don't develop the normal primary spongiosa of the metaphysis. And therefore, you have an irregular haphazard arrangement to the trabeculae in the metaphyseal region. You don't have the normal growth plate to form the uniform trabeculae of cartilage to provide that scaffold for new bone to form on. Here's an example of a chondrodystrophoid uh, German Shepherd, primarily, although it's a crossbreed. And I think here you can appreciate the shortened limbs, the uh, down in the, in the pastern areas, the doming of the cranium, somewhat disproportionate, I would say, uh, from what you'd expect for a normal German Shepherd. The uh, extension of the mandible here, lipping of the ventral margins of the vertebrae so that you get this ventral lipping instead of the uniform appearance of the bodies of the vertebrae, and the shortened, rotated, and mushroom-shaped epiphyses of the long bones. And conditions such as this give us a lesson in, in how nature has a way of attempting to correct things that have started out in an abnormal fashion. Here you can see the, the concavity that's occurred in this bone and the deviation of the proximal end tipping off to the right side of the screen and islands of cartilage trapped here in the medullary cavity. And some people have suggested that these islands of cartilage that persist over a period of time after uh, a number of years has the potential to develop enchondroses or cartilaginous tumors, benign cartilaginous tumors that develop within the medullary cavity. Notice also that the growth plate is tipped off and skewed off to the right here. And we have a much thinner cortex on this one side, on the convex side, than we do on the concave side. And notice the increase in thickness of cortex on the concave side. What's happening is that we're getting increased bone formation on the concave side and osteoclastic resorption on the convex side. Therefore, removal of bone on this side, filling it in on this side, and nature's attempting to straighten this bone out, even though the growth plate is giving rise to a bone that's curved. Here it is, a little higher magnification. You've got osteoclastic removal over here, and you've got intense osteoblastic formation on this side. And it's simply an attempt by nature to straighten out uh, what has started out as a very crooked, curved bone. The other major defect in the chondrodystrophoid breeds is that of the abnormalities in the intervertebral discs. In the normal dog, the nucleus pulposus is gelatinous at birth, and in a period of nine, ten years, by the time the animal is an aged individual, the, the nucleus pulposus will have undergone fibrosis. And usually that's the extent of the changes that occur there. Occasionally you'll get some co chondroid metaplasia, but it's minimal, even in the old animal. In the chondrodystrophoid breeds, the nucleus pulposus is fibrotic by the time the animal's a year of age. And oftentimes, even by a year of age, the nucleus pulposus has been replaced by cartilage and chondroid metaplasia. Once you have cartilage formed in the nucleus pulposus, it goes on to mineralize and involve the annulus fibrosus. And as a result, you have a destructive change then within the annulus fibrosus and rupture of the intervertebral disc, or at least the potential for rupture of the disc into the intervertebral space. Once you have the rupture and disc protrusion, then you have all the classic signs of disc disease in these animals. It involves all the discs uniformly in the chondrodystrophoid breeds, but it manifests itself primarily in the 
uh, lumbar region or the cervical region, mainly because in the upper and middle third of the thorax, we have the ligamentum conjugate costarum, which tends to maintain that nucleus pulposus within its location in the intervertebral space and prevents the rupture in those areas. And so the reason we don't see the ruptures in that location is mainly related to this ligament being present as opposed to the fact that it doesn't involve those discs. In the case of disc disease in the non-chondrodystrophoid breeds, the annulus fibrosus seldom ruptures. We'll get a prolapse and a protrusion of the annulus fibrosus into the vertebral canal, but we don't as frequently see rupture of the annulus fibrosus as we do, as we do in the chondrodystrophoid breeds. And this is simply a schematic to illustrate the prolapse or rupture of the disc into the vertebral canal. Specifically to talk for a minute about cattle and chondrodystrophy in, in cattle, these conditions often result in the so-called bulldog calf, which is a lethal form of chondrodystrophy. So you get the domed cranium, the shortened head, the short abducted and rotated limbs. Contracted foals, just to go through another series of, of things that, conditions that are uh, generalized skeletal abnormalities, not necessarily in the chondrodystrophoid uh, group, but lesions that resemble chondrodystrophy in some of the other animals. In the so-called contracted foals, it involves both the axial and the appendicular skeleton. These foals are usually aborted at about three months. And the signs that one sees are torticollis, scoliosis, asymmetry in the skull, and flexion of limbs, usually in the carpus and tarsus. So-called acorn calves, or crooked calf disease. This has been described in calves, which originally where the dams were thought to have ingested acorns, although there's not been uh, definitive uh, association with the ingestion of acorns. Certainly in the case of wild lupin ingestion by the pregnant cattle and in manganese deficiency, you'll see the so-called crooked calf syndrome. Uh, it af affects the mucopolysaccharide production, the proteoglycan production in the cartilage, and it's been shown that in the ingestion of 183 milligrams of manganese per day, you have uh, normal foals, whereas in levels that approximate 125 or less, you have deformed calves. I'm sorry, I said foals, I think, earlier. It's, it's calves that we're talking about here. And the question of what the role of lupin ingestion is in manganese uh, metabolism has not really been established at this point in time, whether we're looking at two separate conditions or whether ingestion of lupins, in fact, affects the production of mucopolysaccharides. And here's one of the so-called crooked calves, where you get the uh, deformities in the limbs, usually more distally than proximally. Dwarfism in the Alaskan Malamute, a disease that's received a fair amount of attention in the last few years because of it being somewhat unique. Uh, here's an example of uh, Malamute dwarf. You can see the curvature to the anterior limb, shortness in stature. You need to see it against a uh, littermate to see how dwarf this animal is. Radiographically, you can see the curvature of the radius and ulna. Here again, lateral view showing the marked deviation and curvature, particularly in radius and ulna. And you can't appreciate it in these slides in the radiographs, but there are islands of cartilage that persist in the area of the, sorry, we have one that's not dropping apparently. Okay, that's, that's good enough. We have the same condition on the distal end of that uh, slide, but here's the growth plate, normal growth plate on the left, and on the right we have this area of cartilaginous persistence that extends down into the metaphysis. And so you have these local foci of cartilage proliferation that fail to undergo enchondral bone formation. 
and on the opposite end we have a similar situation on the same side of the growth plate. We have normal bone formation occurring here. We have a lag in bone formation in this area and therefore the proximal end of that bone skews off to the right side of the screen since bone formation is lagging behind on this side and growing normally. It simply tips that head over and we get the curved bone that we saw in the chondrodystrophoid dog. At the same time, you can see the thinning of the cortex on the convex side and the increased thickness of cortex on the concave side. Here's a normal subgross specimen showing secondary ossification center of the epiphysis, the growth plate, and the metaphysis. And compare that with the situation here. We got out of phase here a bit. The cartilaginous mass grossly in the metaphysis, normal growth plate on this side, and here histologically, the persistence of this cartilage into the metaphyseal region. So we simply have a failure in conversion of the hypertrophied chondrocytes and degeneration of those chondrocytes and as a result extension of the cartilage into the metaphysis. I didn't yesterday make any reference to abnormalities in mineralization of cartilage such as in rickets and so on when the growth plate is developing. But if you don't have mineralization and entrapment of the osteocyte in and it becomes encased in a mineral matrix, then that chondrocyte will not degenerate and die. It's getting its nutrients from the epiphyseal surface. Those nutrients are diffusing through and providing viability of those chondrocytes. The vessels on the metaphyseal side allow for mineralization. If for one reason or another mineralization does not occur, the hypertrophied chondrocytes simply persist and continue to proliferate and grow and extend on into the metaphysis. That's the situation in rickets where there's a failure of mineralization. In this case, and this particular condition was referred to as a vitamin D resistant rickets uh, when it was first described because people felt that it was a rickitic lesion and it was not responsive to vitamin D therapy. We now know that it's apparently related to some biochemical defect in the cartilage formation, proliferation, and metabolism. And as a result of that biochemical defect, we have these areas where the cartilage does not go on to mineralize, degenerate, and be converted to bone. The people at Washington State are working very hard on what the biochemical lesion is in this particular condition. And to my knowledge, they haven't defined it specifically yet. But it's interesting that it's not necessarily a uniform process across the full width of the growth plate. There are some areas where end chondral formation appears to, to occur at the normal rate. But in other areas, we have these islands that persist and extend into the growth plate. Looking at that particular section, there's really no way to distinguish that lesion histologically from rickets. It looks essentially the same. It's the same type of lesion that you would expect to see in a rickitic lesion. Now, if you looked at undecalcified sections and you had failure of mineralization in areas and large areas of osteoid and so on, then perhaps you could distinguish it. But in a decalcified section, it would be vir virtually impossible. This is a higher magnification showing the islands of cartilage that extend into the metaphysis. The, it, the cellular reaction that you see around this is mostly related to simply motion and, and stress patterns that don't transfer across the cartilage as well as it does in bone and so you get some cellular infiltration around the margins of the cartilage between the cartilage and the metaphyseal bone. Question? Yes. The appendices are grow by interstitial growth as well. How often are they affected? You indicated that they often get very large and lip because they apparently are growing normally. Is that correct? The question is whether the epiphyses, which are also grow similar to the metaphysis, are also affected. Now, you're talking specifically about the Alaskan Malamute. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, in the case of the Alaskan Malamute, no. I don't think the epiphyses are that often involved. Uh, it's more often the metaphysis and the growth plate. And there, I think, because of the very rapid proliferation of cartilage in the growth plate, you have the persistence of the cartilage islands. That's not to say that it isn't possible, and that in some cases you might find islands of cartilage in the epiphysis, because certainly in the case of rickets, that's the case. You do find some islands of cartilage periodically in the, in the epiphysis as well. But the growth rate is so much slower in the epiphysis than what it is in the growth plate 
that the likelihood of that happening in either one of these conditions is much less than it would be in the metaphysis. Okay, hip dysplasia. <clears throat> Another one of these unclassified skeletal abnormalities. I think by now most of this audience is familiar with the changes that take place in the femoral head and the acetabulum in hip dysplasia. <clears throat> these schematics simply show the normal relationship between the femoral head and the acetabulum in the normal dog. And we begin to get uh, loosening and luxation within the femoral head, between the femoral head and the acetabulum. And as a result, we, we begin to get wear on the surfaces of both the femoral head and the acetabular cup. And as a result, we begin to have remodeling changes that take place in both the acetabulum and the femoral head that results in the classic syndrome of hip dysplasia. And we should probably say now that hip dysplasia, in the case of the dog, is one of the most common causes of osteoarthrosis. And we'll talk about that uh, toward the end of the lectures. But we begin a remodeling sequence as a result of the luxation in the coxofemoral joint that simply leads to a continuing remodeling process that eventually culminates in a full-blown osteoarthrosis. Here's a subgross specimen, uh, normal, of the femoral head and the acetabulum. Normal relationship, normal conformation that one would expect in the normal dog. The trajectorial pattern here, you should note the pattern of trabeculae in the epiphyseal region, the articular surfaces on both the acetabulum and the femoral head. And you'll see as we go through a sequence of slides now the changes that begin to occur in the dog with hip dysplasia. Certainly there's a genetic involvement as far as, as the genetic tendency toward this disease, but it's very much a constitutional disease and it's probably very much a man-made disease. For those of you that have had the opportunity to hear Dr. Reiser's talk about uh, somatotypes and constitution in, in breeds of dogs and so on, uh, he has a very uh, uh, amusing lecture that he talks about our man's tendency to breed giant breeds of dogs and miniature breeds of dogs and the toy dogs and so on. And a great many of the changes that one and abnormalities that one finds in these breeds, and particularly the ones that are peculiar to the breeds, are the result of simply man breeding these animals for specific uh, types and so on that ultimately results in constitutional diseases. Here's the femoral head and the articular surface in a dog with developing hip dysplasia. And you can see the erosion of the articular surface in this region right here. We have some early pitting in the articular surface in this region. We're beginning to erode the bone down to the point where in this one area we're nearly to the point of exposing the subchondral bone. It's a result of that femoral head riding up on the lip of the acetabular cup. Instead of being held into the cup of the acetabulum normally as a result of looseness in, the, in that joint, it begins to ride up on this edge of the cup and we begin to wear away the articular surface. So we begin to get erosion of articular surfaces, and at the same time, the next step that we'll see is a remodeling of this acetabulum, nature attempting to form a new cup to get that contained within the normal articulation. And here, the limit of the original acetabulum is right here, and this beak-like projection is new bone that's been formed as a result of the luxation that was present within this joint. And notice the marked remodeling and change in the femoral head. Here's a line right here that probably represents the outer surface of the original femoral head. This is all new osteophytic bone that's formed out on the margin. And at the same time, you get a great deal of fibrous proliferation in this area as well that precedes this new bone formation that occurs at the margin of the acetabulum. The greyhound is notorious for having a lack of hip dysplasia within that breed. 
and it has a, it's a very light boned animal with a heavy musculature that's present that very nicely holds the femoral head into the acetabular cup. In contrast, a breed like the German Shepherd, which is notorious for a high incidence of hip dysplasia, has a very weak musculature and has been bred over the last 20 to 50 years to have fewer and a lesser muscle mass in the hip region. And as a result, there's a tendency for luxation to occur much, to a much greater extent in the German Shepherd breed than it is some of the other heavily muscled breeds. Here again, marked remodeling of femoral head and acetabulum. Here's the osteophytic proliferation at the margin of the acetabular cup. And notice the proliferation here on either margin of the femoral head, which is tremendously flattened and mushroomed at this point. All of this bone in this region is new bone that's formed. Here's the old footprint of the margin of the femoral head. And here's the osteophytic proliferation in this area. So marked remodeling. We've destroyed the articular cartilage. There's no cartilage remaining on this surface. The surface is completely denuded and ebernated. And at the same time, we have loss of a great deal of the articular cartilage on the acetabular side as well. Congenital osteopetrosis. <clears throat> a disease that is characterized uh, by dwarfism, so it is a dwarfing disease. And here you see a normal littermate rat to a littermate with congenital osteopetrosis. This has been described in a variety of, of animals. Uh, it's been best understood as a result of the changes in the various uh, strains of rats and mice. But the list shows the gray lethal mouse, the incisor absent rat, the IA rat, the microphthalmic mouse, the osteopetrotic rabbit. And it's been described in calves and dogs as well, and in several breeds of calves at this point in time. So there's a number of strains of rats and mice that have this condition. The pathogenesis is one of simply incompetent osteoclastic activity, a failure of osteoclastic remodeling. In some instances, in the case of certain strains of mouse and rabbit, it's a failure in synthesis of enzymes by osteoclasts. In contrast, in the case of the IA rat at least, it appears to be a failure of release of enzymes from these cells so that the osteoclasts simply become constipated with, uh, alkaline, with acid phosphatase and the various enzymes that are normally needed for the remodeling process. So it can be either a failure in synthesis or release of enzymes depending on the strain that we're talking about. There very often is a defect in the ruffled border of these cells so that they don't have the normal uh, modification of the plasma membrane and the ruffled border that is involved in remodeling of bone. And in certain strains, there may be increased bone formation. At the same time, you have this defect in osteoclastic remodeling and a failure to remove bone, the combination of which suggests to you, or it should, that we're going to see increased amounts of bone present as a result of this failure in remodeling. In the case of the gray lethal and the microphthalmic mouse, there's a failure of tooth eruption because osteoclastic resorption of the uh, bone surrounding the tooth is necessary for the teeth to erupt. If you have a failure of that, the teeth simply become encased in bone and you get uh, what has been referred to as an odontoma type uh, of lesion where you get proliferation and growth of the tooth, but it's encased in a bony tomb. Abnormalities in the hair, retarded growth, and early death in the case of the gray lethal. Uh, in other instances, you'll see that these animals uh, spontaneously remiss. The IA rat, for example, tends to have a spontaneous remission and goes on to live a, a normal lifespan. In the case of the gray lethal and the microphthalmic, the defect is, is one of synthesis of enzymes. You have a normal ruffled border. It shouldn't be a brush border because it is a ruffled border. And reduced acid phosphatase activity and cytolysosomes and so on. In the IA rat, normal longevity, as I said, it spontaneously remisses. There's delayed uh, sexual maturity, decreased bone formation, 
remisses between 30 and 50 days of age, and the osteoclasts have this defect that involves release of acid phosphatase primarily. So you have increased acid phosphatase activity within the cells and reduced alkaline phosphat acid phosphatase activity at the bone surface. And along with that go vacular inclusions and so on in the cells. Here's a gross specimen of an incisor absent rat, I'm sorry, of a toothless rat in which we have no teeth erupted in the gingival surfaces. Here's a macerated specimen showing only smooth bony surfaces. The teeth are all embedded within the bone structure of that maxilla. And here you can see the tooth here and here still encased in this bony shell. In the absence of any osteoclastic activity, these teeth simply can't erupt normally. And here, normal litter mate, normal mandible and skull from a litter mate, and an animal affected here and the osteoprotrotic individual here. Notice even the increased thickness in the mandible in this region compared to the normal where the teeth are erupted. Reduced amount of bone formation in the zygomatic region as well. The axial skeleton, normal at the top, normal rib cage, and here the foreshortened spinal column and the shortening of the ribs in the osteopetrotic individual. The long bones, the normal on the bottom, showing normal length and shape of the appendicular skeleton, and here at the top, the osteopetrotic mark thickening as well as shortening of these long bones. Notice how much more tubular the bones are at the metaphyseal region. Gross specimens, normal on the left, showing normal medullary cavity, the epiphyses with secondary ossification centers, and the osteopetrotic on the right. You have secondary ossification centers, but you have no medullary cavity because the entire medullary cavity is filled with cancellous bone. Normal specimen, medullary cavity, hematopoietic marrow, growth plate, epiphysis, normal thickness of the cortices. <coughs> the osteopetrotic individual, growth plate, epiphysis, but the entire medullary cavity and metaphyseal area is filled with dense calibered trabeculae of bone. If you think back to our discussion yesterday when we talked about the normal remodeling process and the fact that you have to eliminate about three out of every four of the cancellous trabeculae beneath the growth plate as you convert to the primary trabeculae, and then the osteoclastic remodeling that's necessary in converting primary to secondary trabeculae, you would speculate that if there's a defect in that osteoclastic remodeling, that there'd therefore be a persistence in particularly primary trabeculae and a failure to remodel those primary trabeculae to secondary trabeculae. And that's exactly what happens. And so we have a proliferation and a continuation of extension of primary trabeculae on into the medullary cavity. And so as the animal grows, it simply grows away from all of these primary trabeculae, leaving behind all of those, the primary spongiosa, which fails to be remodeled to a secondary spongiosa and therefore fails to result in the formation of a medullary cavity. At the same time, we don't have normal cutback activity. We talked about the osteoclastic activity in the cutback region that gave you the normal funnel shape. And you can appreciate here in this radiograph of an animal with osteopetrosis, I think the tubular shape at the metaphyseal ends of these bones where the animal, where, where the lesion is involved. Question. Yes? Do these animals have normal hemopoiesis <coughs> In some instances, the, the question is, do these animals have normal hemopoiesis uh, when they have congenital osteopetrosis? The answer is yes, they normally do because they'll have extramedullary hematopoiesis to pick up the slack and the loss of hematopoietic activity in the medullary cavity. But anemia is described in certain of these strains, and it depends on the severity, obviously, of the osteopetrotic lesion as to whether or not anemia develops. <clears throat> uh, 
evidence for control of skeletal resorption by hem hem hematopoietic cells. This has been accumulating over a period of time, but it was really left to Walker uh, in 1975 to begin to uh, shed light on the fact that really uh, osteoclastic remodeling is directly related to hematopoietic elements. And this evidence goes back to the regenerating newt limb and the reports by Fishman and Hay in 1962 to the work by G. and Nolan in 63 that demonstrated that if one uh, injected carbon particles into the peritoneal cavity of rabbits that uh, a few weeks later those carbon particles were found in osteoclasts within bone sites and so at distant sites from the area where the carbon particles had been injected. The parabiotic experiments in the gray lethal and the microphthalmic mouse by Walker in 1972 where by parabiotic union uh, he demonstrated that an osteopetrotic individual that was parabiosed with a normal individual underwent a spontaneous remission. And conversely, the osteopetrotic uh, individual parabiosed to a normal would undergo, the, the normal individual would develop osteopetrosis. And then finally, in 1975, Walker took spleen and bone marrow cells and infused them into lethally irradiated uh, litter mates and showed that either with the use of normal cells or osteopetrotic cells, he could either cause remission or induction of osteopetrosis. And here, normal parabiotic union, gray lethal mouse and the OP rat, and you got remission. In the case of spleen and bone marrow cell infusions, if you infused the normal cells into the osteopetrotic individual, you got osteopetrosis if you infuse spleen and bone marrow cells from the osteopetrotic into the normal or into the osteopetrotic you got remission so he could either induce or cause remission of the condition simply by the infusion of spleen and bone marrow cells and that's led to the understanding that the osteoclast is most li likely derived from the blood monocyte as opposed to being derived from bone surfaces or within the bone itself and in fact, this has now led to the successful treatment of at least two cases that I'm aware of, of congenital osteoporosis in man. Albert Schonberg disease has now been treated by spleen and bone marrow cell infusions, and they've successfully caused remission in a couple infants with that condition. Here's radiographs demonstrating a normal individual that's been infused with spleen and bone marrow cells. At 26 days, you can see little change radiographically in the metaphyseal ends of the bone. But by 45 days post-infusion, you have beginning radio densities in the metaphyses. And by 81 days, about three months post-infusion, you have fairly well-developed well lesions in the metaphyses of these individuals. And here's the lesion that you see that you just saw radiographically as it's seen microscopically. The growth plate and this tubular structure, failure of cutback and failure of remodeling of the primary spongiosa. <clears throat> Conversely, if one infuses cells from a normal individual into an osteopetrotic, you begin to get resorption in the metaphyseal region. That resorption begins in the area of the, meta of the growth plate. It doesn't begin down here in the mid shaft to lower metaphyseal region, but rather begins in the area of the growth plate where the original osteoclastic remodeling would normally have been taking place. And you begin to get resorption in those sites, and that progresses to the point where you have virtually complete remission of the osteopetrotic lesions. And here is an osteopetrotic that had the classic lesion, which now has undergone complete remodeling. And we virtually have a normal medullary cavity, metaphysis, and so on. Any questions while we change carousels? OK. In the case of cattle, with congenital osteopetrosis, we get, as we said, this is a dwarfing disease because the bone simply isn't growing in length as it normally should due to the failure of, of end remodeling. Doming of the cranium, 
brachygnathia inferior, a normal long bone from a calf of a similar age showing growth plate, metaphysis, medullary cavity, normal appearance, in contrast to a center section, longitudinal sagittal section of a long bone of a calf with osteopetrosis. And you'll notice the absence of red marrow simply because of filling of that medullary cavity with this cancellous bone that extends the full length of the bone. And except for a few areas, there's very little hematopoietic marrow present. Subgrowth specimen, showing the growth plate here, and the filling of the metaphysis with cancellous trabeculae. A little higher magnification, showing these trabeculae very close set, very little intertrabecular space present. And if you look at a higher magnification and you start looking for osteoclasts, you can see some small shrunken cells in areas like this, here and here, that you might speculate are osteoclasts, but you're hard pressed to find well-developed osteoclastic cells within this area. The other thing you should note is that you have the bright pink regions that are osteoid deposited on the surfaces of the central cores of cartilage, which are the pale bluish areas in the center. Anytime you have persistence and proliferation of bone in the medullary cavity, you should look for the presence or absence of the central cores, because if those central cores are present, it tells you that there's been a defect in osteoclastic remodeling in the area where these would normally be converted to secondary trabeculae. So you know by the presence of the central cartilage cores that there's a defect in osteoclastic remodeling that's occurred. If these were solid bony trabeculae, then you'd at least know that osteoclastic conversion from primary to secondary trabeculae had taken place and that this would be a result of, let's say, myelofibrosis such as you see in the pyruvate kinase deficiencies where there's proliferation of bone in the medullary cavity, but that bone is all solid bony trabeculae with no cartilage cores absent. And that's the only way one can find bone of this type in the medullary cavity in areas where it shouldn't be, and that's as a result of osteoclastic, a failure in osteoclastic remodeling. Still higher magnification showing the central cores of cartilage, the osteoid deposited on their surfaces, and here probably a shrunken pycnotic osteoclast on the surface, but failing to do its normal remodeling process. Okay. Multiple osteochondromas, a uh, condition that very often is grouped in the tumor category, but which I've included here in the congenital lesions because it basically is a congenital defect. It's a lesion that occurs uh, as a result of genetic abnormalities in, in particularly the quarter horse where it's been wet best worked out by Dr. Shoup in Utah and in the dog uh, and the cat occasionally. This occurs in any bone where that is normally formed by enchondral formation, the long bones, the vertebrae, the ribs, the pelvis, and so on. It's a self-limiting condition in that once enchondral growth of bone ceases, the defects cease to proliferate at least and become simply bony exostoses as opposed to cartilaginous proliferations. And it's been speculated that it occurs as a result of loss of polarity in the perichondrial region, but that's purely speculation and not been proven definitively. Here's a dog with enlargement in the carpal region, two enlargements, one on either side. <clears throat> a quarter horse with enlargements here in the rib region and many others that aren't really visible uh, from the surface. Lesion in the distal femur present here in this region. Now that defect begins to develop at the time that the growth plate is immediately opposite that defect. By the time you observe it clinically, or radiographically, the growth plate may be in this region here, and the growth plate has continued to grow away from the area where that defect uh, originally started. But these are initiated immediately adjacent to the growth plate and then continue to grow and proliferate as the growth plate grows away from them. Here's the same lesion that you just saw radiographically, grossly, and from the surface it looks like 
It's covered with bone primarily. It looks like a continuation of the cortex over onto the surface. But in fact, when you look at this in cross-section, <clears throat> you have the normal cortex in this region. Here's the limit of the original normal cortex. And now we have this cartilage-capped lesion with enchondral bone formation occurring beneath it. As far as the formation of bone is concerned, it's completely normal. It's simply the fact that we appear to have a growth plate out here on one side growing and resulting in enchondral bone formation. Here you see it microscopically, the relatively normal cortex here. You begin to get remodeling of the cortex beneath this cartilage cap, and eventually that cortex, the original cortex, will be completely removed, and you'll have a continuity of the medullary cavity so that it extends out beneath this cartilage cap but a cartilage cap that grows very much like a growth plate. There's nothing neoplastic appearing about this at all. It's simply normal cartilage proliferation, a very benign lesion. Higher magnification showing the cartilage cap, some little islands of cartilage that lag behind here in some regions, but in general, fairly normal enchondral bone formation. The lesion in the ulna compressing the adjacent radius here it is grossly. Here's the lesion from the surface. And if you look at it in cross-section, here's the radius on this side. Here's the cartilage cap on the ulna and the proliferation of bone beneath, causing compression and deviation of the adjacent radius. <coughs> lesion radiographically in the costochondral junction. Here's the rib coming down. This is the costochondral junction area. And we have this mass in this region here. Here it is grossly, rib, costal cartilage, the mass, and in cross-section, a mass that's completely circumscribed by this cartilage cap with cancellous bone formation beneath. Lesion in the spinous process of the vertebrae. Another lesion on the lateral surface of the vertebrae. Here's the cartilage cap in this region. It's proliferating up like so beginning to get a little deviation and extension into the vertebral canal. And in other instances, these go on to almost completely fill the vertebral canal and as a result cause compression on the spinal cord. And usually those are the reasons for the presenting signs in the animals. Lameness, paresis, and that type of thing is usually what calls this to the attention of the owner. Uh, it's interesting how very often they ignore the lumps and bumps that may be present in the appendicular skeleton and it takes a lesion such as this that brings it to their attention and, and causes them to bring it to the veterinarian. As long as you don't have lesions that cause functional incapacity, these lesions are fairly innocuous. They'll go ahead and continue to proliferate once enchondral growth ceases. They become ossified and then remodeled, the same as any exostatic proliferation on a periosteal surface will, so that over time they'll become remodeled back to relatively normal appearance. And so long as you don't have lesions such as this that cause a functional impairment, there's usually no problem with this particular condition. And I put this slide up just to list a, uh, for a list of synonyms for the osteochondroma, from multiple cartilaginous exostoses to this whole list of various things that have been used to describe the same condition, and just so that you have an opportunity to be aware of, of uh, all of these. Probably the most commonly used term is multiple cartilaginous exostosis. OK, I'd like to, I think, take a brief five-minute break or so at this point, And we'll start the next session with the discussion of the normal blood supply of long bones that will lead us into a discussion of vascular diseases.
I neglected in the last hour to uh, mention to you the condition osteogenesis imperfecta. And in the past, we would have said it's a rare disease in animals. In fact, never uh, a verified case having been reported. But in just the last year, there's been reports in calves from uh, a uh, herd in Texas where they feel they now have a, uh, a strain that is, is going to result in continued production of osteogenesis imperfecta in calves and a case in a dog at the University of Pennsylvania, which looks more and more like it's being confirmed. So we apparently do now have uh, verified examples of osteogenesis imperfecta in animals. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we can demonstrate the specific skeletal lesions associated with those conditions. But uh, in general, as you would imagine, the lesion is one primarily of an osteoporotic lesion, too little bone, not normal development of bone. And it pretty much, uh, from what we know of it at this point in time, from what I've heard from the people at the University of Pennsylvania at least, it looks very much like osteogenesis imperfecta in man as far as the, the lesions themselves. Now we'll go back to our discussion of the normal blood supply of long bones. <clears throat> and I think it's necessary to understand the normal blood supply, the same as it's important to understand normal bone formation, if you're going to understand the various abnormalities that occur uh, related to vascular disturbances and changes associated with that in the skeleton. The skeletal system has an afferent system and an efferent system. It has a system that gets blood into the bone and carries blood out of the bone. The one that is often neglected and ignored is the intermediate vascular system of compact bone. And that's important to understand the various changes associated with vascular disturbances and even, if you will, the normal remodeling processes of the cortex of long bones. And here in this schematic, we have a demonstration of the afferent, efferent, and intermediate system within the cortex of long bones. The medullary cavity is depicted here in the center with cortices on either side. And the nutrient artery, the major branch, brings in, comes in through the cortex and gives off branches that go proximally and distally in the medullary cavity. The metaphyseal arteries come in at the metaphyseal region and branch and anastomose with the branches of the nutrient artery. So we now have a communication network between nutrient artery and metaphyseal arteries, the two major supplies as far as the afferent system is concerned. In the area where there's heavy fascial attachments over the cortex, the periosteal arterioles extend into the cortex of the bone approximately a third of the distance. And at that point, they anastomose with branches of either the nutrient or metaphyseal arteries that extend through the cortex and anastomose with the periosteal arteries in the outer one-third. So the inner two-thirds of the cortex in areas of heavy fascial attachment are supplied by the branches of either the nutrient or metaphyseal arteries that carry blood from the medullary cavity through the cortex to the periosteal surface. In the case of cortex beneath a loosely attached periosteum, mid-shaft region, and so on, the branches of either the nutrient or metaphyseal arteries supply the full thickness of the cortex. So there they extend all the way to the cortical surface with no periosteal arterioles supplying any of the outer third of that cortex. The point being that blood supply to the cortex of the long bone is provided by vessels from the medullary cavity. And the flow of blood is into the medullary cavity through the nutrient or metaphyseal arteries and out through the cortex. So the flow is centrifugal from the medullary cavity. If we look at the microcirculation of bone, and you can do that by taking thin one millimeter slices of bone and by injecting radiopaque materials, you can both look at histology and the radiographic features of the blood supply. And when you get down to these microradiograph levels and you look at normal blood supply of a resting long bone, here's your major blood supply within the medullary cavity, 
you have the fine, delicate branches that are extending out through the cortex to the periosteal region. During intense physiological stress, there's a marked change in that blood supply. You now begin to have a marked perfusion of the cortices as a result of infusion of all of these branches that extend through the cortex to the periosteal surface. Now these branches are extending through that cortex, through the Volkmann canals transversely, running up and down the haversian canals, but eventually working their way across the cortex until they reach the periosteal surface. Here it is at higher magnification, major vessel within the medullary cavity, the branches coming off, and then branches that extend across the cortex to the periosteal surface. The blood supply of healing bone, following fractures and so on. The extraosseous blood supply, the blood supply not associated with the bone, in the early stages of healing provide the blood supply to the callus of a fracture and so on. It's derived from the surrounding soft tissues, the mus muscle, the fascial elements and so on. And it supplies the early periosteal callus to the bone fragments, the devascularized cortex until you have a remodeled medullary arterial supply, until you restore that arterial supply from the medullary area, then again that takes over and we go back to a relatively normal situation. So it's a transitory thing until you get reestablishment of the medullary supply. This is simply here to point out that the callus is strictly a temporary situation to bridge the fragments between the two ends of, of a fractured long bone. <clears throat> And it's there to give stability until we develop an intramedullary callus and we begin to remodel all of these elements and go back toward a normal, uh, relatively normal cortical bone structure. Here's a schematic to illustrate fracture and the fact that the periosteum is activated. You get proliferation of cartilage within this area if there's instability, proliferation of bony elements, all as a result of activation of the periosteum and the mesenchymal elements that have that ability to either give rise to fibrous tissue, cartilaginous tissue, or bony elements. Here's a longitudinal section through a fracture. Notice the callus that's been laid down, the subperiosteal callus, to begin to immobilize this. We're now beginning to fill the medullary cavity with bone, so nature's putting its own intramedullary splint in place. And the cortices are fairly dense out in these regions, relatively normal. But notice the increased porosity in this region of the cortex, becoming more difficult to identify a specific cortex in the area of the fracture. Part of the remodeling process that goes back completely remodels this area, along with the vascular remodeling that's taking place, before you get this bone back to a relatively normal pattern. Here it is in the histologic section. Normal cortices on either end. Notice the porosity of the cortices in this region, the periosteal callus, the intramedullary callus. The blood supply, the long bone following a fracture, a period of 24 to 48 hours. Notice the absence of any perfused branches that are extending into the cortex. Here's a couple over here, but there's virtually none here. There's a few extending in right here, but, but hardly any. So within the first week, you have virtually no perfusion of the cortex. The cortex is basically devascularized at this point in time. The intermediate supply is completely cut off. Once you begin to get reestablishment of the medullary circulation, you then begin to get a, an intense proliferation and infusion of vessels across the vascular channels. The channels are still there. All you have to do is have capillary ingrowth and extension through those Volkmann canals and aversion canals to revascularize this cortex. Now that's helped along the way by all the remodeling and removal of bone by osteoclastic activity that makes for larger spaces for these vessels to extend through and revascularize that cortex. And finally, after a period of weeks, you begin to reestablish the medullary circulation and you get good transverse proliferation and infusion of vessels across the area of the fracture. <clears throat> the
that's looking at fractures healing as they would under a cast or where you have a fair amount of callus formation. If we look at the situation beneath uh, a bone plate where you create an osteotomy and then place uh, a bone plate in place over that and look at the normal healing process, as we know, placement of bone plates reduces considerably the amount of extracellular, uh, the, the amount of subperiosteal callus that you normally would get uh, so long as you have good stability within that bone plate. And again, at the point where we have created the osteotomy, we've disrupted the blood supply in this region, and in the early periods we have no perfusion of vessels within the cortices. The bone plate is over here on this side. You see some vessels that are perfused in the endosteal surface of the cortex on the opposite side, but very few over on this side. This is the same time period immediately following the osteotomy, disruption of the vessels, getting some proliferation here, but not reestablishment of the vascular supply, and the cortices completely devoid of perfusion by these blood vessels. After a period of, of a few weeks, if in this case, as happened here, the bone plate remains tightly in place on the one fragment, but has loosened on this side. The screws have come loose, and we have a space between the plate and the underlying cortical bone. It's interesting to see what happens in terms of the vascularity of the cortices. On the side where the screw remained tight and the plate was firmly against the outer cortex, we said that the blood supply was centrifugal, that it flowed from the medullary cavity through the cortex. So it's very similar to plugging up a hole on the surface of a, of a tank that contains water. It simply can't flow through because the outflow track is blocked. On the side where the plate became loosened, the vessels perfused, went through, revascularized even the area on the periosteal region beneath the bone plate where it had loosened. So again, the centrifugal flow. And so one of the disadvantages of placing bone plates is that you impede the vascularity of the underlying cortex. And the fact that that occurs means that there has to be some care given when bone plates are removed to avoid refractures because you have a weakened bone structure here until this revascularization takes place and you get some remodeling in that region. Higher magnification, the same area. Here you can see the vessels going through and perfusing the one fragment, but on the opposite side there's very little perfusion of vessels. <clears throat> Similar situation related to an intramedullary pin. In this case, the intramedullary pin had been placed. The tip of it came down in this region. Right here, it rested against the endosteal surface of this cortex. This is the cortical surface right here. This black space that you see is where the medullar intramedullary pin was placed. But it skewed off so it was more in the center of the medullary canal over here. Notice that where it rested against the endosteal surface, there's very little vascular perfusion. But over here, you're getting perfusion of these vessels because it wasn't immediately against the internal surface to prevent the flow of, of blood through that intermediate vascular system. And out here we have callus formation and all the vascularization associated with the fracture callus. <coughs> the situation related to malunions or nonunions. Here radiographically you have this so-called elephant foot lesion where you have a wide proliferation and lack of any bony remodeling in this region, mainly because you have cartilaginous formation in the area of the fracture. Histologically, the bright red, this is a basic fuchsin stain of an undecalcified section, so the bright red represents soft tissue, in this case cartilage, in the area of the fracture, and also some here in this region. So we have cartilage interposed between the two fragment ends, the classic situation of any unstable fracture where you have motion at the ends of the fragment. You usually stimulate that pluripotential cell to form cartilage as opposed to either fibrous tissue or bone. <clears throat> if we look at the vascular supply related to this cartilage proliferation, here the black areas represent cartilage and you can see the vascular perfusion that comes up immediately adjacent to the cartilage and then stops. If we look at that a little more closely, you'll see that these come up and terminate in little glomerular-like tufts 
right at the margin of the cartilage. Cartilage is avascular. Cartil vessels do not invade cartilage. The only way those vessels are going to get into that cartilage is if stability is established, compression is applied, and you get mineralization of the cartilage. Once the cartilage mineralizes, just the same as in the growth plate, once it mineralizes, the cells are entombed in a mineral encasement. They can no longer get their nutrient supply. The cells degenerate and die. They hypertrophy, degenerate, and die. And then the vessels can extend into the spaces that were previously occupied, and you begin to remodel the mineralized cartilaginous matrix and reconvert it to bone. So the key to the whole thing is to get mineralization of the cartilage, and then you can get the vascular remodeling that's needed to go along with that. Question? Yes. Why does it mineralize? Is it because of oxygen? Why does it uh, mineralize? The question is, why does the cartilage not mineralize? It doesn't mineralize because of, of motion. And yes, oxygen tension and, and blood supply to that region. But as long as you have that unmineralized cartilage in an unstable fracture where there's motion, you're going to get continued proliferation and differentiation of the pluripotential cells into cartilage primarily, along with some fibrous elements. And until you either apply pressure to that area and compress it and stabilize it, that cartilage will not undergo mineralization. And at that point, both probably mechanical stresses and compression and so on are what influence that. For example, in the <clears throat> columns of chondrocytes in the growth plate, part of the process that involves mineralization of that matrix is compression of the cartilaginous matrix between those hypertrophied chondrocytes so that each column of hypertrophied chondrocytes is compressing the cartilaginous matrix between it. So there's a physical or mechanical process in addition to all the biochemical and uh, vascular and, and associated changes that are necessary for that matrix to undergo mineralization. OK, let's begin with a discussion of some of the diseases associated with vascular disturbances, the first being hypertrophic pulmonary osteopathy or osteoarthropathy. Uh, at one point, the term osteoarthropathy, uh, can't say it, osteoarthropathy had fallen out of favor because people felt that there really weren't joint diseases. Since then, they've looked more closely and established that usually there are joint uh, lesions associated with the condition, and so now it's, it's proper again to say uh, osteoarthropathy. This condition has been described primarily in man and in the dog, although it occurs in other species, and it's been described in a number of, of other species as well. But it's certainly best described in the man and in the dog. The etiology is the presence of a space-occupying lesion in the thorax, usually. But it's also been described with space-occupying lesions in the abdomen, hepatic neoplasms and uh, similar conditions, renal neoplasms. Usually it's associated with either neoplasia or inflammation, the inflammation being the granulomatous uh, types of, of inflammation. The inflammatory conditions, TB, granulomatous pleuritis, granulomatous lymphadenitis, but the granulomatous diseases are the most commonly associated inflammatory diseases. And neoplastic processes, bronchogenic carcinoma as a primary lesion in the lung, but any metastatic lesion has the potential for producing HPOA. Parasitic diseases, dyrophilaria, has been associated with the condition, as has the Spirocerca lupi lesion of esophageal sarcoma. In the case of man, chronic heart disease has been associated with the disease. And I've already pointed out that abdominal lesions occasionally are associated with the condition. It occurs primarily in the appendicular skeleton. And it can occur basically in any of the long bones but more commonly in the case of the dog in the radius and ulna in the front limb and in the tibia uh, metatarsals in the rear limb and any of the distal bones of, of either the forelimb or the hind limb, the metacarpals or the metatarsals. Radiographically, the lesion is characterized by subperiosteal proliferations of bone uh, beneath the periosteum. And usually one of the indicators is the fact that the animal has some other type of of lesion, some thoracic or abdominal lesion that you're aware of at the time you begin to recognize the bony lesions. The 
proliferation of bone is not restricted to the metaphyseal regions as are some other conditions that we'll talk about later in the case of the dog so that they tend to run the full length of these long bones and that's one indication that you're dealing with HPOA in contrast for example to hypertrophic osteodystrophy where the lesion is restricted pretty much to the metaphyseal regions. You can't count on that, it's not a 100% sure, but HPOA is much more likely to run the full length of the long bone than are these other conditions. Here are lesions primarily in the metaphyses, subperiosteal proliferation in the absence of any lesions within the metaphysis. And in order to uh, consider this particular condition, you have to look and be concerned as to whether there are any other lesions associated with the metaphyses. If there's no lesion within the medullary cavity or the metaphysis, then you're on much firmer ground to consider the possibility of hypertrophic pulmonary osteo osteoarthropathy. <coughs> Excuse me. Macerated specimens showing subperiosteal new bone on the surfaces that extend from proximal to distal extent. So the entire surfaces of these bone, bones covered by subperiosteal new bone proliferation. Far less common in the other conditions to see that run the full length of those bones. Here's a cross section, uh, cortex, medullary cavity, and the cortex, and around that this lobulated proliferation of subperiosteal bone, extensive subperiosteal proliferation beneath the periosteum. And here, a subgross specimen. The outer limit of the cortex is right here and right here. We have proliferation in this region and we have subperiosteal new bone formed throughout this area here. <clears throat> as far as the pathogenesis is concerned, we've said that it's associated with lesions in either the abdominal or thoracic cavity. We know that by severing the vagus nerve and a vagotomy that you can correct the condition and that in itself suggests that there's some kind of a reflex arc involved here uh, between the, the vagal nerve supply and the stimulation of the blood supply in the region of the bone. We know that there's increased peripheral blood flow to the, in the vessels that supply the long bones. Now that's the major vessels, the arteries and veins and so on, that are carrying blood to the region of the bones involved. That supply is increased, but in the area of the joint capsule, in the capillary network, where there are shunts between the arterial and the venous system, there are structures referred to as glomus bodies that have pressure receptor functions similar to that that we find in the aortic and carotid bodies. And it's thought that these glomus structures, as a result of the increased peripheral blood flow, shunt the blood away from the periosteum, so that in this area of the joint capsule, we're shunting blood away from the periosteal surface. And as a result, we have a reduced blood supply to the periosteum of the cortices. If you think back to our conversations yesterday, we said in the presence of high oxygen tension, when we talked about cortical remodeling, that high oxygen tension gives you osteoclastic resorption. Low oxygen tension results in the formation of osteoblast and osteoblastic activity. So if we're shunning blood away from the periosteal surface in the metaphyseal regions and, and as it extends down the shaft of the bone, we would expect to see low oxygen tension and bone formation stimulated within the periosteum. And at least that is a, an acceptable explanation for why we see increased bone formation beneath the periosteum, even in the presence of the increased peripheral blood flow, apparently as a result of this vagal reflex phenomenon. Question? Yes. So you're getting the <clears throat> increased amount of blood to the marrow cavity, and then it's not getting out of what you said recently with the vascular pictures we looked at, that blood should be going across the cortex to the periosteum. So where, where is it being shunted from the marrow cavity to? With okay. The, the question is uh, related to the blood supply, as we described it, for the normal bone and the fact that the vessels are carrying blood into the medu medullary cavity and blood flow is, is coming out as opposed to 
the situation in this case where we have increased peripheral blood flow. I think the condition hasn't really been defined within the medullary cavity. And what, we're, what we know is that the blood supply in the radial artery and uh, ulnar arteries and so on in HPOA is increased. What we don't know is whether or not there's an increased intramedullary supply. There's not really any suggestion that there is because I think if there was an intense increase in the medullary circulation and therefore in that blood supply coming through the cortex, you'd see extensive remodeling uh, within the cortices themselves. And you really don't see that in HPOA. So I think the suggestion is that there's increased peripheral blood flow in those radial and, and ulnar arteries, but not necessarily once they extend through the nutrient artery into the medullary cavity. And that the shunning is occurring at the capillary level in the joint capsule region where the shunning is away from the periosteal arteries or arterioles and therefore reduce blood supply at the periosteal level. Uh, the point is to specifically answer your question, I don't think we can because I don't think anyone has looked at the blood pressure within the vessels within the medullary cavity. But just on the basis of the evidence and what we see in the way of, of uh, uh, changes in the cortex or the lack of changes in the cortex, I think it suggests that there's not any major change there or you would see either increased resorption or decreased resorption, one or the two. <coughs> Idiopathic necrosis of the femoral head or so-called leg calvae perthes like disease since it's resembles the leg perthes condition in man. Here's a normal femoral head, an acetabulum on the one side. Notice the radiolucency in the femoral head on the opposite side. In fact, to the point that we have almost a totally lytic lesion within the center of the femoral head. This is classical leg perthes disease characterized primarily in the miniature breeds and the small breeds of dogs. And what happens is that one simply gets an area of necrosis within the epiphysis. Here's the growth plate beneath the articular cartilage above. You get necrosis occurring within the cancellous bone of the epiphysis. As a result, you get a buckling and folding of the articular cartilage to the point that you may even completely disrupt the articular cartilage and secondarily, you'll develop an osteoarthritic change in association with it. You simply get then, as this begins to revascularize and you get repair processes beginning, you get a proliferation of granulation tissue within this area. You'll get some new uh, re bone remodeling and bony replacement, but you'll never get this back to a normal structure so that you can reconstitute the normal epiphyseal structure. And this is just a higher magnification showing the granulation tissue that forms. You'll get some chondroid metaplasia. You'll get some new bone formation. But mostly, it's soft tissue repair of an area that had previously undergone extensive necrosis. There's been all kinds of suggestions as to the etiology and the pathogenesis of the condition. And probably Dr. Reiser's explanation of it being a man-made disease by creating these small, miniature, and toy breeds is uh, as acceptable one as any. And some of the more recent uh, work on this has suggested that, in fact, in these small breeds, you have such a small uh, <coughs> compartment. And it is a compartment, because if we go back to the previous slide, this is encased in a bony shell. And so if you have a lack of blood supply in this region, you simply are going to get necrosis. And I think that it's probably related to the fact that we've reduce the size of this compartment to the point that we no longer have a blood supply to meet the needs in that area. And as a result of that lack of blood supply, we get necrosis within the femoral head. And as a result, secondarily, the classical leg perthes condition developing. So it's probably pretty much explained on the basis of anatomical changes related to the blood supply in the very small femoral head and lack of, of adequate uh, vascular adequate vascularity of the epiphysis. Question? Yes. What is the blood supply in the epiphysis? What? What is the blood supply to the epiphysis? To the epiphysis? In the femur, specifically? Or any 
well, it'll vary obviously as you go from one to another, but in general, the, there is a blood supply provided through the round ligament in the femoral head, and there is a branch that extends in from the periphery uh, at the margin, if you will, of the articular cartilage and the reflection of the periosteum. So you, get, you have basically two supplies, one coming from below and one coming through the round ligament. And apparently it's this compartmentalized nature and this altered vascular or failure of vascular remodeling to, to follow the change in the skeletal remodeling that's occurred in these miniature breeds that simply results in an inadequate vascular supply to this epiphyseal head in, in particular in the femur. The question is whether the vascular supply is different in dogs than it is in rats. Right. I, the, uh, I mean, obviously rats have a much smaller femoral head. Yeah, dogs. that's true, but the point is that, that uh, the rat has a much smaller femoral head than even the dog, and therefore why don't we see this condition in the rat? The point is, though, that the rat evolved, and we haven't had giant rats in the past and bred smaller breeds of rats, and therefore it's evolved and, and probably the vascularity and the vascular supply has evolved along with the developing uh, bone. In this case, it appears that we've taken breeds which were larger breeds and we've reduced them and we've, we've altered the skeletal structure, but we haven't followed along with the vascular remodeling that's needed to maintain an adequate supply to a much smaller bone than we had previously in a larger breed. That's taking the constitutional approach that Dr. Reiser uh, takes in, in def defining why this condition exists the way it does. A lot of people have looked at hormonal influences that, you know, that's not to say that this is necessarily correct, but most of the, the research that centered on hormonal influences and so on have uh, basically been disproven. And to tie it directly to any hormonal involvement is pretty much fallen by the wayside, I believe. which I think is in a condition where they outgrow the blood supply in mm -hmm. young men. Is that, right. that described in animals? And <clears throat> the question is, how does this relate to Osgood Slaughter's disease in man? Uh, very similar in terms of the histologic nature of the lesion, as I understand it. But there, it's a, a condition that occurs in the tibial tuberosity as opposed to the femoral head. And as you pointed out, it, it apparently is related to the uh, very rapid growth, particularly in young uh, adolescent boys that grow very rapidly and the bone outgrows the blood supply, if you will, and you end up with focal areas of necrosis within the area of the tibial, tibial tuberosity. So it's similar from a histological standpoint and from it being associated with vascular supply, from that's approaching it from the vascularity standpoint. Then is the, is the reason that this Remains as granulation tissue and not remodeling from bone due to inability of the vascular system to provide enough oxygen or nutrients to this area? Lack of, of adequate supply, perhaps under conditions of physiological stress or whatever, that begins the necrotic process, and then you get ne necrosis followed by vascular repair. You begin to get, I haven't included. Uh, any photographs to show it, but you begin to get bridging of the the uh, growth plate in this condition in certain instances. So you'll get uh, a mineralization and bridging as you get necrosis here, perhaps destroying the nutrient supply to the growth plate. I'm speculating now, but at least you get bony bridging across the the growth plate. You get granulation tissue forming even down here in the metaphyseal region. And with that granulation tissue, I'm simply describing what really is, is increased vascularity and fibrous proliferation. It extends on up, and you get some repair processes occurring in this area where early there had been only necrosis. So we're looking at a lesion here, which is, is well down the road toward repair. Uh, early on, you saw only necrosis and destruction of bone in this area, followed by ingrowth of vessels, some proliferation of granulation tissue, and a very feeble attempt at, at remodeling 
but you actually are seeing changes occur in the metaphysis as well as up here in the, meta in the epiphysis. I guess what I have trouble understanding is with, with the uh, fibrous proliferation and, and neovascularization that you would assume that you see with granulation tissue, why doesn't this go ahead and remodel back to bone? Well, you'll form some bone, but you have to bear in mind that the only way you're going to get normal trabecular structure in here is if that bone is formed beneath the articular cartilage in the normal enchondral fashion, and it has to have some kind of a scaffold to build on, and you've lost that here. You've got this great big cavity that's developed in the epiphysis. You've, you've infolded your articular cartilage, so to expect bone, even if it forms here, to push that articular cartilage back out and form the normal architecture is expecting more than would ever occur. Not only that, but by the time that were to happen, you've probably destroyed the articular cartilage and you're well on your way to osteoarthritic changes and, and associated changes. So you will uh, in time. If this thing collapses all the way in, eventually in this area through the ingrowth of vessels and so on, you'll form some new bone. It'll be haphazard. It'll look like this does here. And in time, this will subside and you'll get repair. But by that time, you'll have a, a, an articular surface that's probably down in this region here, and it may not even be articular cartilage at that point. Not a well understood disease, and a disease that's had intermittent uh, research and attempts to try to figure out what was going on. And everything tends to come back to blood supply in the end, is, is the major point, I think, to be made. Okay, bone infarcts, not really a whole lot unlike the situation in Lake Perthes disease, but associated more with the fact that tumors in, that occur in long bones are often associated with areas of increased radio, oden, radio density in other areas of either the same bone or other bones, even in other limbs. Here's an osteosarcoma in the proximal end of one bone, proximal end of the tibia, and here in the distal femur is an area of increased bone proliferation and associated with infarction of the vascular, of the vessels in that particular area. Now again, from what we talked about yesterday, you should be able to associate increased bone formation with infarction because if you've infarcted a vessel, you've destroyed the blood supply, and the normal stimulus for the surrounding mesenchymal elements is to result in the formation of bone due to reduced oxygen tension. And that's exactly what happens. Here's vessels that are obstructed and occluded, and we're beginning to get out of the mesenchymal elements surrounding it. Certainly in the immediate vicinity of the vessel, you have early necrosis. But then you begin to get ingrowth and proliferation of these mesenchymal cells. And out of that, you get new bone proliferation. And that's what's simply happening here. We're beginning to encircle an infarcted area with new bone trabeculae. The infarcts have been identified in animals with neoplasms. Whether or not the infarcts are there prior to the development of neoplasms is, is uncertain. And this is really the work that Dr. DeBilsick at University of Pennsylvania uh, reported. Here again, an area of infarction and new bone proliferation in this area, more over in this region. Most of these trabeculae are pre-existing bone trabeculae. This is normal intertrabecular spaces here, but here in an infarcted area you've got new bone formation. And it simply shows up uh, when there's enough of it uh, radiographically as, as a focal area of radio opacity in the radiographs. And here's a more extensive area where you get this very uh, mosaic-like new bone being formed within the intertrabecular space in an area of infarction. Lesion basically resembles that that's been described in Kazan's disease or the diver's syndrome in people. Equine epiphysitis, uh, a term that I really don't like because it's not an itis, and probably, at least in terms of a more descriptive term, metaphyseal sclerosis is a better term since it uh, better describes the actual situation. 
and we really aren't de dealing with an inflammatory response. A condition that's usually seen in really well-doing, uh, well-fed, uh, well-proportioned animals, whether it be quarter horses or thoroughbreds. In this case, we're looking at a, at a quarter horse yearling. Enlargement of the carpal regions, you'll see the same thing in the tarsal area to a lesser extent in, in the fetlock region, but usually we see this uh, more in the knees than we do in the distal limbs. Same lesion, skin removed, you're seeing the medial uh, enlargement. Here radiographically, increased density on the medial margin. Same thing here, growth plate in this region, sclerotic, and by sclerosis in bone, we're talking, talking about osteosclerosis as opposed to fibrous proliferation. So instead of normal cancellous bone of the metaphysis, we have this region of very dense bone on the medial margin. We're getting irregularities in the growth plate and it becomes difficult depending on the age of the animal because in a yearling if you're appro approaching the time when the growth plates would close you're not sure whether you're seeing bridging of the growth plate or whether you're seeing early closure of the growth plate but when it becomes as irregular and haphazard as this is because the normal thickness is about what you see from right in this area on toward the margin you begin to see bridging like this and wider regions such as this here in the area of the sclerotic region, it suggests that it's all interrelated and that it's a lesion and not, in fact, normal closure. Microscopically, you see this increased sclerosis and increased density in the area beneath the growth plate, suggestion being that, again, for one reason or another, there's reduced blood supply to this region. We're getting increased density of bone and increased proliferation of bone in this region. I'm sorry, I thought I had one more. Uh, the point being that this is the classic lesion that's associated with this condition. Uh, it occurs in the very well-doing, rapidly growing animals, suggests that it may be something comparable in a different location to the osgood Schlatter's situation where you simply are forming bone at a rate that you're not maintaining the, the normal vascular supply and as a result you get this increased proliferation uh, and abundance of bone in these margins. Obviously in some of these folds there's uh, conformational changes and so on that suggest that, that the condition is also associated with mechanical stresses and abnormalities in, in conformation that lead to that increased uh, density. I think we'll go ahead and, and at least introduce the metabolic bone disease concept and perhaps stop before we get into the specific conditions that we associate with the metabolic bone diseases. Under normal situations, bone formation and bone resorption are in balance with one another. And you have formation and resorption both occurring simultaneously but maintaining that balance of normal skeletal mass. That situation can be tipped either in favor of excessive resorption or as a result of too little bone formation, in which case you end up with a reduced amount of bone or a decreased amount of bone. Or on the other hand, you can tip the scales in favor of increased amounts of bone either through excessive formation or reduced absorption. And we've already seen one example of the situation when there's reduced resorption and therefore increased bone mass in the case of congenital osteopetrosis, where in that case it was primarily reduced resorption and in some cases perhaps increased formation simultaneously. <clears throat> you can't discuss metabolic bone diseases and these kinds of changes without considering Wolf's Law, which says that the internal architecture and the external form of a bone are related to its function and change with altered function. So that any time you change the function of a bone, you're going to 
alter in one way or another either the internal and or the external architecture of that bone. Take for example placing a limb in a cast. Any limb that's been in a cast for a period of eight weeks compared to the contralateral bone is going to be osteoporotic. It's going to have lost bone mass simply because of a change in its function. By the same token, uh, other forms of increased activity will increase the remodeling rate within the cortex. It will increase the number of osteones. The 25-year-old athletic individual has far more osteons within the cort cortices of his long bones than does the 25-year-old non-athletic individual. So the point being that the internal external form is related to function. And any time you change function, you change that form. The other concept is one of that, the fact that alterations in the balance between formation and resorption play a criti critical role in the calcium homeostasis and basically underlie every disease that affects the skeleton. So that it's this delicate balance between formation and resorption and particularly in the metabolic diseases when one of these becomes imbalanced then we see net changes that result in changes in the form and structure of the skeleton. I think we'll cover osteoporosis and then uh, stop at that point. By definition, osteoporosis is atrophy of bone. It's too little bone and there's a reduction in bone mass versus the volume of the bone. In other words, an osteoporotic bone, if you were to macerate it, would look exactly the same shape and the same size that it was before it lost its mass. But it's increased in porosity. The medullary cavity may be increased in size at the expense of the cortex, so that you may have a thinner cortex, a larger medullary cavity, and marked porosity of the bone that remains. But its external form looks exactly the same as it did before. So it's a reduction in mass as opposed to a reduction in volume. <clears throat> the Causes of osteoporosis can be either mechanical, congenital, nutritional, or endocrine. And probably in the case of the animal species, the nutritional and to a lesser extent the endocrine are the most common causes of osteoporosis in animals. Congenital osteoporosis we've alluded to when we mentioned osteogenesis imperfecta and while it's relatively common in man, has just been recently described in, in animals, as we pointed out. Mechanical stresses, the situation of placing a limb in a cast, uh, increased use, whatever, uh, affecting the mechanical nature and, and cause of osteoporosis. So we're going to concentrate on the nutritional and endocrine as far as the animals are concerned. In looking at a normal cortex of a long bone compared to osteoporotic, here the cortices are relatively similar in overall thickness, but you'll see the increased holes and spaces within the cortex of this bone compared to the one on the left. Osteoporotic, fairly similar in size and shape, but increased porosity of that dense cortical bone. Looking at a section of rib, here we have the normal thickness of rib in the normal situation. Notice the caliber of the trabeculae in the normal and the osteoporotic. Thinner cortices, notice the ragged, jagged appearance of the trabeculae in the osteoporotic, suggesting that there's excessive resorption taking place, giving this irregular surface to these bones compared to the normal situation, where as resorption occurs, formation follows immediately behind it, and you have relatively smooth surfaces to either the trabeculae or the internal surface of the cortex. In the case of nutritional osteoporosis, we have several conditions that can give rise to the osteoporotic condition. Lack of vitamin C, hypovitaminosis C has been the, the classic example of osteoporosis in the form of scurvy, and we'll talk about that specifically later on. Hypoproteinemia, protein, protein deficiency, protein calorie deficiencies, hypervitaminosis A, while we normally associate it with an exostatic situation and proliferation of bone in the subperiosteal region, really the underlying cause is an osteoporosis, and the exostoses are really a reparative phenomenon. 
and hyperadrenocorticism will result in osteoporosis as well. Here's a long bone with extremely thin cortices compared to the normal situation. Radiographically, very thin attenuated cortices, very lucent areas in the metaphysis compared to normal. Costochondral junction, here's the costal cartilage, virtually no bone present here in the metaphyseal region. If you look at that microscopically, here's the cartilage of the uh, costal cartilage, the cortices, which are extremely thin, and you get this very fine filigree pattern to the trabeculae in the metaphyseal region. And here it is, still at higher magnification, very thin, attenuated trabeculae, not good, broad-calibered trabeculae that you normally expect to see in a metaphysis. And here, virtually no osteoblasts on bone surfaces. We're simply shutting off, in this case, have shut off bone formation, and the bone that's there is very slowly being resorbed, removed, and not replaced at its normal rate. Here's a growth plate, normal metaphysis, nice perpendicular trabeculae beneath the growth plate. And here, an osteoporotic condition in which you have marked reduction in the caliber and number of trabeculae. You don't have that nice perpendicular arrangement beneath the growth plate. Another point to be made, if we back up, and look at these trabeculae, which run perpendicular and run immediately away from the growth plate above. In contrast, in the osteoporotic condition, uh, whether we know what the cause of this condition was or not, at any rate, we know that growth rate was reduced. Because when the growth of that growth plate away from the underlying metaphysis is reduced and slowed down, you have time for horizontal trabeculae to begin to join up these vertical trabeculae. And so you start getting this transverse pattern associated immediately beneath the growth plate to the point that it becomes very prominent so that you can even recognize it radiographically. And these are sometimes referred to as growth arrest lines or stutter lines, where because of slow growth, the growth plate simply isn't growing away and leaving this streaming out of primary trabeculae. In our last session, we were discussing infections of bone, and I had uh, shown you examples of bacterial and fungal osteomyelitis, uh, an example of avian osteopetrosis, and the last condition that I'd like to describe under the inflammatory conditions is that of osteomyelosclerosis, as we see it most commonly in either the cat or the dog. This condition's been described in Basenji's and Biggles with pyruvate kinase deficiency and the associated anemia, and in cats with feline leukemia and non-regenerative anemia. It's also been described uh, in the past in chickens with anemia and erythroleukemia and in man with anemia and leukemias. Uh, there's nothing specific about uh, the condition in terms of being associated with any specific infectious agent, but any agent, as you can see, uh, that has the common denominator of anemia throughout all of these conditions has the potential to result in osteomyelosclerosis. Here's a radiograph of a normal long bone from a cat and a cat that has osteomyelosclerosis, secondary to feline leukemia virus infection. Grossly normal long bone, the epiphysis, the growth plate, and the metaphysis, and compare that to the next slide, which is a cat with osteomyelosclerosis. It should uh, have uh, reminiscences for you of congenital osteopetrosis because the lesion grossly looks very much similar to osteopetrosis, perhaps the bone a little less dense and not as closely set trabeculae as in congenital osteopetrosis, but still very similar grossly and radiographically. A normal metaphysis of uh, histologically in a normal cat compared to the histologic picture that we see in a cat with osteomyelosclerosis. Usually a precursor of this osteous proliferation within the medullary cavity is myelofibrosis and proliferation of fibrous tissue 
with the loss of marrow elements and so on. And why under certain conditions we see proliferation of bone out of that fibrous tissue and in other situations we do not is not really well understood at this point in time. Certainly a small percentage of cats that have feline leukemia virus infection develop myelofibrosis and an even smaller num number develop osteomyelosclerosis within that group that develops the fibrous proliferation. Higher magnification of the trabeculae of bone that form in this uh, loose connective tissue stroma that's present in the medullary cavity. And at, even at this magnification, you should be able to appreciate the difference histologically between this condition and congenital osteopetrosis because these trabeculae do not contain central cores of cartilage. And that's one of the criteria that should be used in attempting, attempting to differentiate between these co two conditions if you're faced with uh, differentiating the conditions microscopically. Okay, that pretty well covers the inflammatory conditions and I'd now like to move on to the toxic agents that are associated with bone and lesions that occur in bone. The first of these being fluoride toxicity and the condition osteofluorosis. The species that are involved are primarily the ruminant species, horses and cattle, herbivores, uh, those animals that are grazing vegetation that's been contaminated with fluoride. And so it's usually uh, associated this day and age with contaminated vegetation from aluminum smelting plants and, and various smelting uh, factories that result in airborne contamination of vegetation. In other instances, high content of fluoride in the water uh, such as in certain situations in the West will result in fluoride toxicity or simply a high soil content that results in vegetation that has a high fluoride level. As far as the metabolism of fluoride is concerned, it's rapidly absorbed from the intestine, but at the same time it's very rapidly excreted and eliminated from the blood, so the blood levels don't remain high for a very long period of time. And it's rapidly deposited in osseous tissues and excreted in the urine. The pathogenesis of the lesion as far as bone is concerned is the fact that the fluoride ion replaces the hydroxyl ion in the formation of hydroxyapatite and therefore we have the formation of fluoroapatite as opposed to hydroxyapatite. This is affected as you could imagine by the age of the bone, very young, rapidly growing, rapidly developing bone incorporates more fluoride ion into it than older bone that's not turning over as rapidly and the type of bone influences it and that the type of bone we said was influenced by rate of formation so we would expect to see more uh, fluoride incorporated in woven bone, rapidly developing woven bone than we would in lamellar bone. The effect of the hydroxy uh, of the fluoride ion on the crystal of fluoroapatite is one of increasing the size and the stability of that crystal, which saying it in another way is saying that we reduce the solubility of the apatite crystal and therefore reduce the amount of exchangeable calcium available to the individual. Now in severe conditions it's possible that you can reduce the amount of exchangeable calcium if there's a, a marginal level of calcium in the diet to the point that you could get secondary hyperparathyroidism involved due to a calcium deficiency, but that's a rare situation in this condition. As far as the fluoride ion uh, and the production of bone matrix is concerned, there is an abnormal matrix produced uh, primarily as a result of the influence of the fluoride ion on the osteoblasts and the production of lipase mucopolysaccharides and so on. So like many of the other conditions, we have matrix that's produced under the influence of this toxic product being abnormal, such as in rickets and osteomalacia. Dr. Johnson uh, here at AFIP has done some work with Dr. Shoup that uh, delineates the levels of fluoride in bone that result in either simply fluoridated bone or abnormal bone. And when one has an intake of a less than 10 parts per million 
you can expect to see lower than 2,500 parts per million of fluoride deposited in bone. And in that situation, you simply get fluoridated bone. This is what is being strived for in those water supplies that have fluoride ion la added at much lower levels than this. And so anything below 10 parts per million simply gives you fluoridated bone. When you get to an intake that approximates 25 parts per million, you can expect to see 2,500 to 5,000 parts per million deposited in the bone matrix. And in this situation, you begin to see the first morphologic evidence of fluoride toxicity in bone, and that's in the form of modeled osteons. When you get over 50 parts per million of intake, you can expect greater than 5,000 parts per million in bone and that will give you abnormal bone matrix and abnormalities that manifest themselves clinically as far as the skeleton is concerned. In the early stages, as we pointed out previously, the first lesion that one can expect is osteoporosis, followed by osteomalacia as a result of abnormal matrix that fails to undergo complete mineralization and therefore lack of mineralization of matrix that's produced, not because of lack of availability, of mineral ions, but because of the abnormalities within the matrix. In the reparative stages, and very often the fluoride intake is intermittent. You have high levels of intake, reduced levels, and it's an intermittent process. So during the period when the fluoride levels are minimal or non-existent, you can ex expect to see mineralization and deposition of excessive amounts of bone in the area where there had previously been osteoporosis, very much like the condition that we showed you in scurvy after the dietary deficiency is corrected. And so osteosclerosis is not uncommon during the reparative stages. And at the same time, hyperostoses are present, often because of the weakness of bone structure created by the early osteoporotic lesions, excessive resorption and remodeling. And so it's a compensatory phenomenon again uh, with the hyperostoses forming in response to that. Question? Yes. The osteomalacia there, that's the abnormal matrix. Will that mineralize and then be reabsorbed? The question is, will the abnormal matrix mineralize and then be reabsorbed? Portions of that matrix will undergo mineralization. Some portions of it will not. It's like the situation in rickets. Once that matrix is produced and it's abnormal, it may persist as unmineralized matrix for a considerable period of time. But it's a patchy, haphazard mineralization that occurs in, in situations like this. And so some of it mineralizes. That which does undergo mineralization can be attacked by osteoclast and remodeled and removed. Those areas where it's so abnormal that mineralization doesn't occur will not, will not undergo mineralization. <clears throat> Here's a horse with fluoride toxicity. And other than the fact that it doesn't look like a very well-doing horse, you can't really appreciate much in the way of abnormalities. Same thing is true in cattle. In southeastern Ohio, when I was at Ohio State, we experienced cattle that frequently were presented such as this. Skinny, poor-doing cows, any animal in an area of a smelting plant that becomes lame, is a poor doer, or for whatever reason, the owner is of the opinion that this animal is developing fluoride toxicity. And so it becomes a pretty big thing with insurance companies and so on as to whether these animals really have fluoride toxicity or not. This is an undecalcified 70 micron thick section of bone, unstained, and you're looking at normal osteons. Interstitial fragments here. Here's a portion of one where a new osteon is formed. But very uniform appearance of the osteons, the central canal, the concentric six or seven rings of osteocytes the fairly uniform appearance to these alternating lamellae of bone. Compare that to an animal, in fact, the animal that I showed you, the cow that I showed you just a minute ago, with osteopor uh, I'm sorry, flor floro fluoride toxicity. Uh, in this situation, when the osteons are in the process of developing, and you think back to the fact that we have resorption cavities and a layer of osteoblasts that form on the surface and concentrically fill the resorption cavity. At the point that those osteoblasts are influenced by fluoride toxicity, and bear in mind, each of these osteons can be in different stages of development at the time that fluoride manifests itself. Those osteoblasts 
are influenced so that they fail to form normal matrix. They fail to become entrapped in a matrix that's normal, and so they retain a larger size than you normally would see in the osteocytic lacunae. So you have these enlarged osteocytes and this discoloration around the cells that are involved that has been referred to as modeled osteons. I suspect that that term is borrowed from the modeling of teeth that's associated with fluoride toxicity as well. But for whatever reason, these are referred to as modeled osteons when you get this enlarged ring of osteocytes. Notice that over here, from this outer rim, has had normal bone formation taking place. That osteon had begun to refill, and the osteoblasts at this point in time were the ones that were influenced. That amount of bone right here at the margin had already been formed normally before the fluoride effect was manifest. The same way here, there was some refill in this area that was relatively normal before the cells were affected by the fluoride levels. Higher magnification showing a normal osteon. And even in these undecalcified sections, you can appreciate, I think, the alternating lamellae because the collagen fibers are laid in at right angles to one another. So you get this, this ring-like appearance as you concentrically move from the periphery to the center. And a modeled osteon here again. Again, a rim of relatively normal bone formation before this ring of osteoblasts which failed to become normal osteocytes occur. And even the remainder of the matrix that forms is not entirely normal in this situation. And usually you won't find the uniform six to seven concentric rings of osteocytes in these model osteons. In the long bones, you get osteoporotic changes, excessive remodeling within the cortices, and very often as a result of that, subperiosteal proliferation of new bone. The outer limit of the cortex is right here a little bit of artifactual separation right there. Extensive osteoporosis in the distal region here, or the posterior region, and all of this subperiosteal hyperostotic new bone laid down. Notice also that the outer margin is more perpendicular spicules, and the inner margin that was formed first has had time for some refill to take place, and so it's denser bone closer to the cortex and more loose cancellous bone in the outer limits immediately beneath the periosteum. As a result of those changes, which are not entirely uniform, you get these exostotic proliferations, usually in the metaphyseal regions of long bones. At the same time, in severe conditions, you get severe ankylosing lesions within many of the joints. And not to forget that teeth that are developing during the period of fluoride toxicity have failure of normal enamel development. And then you get this brownish blackish discoloration as a result of pitting of the enamel and entrapment of organic material and, and bacterial products within that hypoplastic pitted enamel. Lead poisoning, lead toxicity. The lesions are pretty much limited to the metaphysis and represented by a metaphysial sclerosis. And the lesion is one of reduced resorption or remodeling of primary spongiosa to secondary spongiosa. The defect that's responsible for that is a defect in osteoclastic function as a result of the incorporation of lead into the osteoclast that has a toxic effect and therefore renders them ineffective in their ability to remodel the bone matrix. So you should be anticipating that the lesions you'd expect to see are very similar to that that's seen in congenital osteopetrosis. And in fact, they are. Here, radiographically, is a monkey with lead toxicity. The so-called radiographic lead line are these radiodense bands that you see immediately adjacent to the growth plate. Growth plate. And you have them in multiple bones throughout. And here, microscopically, the dense, closely set primary trabeculae failing to undergo normal remodeling beneath the growth plate. Higher magnification showing the cartilage cores and osteoid being deposited on the surfaces, but a failure 
of normal osteoclastic remodeling. So the lesion really, in the case of lead poisoning, simply can't be dif differentiated from that of congenital osteopetrosis, other than for the fact that ultrastructurally, at least, you can identify the lead inclusions within the osteoclast. And you obviously have a whole different uh, clinical syndrome that manifests itself, and you're dealing with usually different species of animals and so on. But in terms of the microscopic appearance, it's very similar, one disease to the other. Okay, I'm bypassing a discussion of neoplasms of bone because we pretty well covered most of those in the comparative pathology meeting last week. And so I'm going to move on to a discussion of the pathogenesis of joint disease and arthritis and tendovaginitis. By definition, arthritis is an inflammation of the intra-articular structures. And it can either result in either as a result of either degenerative or traumatic lesions. There's usually an increase in synovial fluid, and generally both arthritis, inflammation of those intra-articular structures, and the synovial sheaths of the tendons also tend to occur at the same time. So very often there's a com combined inflammatory reaction in these two structures. And the primary lesion is one of a synovitis in the early stages. And arthritis in animals usually is infectious in nature, in contrast to man, where many situations of non-infectious arthritis occur. The routes of infection can either be as a result of direct wounds into the joint, uh, contiguous extension, usually from infections, local infections and in overlying soft tissues, more than infection uh, in bone that extends into the joint, and I'll discuss that a little bit more later on. And hematogenous routes of infection are the, is the third most common route. And of these in animals, probably the hematogenous route is as common as any. Septic arthritis. Here's two extremely enlarged swollen joints in the hock of a pig. The problem with septic and purulent arthritis is that the proteolytic enzymes in the neutrophilic component are lytic to articular cartilage. And so in those areas where you have extensive purulent effusion into that joint, you get extensive destruction of the articular cartilage within the joint. And this is one example where uh, joint flushing is indicated. And one wants to get rid of that purulent exudate as quickly as possible in order to avoid lesions such as this because you get massive and extensive destruction of the articular cartilage as a result of this purulent effusion into the joint. The end result of that is if you simply denude and strip away the articular cartilage, you open up the subchondral bone to the infection that's present within the joint. And you very commonly will get a secondary osteomyelitis as a result of the extension of that inflammatory reaction and infection into the underlying bone. And that's happened in both instances here of the two adjacent bone ends. You can appreciate, I think, the synovial proliferation and the synovitis that's present here in the joint capsule as well. The point that I wanted to make in terms of the extension from the joint into bone being far more common than extension of an osteomyelitis into the joint cavity is that if there's a growth plate or if there is no growth plate and you have only the articular cartilage present, Infections and even neoplasms very seldom will violate the growth plate or the articular cartilage. So you can have an, a fairly extensive infection or neoplasm in the epiphyseal end of a long bone, and only under rare circumstances will that extend into the joint cavity. Now that's not to say that it doesn't occur, because a very anaplastic, rapidly growing uh, neoplasms or extensive infections will extend on into joints but usually they respect the articular cartilage or the growth plate and are much more likely to blow out of the cortex than they are to extend into the joint. But in separative arthritides, it's very common to get secondary bone infection as a result of the destruction of articular cartilage. A sequelae of infectious arthritis of all types, be it either separative or non-separative or uh, any form of infectious arthritis 
is the formation of pannus in the joint. Pannus is simply a growth of granulation tissue over the surface of the articular cartilage. And here at the upper left of the screen you see the leading edge of this growth of granulation tissue that's extended out over the articular surface. If you look at the underlying articular cartilage, you'll notice the prominence of the collagen matrix in this area here where the, gra where the granulation tissue has been present longest. And over here at the leading edge, the cartilage is still relatively normal. The reason for that is that the granulation tissue simply cuts off the underlying cartilage from its nutritional supply. The nutrition of that articular cartilage coming from the synovial fluid within the joint, and so the cartilage matrix beneath the granulation tissue undergoes degenerative change. And that's what's happening here, and it's gradual as one extends out to the leading edge to where it's relatively normal. Here it is at a little higher magnification, the leading edge of that granulation tissue, or pannus, relatively normal articular cartilage here, and degenerating cartilage here. You begin to get loss of, of proteoglycans, you expose collagen fibers, you begin to get degeneration and cloning of chondrocytes and all the attendant degenerative changes that occur anytime cartilage is cut off from its nutritional supply. Here at the top, the granulation tissue, the previous margin of the articular cartilage, and extensive degenerative change occurring within the matrix of that articular cartilage. The question is, does the articular cartilage shift from that of hyaline cartilage through a, and go through a stage of fibrocartilage formation uh, as this degenerative process occurs? Uh, I guess one could look at this and consider it to be uh, fibrocartilaginous in nature in that you have uh, a pale matrix and, and prominent uh, collagen fibers. But in fact, I think you're seeing strictly a degenerative process and I'd be reluctant to refer to this as fibrocartilage. Even though it has the appearance of fibrocartilage, I don't think that it, it is because we knew it was hyaline cartilage and we know it's undergoing degenerative change. And I don't think that it's, uh, fibrocartilage is an intermediate step on the way to destruction of that cartilage. Question? Yes. If you get all the new blood vessels in that granulation tissue, why does the cartilage die? The question is, if you get new blood vessels in that cartilage, why does the cartilage die? The point is that you don't get blood vessels in the cartilage itself. It's strictly up here. The vessels are limited to this band of fibrous tissue on the surface. And those vessels don't extend down into the cartilage. But they never did, did they? They never did, and they don't now. The, the vessels never did extend into the cartilage. They don't extend into it now. All that you have now is a band of vascular granulation tissue. And while that vascularity supplies that granulation tissue on the surface, it does nothing to maintain the nutrient supply to the cartilage. And in fact, it cuts it, the cartilage off from its overlying synovial fluid and therefore its nutrient supply. OK, osteochondrosis. Uh, the first of a uh, series of non-inflammatory arthropathies that I want to mention. Osteochondrosis desiccans is fairly well described in, in the dog uh, and in the pig, and probably uh, there's a tendency nowadays to refer to the term as simply osteochondroses because we know that while we recognize lesions in the articular cartilages as our osteochondrosis desiccans, that lesions also exist in other cartilages within the body, the growth plates and so on. And it's becoming, uh, coming to be recognized as a much more generalized condition than one which is simply limited to the articular cartilages. But a classic example of osteochondrosis desiccans is seen here in, these con in, in this one condyle uh, in the distal limb of a horse. And you can see this focal area that's lost the uh, bluish radiolucent appearance that you get to normal hyaline cartilage, which you see in the remainder of the uh, articulation. And so you have this rather yellowish area with fairly well demarcated margin and a little area that's beginning to break away so it looks like we have a cleft forming at the one margin. 
that was exactly the way that lesion was found at the time the joint was open. Now in the next photograph, I've dissected away the margin of that with a scalpel and laid that flap of, of cartilage back. So that cartilage flap was completely dissected free from the underlying subchondral bone. And I just simply helped dissect the remainder and form the cleft all the way around to lay that flap back. If you look at these lesions in longitudinal section, here you have the cartilage flap where it's separated away at this junction here. And we have the cleft beneath the articular cartilage and a line of whitish opacity here in the subchondral bone immediately beneath the cartilage. The question grossly is whether that is still a portion of the articular cartilage or is it a reaction in the subchondral bone. And if you look at these, you'll find some where the cleft extends through the deeper layers of the articular cartilage down to the area of the calcified cartilage and very often at the junction of unmineralized cartilage and calcified cartilage interposed between that and the underlying subchondral bone. In other areas, the cleft will be clear down in the subchondral area and all of the calcified cartilage and unmineralized cartilage will be above it. The point is, and some people make a big issue of this, I think that these can begin in either location. I think that the lesion can begin down here or it can begin up here and many times it'll skew off in the same lesion and you'll find both situations as you do here. I think this is not two separate foci that are developing. It's one where the cleft has extended through the one area and has finally spilled over and, and broken down into the subchondral area. Before we leave that, I should point out that notice the reaction of the marrow spaces in the vicinity of these clefts. When it's up here in the articular cartilage, there's little reaction or change to it. But when it gets down beneath the calcified cartilage, you begin to get an intense reaction in the subchondral intertrabecular spaces. The reason being, the cartilage is avascular. There's nothing up here to allow for reaction to take place. You don't have any vessels in that area. You can't bring in uh, reparative cells. But when you get to this area, you begin to get degenerative change of the cartilage, and you begin to get then reactive change in the surrounding marrow. It becomes more fibrous in appearance. It becomes inflammatory in that there are inflammatory cells, a mixture of neutrophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells that react to that and you begin to form granulation tissue and eventually some new bone to try to reinforce this area where the defect has occurred. Here's another lesion in the articular cartilage of a pig. Again, a discrete area. The cartilage in the center looks relatively normal, but you have this lucent ring. And if we look at that in section, here's the defect in, totally in the subchondral bone. You have thickened articular cartilage above it, a little island of cartilage extending down here, and here about the normal thickness of the articular cartilage under normal circumstances. So we have here increased thickness of the articular cartilage. The question is, which came first? Did we have a lytic band here, and then growth of the cartilage, or do we have growth of cartilage and then the lysis develop secondarily? From what we've talked about in normal bone formation, you ought to be able to speculate in that, just like the growth plate, if you don't have blood supply to come in and mineralize the hypertrophy and chondrocytes, those cells don't degenerate and die. The suggestion being that as a result of this cleft-like formation, we've cut off the vascular supply from the epiphysis, and this cartilage simply proliferates and fails to undergo mineralization, degenerative change, and normal anchondral bone formation. Therefore, the overlying cartilage is thickened in nature. At the same time, you get this intense inflammatory reaction. It looks very similar to the lesion in hypertrophic osteodystrophy in the dog, doesn't it? Essentially, it looks similar to that when you look just at this area here. A lot of inflammatory cells, lots of osteoclastic resorption, reparative change, and thickening of the overlying articular cartilage. I said that this is being recognized as a more generalized condition, and here's a situation in the growth plate in fast-growing pigs, pigs that are doing quite well, 
uh, tend to develop these lesions more commonly than the poor doing animal. And here, thickened growth plates in this individual. Here it is microscopically, an island of cartilage that extends down into the metaphysis. Small little fragmented islands off here by themselves. And this reaction in the marrow spaces surrounding the island of cartilage. Not a whole lot different than what we see with uh, the changes associated in the Alaskan Malamute, where you had islands of cartilage extending down into the metaphysis. Perhaps that is a form of osteochondrosis also. Another growth plate, this is the epiphyseal plate on this side, an island of cartilage extending down here, and another one here, where we're beginning to get enchondral ossification. For one reason or another, this cartilage hypertrophied, matured, mineralized, and now is being replaced with bony trabeculae. Yes? The question is, do, does osteochondrosis affect the femoral head? And if it does, does it look at all like uh, leg calve perthes disease? It does affect the femoral head, but I don't think it looks like leg perthes disease in that in leg perthes you get necrosis and in the reparative stage the granulation tissue forming within a focal area of necrosis, but that's usually removed from the articular surface. And the changes in the articular surface are secondary to the degenerative changes in the femoral head, in, in that you get a collapse of the overlying articular cartilage and so on. But uh, you usually don't expect to see the thickened articular cartilage or these cleft-like changes in leg perthes. It's a much more extensive focal necrosis in the center of the femoral head and then collapse of the articular cartilage into it. Okay, osteoarthritis or osteoarthrosis, as the term is prob probably better referred to, since it's not really an inflammatory condition. It's a non-inflammatory arthritic change. And so osteoarthrosis or degenerative joint disease is probably the more proper term. A chronic disease of joints characterized by degenerative change in the articular cartilage with related degenerative and proliferative changes in the joint leading eventually to marginal osteophyte formation. A sequence of events, and it is a sequence of events that takes place over a period of time that ultimately leads to the marginal osteophyte formation, which is one of the hallmarks of this particular condition. I pointed out when we talked about hip dysplasia that that was one of the more common causes of osteoarthrosis in animals. Uh, here's an example of an animal that has extensive osteoarthrosis in the coxofemoral joints. You can see the osteophytic proliferations on the margins of the acetabulum here and in the femoral head over here. We divide osteoarthrosis into two general groups, one primary osteoarthrosis, and it's somewhat arbitrary, and secondary osteoarthrosis. The primary is so-called idiopathic osteoarthrosis in that it tends to be due to intrinsic changes and they're age-related, but we don't know of any specific predisposing event that led to the development of osteoarthrosis. In those situations, it's referred to as primary, and this is more commonly uh, used in man, perhaps, than it is in animals, because uh, we don't often know the history of the situation in animals, like we do in man. In secondary osteoarthrosis, it can be related to mechanical or functional stresses, trauma, anatomical abnormalities, such as hip dysplasia, and various other forms of either infectious or rheumatoid arthritis. So any of these conditions can lead ultimately to osteoarthrosis. And it's in those situations where you don't have any of these uh, preliminary events that we refer to it as primary. So it's somewhat academic that we divide it into primary and secondary. 
Let's look at the normal articular cartilage. The composition is that of chondrocytes, collagen. About 75% of it is water. The remainder is, in addition to the cells and the collagen, is proteoglycans, or the glycosaminoglycans, chondroitin-6, chondroitin-4 sulfates, and keratin sulfates, and protein. Normal articular part cartilage, smooth, glistening, bluish-white in appearance, very uniform, smooth surfaces. The subgrowth showing normal articular cartilage, uniform thickness of that cartilage, relative uniformity of the subchondral bone plate, and then the cancellous bone of the epiphyseal side with some areas of increased density as a result of mechanical stresses that are applied to a greater extent in one area than in the remaining areas. The higher magnification of the articular cartilage, the tangential layer where the cells are running parallel to the surface of the cartilage, then the intermediate zone where we begin to get clumping and cloning of chondrocytes the radial zone where they begin to line up in columns, the tide line, that wavy line that separates unmineralized cartilage from the mineralized cartilage beneath, and then beneath the mineralized cartilage subchondral bone. The normal layers and their relationships in articular cartilage. If you look at spatial stains that identify the proteoglycan content of articular cartilage, in this case of Van Gies and Alcy in blue, the concentration of the proteoglycans is located in the superficial radial zone primarily. The tangential layer is up here, the intermediate is right here, and the radial zone with its intense concentration of proteoglycans is here. The remainder of the radial zone, the tide line, is right here calcified cartilage here and subchondral bone. Normal situation and our old friend the proteoglycan aggregate that allows us to identify that material in the articular cartilage. Normal synovium, it consists of two or three cell layers of cells at the synovial surface, vessels, lymph lymphatics, and a fairly loose connective tissue in the stroma beneath, but a very thin, single to two or three cell thick synovial membrane under normal circumstances. Now, if we, before we talk specifically about osteoarthrosis, look at some things that happen if you mechanically create certain conditions in the joint. If you create defects in the articular cartilage that does not violate the mineralized cartilage in the subchondral bone, very little change occurs because you have to open up the subchondral bone and allow vessels to get in for, con for major reparative changes to take place in the articular cartilage. But if you extend into the subchondral bone so that you've opened that area up, you get fairly extensive repair processes. Here, if you create a trephine defect through the articular cartilage into the subchondral bone in this area, you get granulation tissue developing that extends up. First, there's a clot that forms in this region. The clot organizes, and you begin to get fibrous organization of the area in the region of the defect. You got a little bit of normal articular cartilage over here, and the other's out of view on the other side. So we've created a fairly good-sized defect that's beginning to fill in with fibrous tissue even after a week or two uh, post-operative. The next step <clears throat> is the early formation and chondroid metaplasia within that fibrous granulation tissue that's developed. A few fat cells begin to develop in here, probably degenerative change, but begin to get some chondroid metaplasia within that fibrous refill. And with a little additional time, those chondrocytes mature to the point that they begin to produce proteoglycans. And you now, in this saffron and O stain, can recognize proteoglycans present in the matrix surrounding the more mature chondrocytes. And eventually, with more time, over a period of two to three months, you begin to get intense proteoglycan formation in the deeper layers of that cartilage that's now developing. You still have an overlying region of predominantly fibrous tissue. And finally, you end up 
with here an island of cartilage that's formed in some of the granulation tissue that's now been separated. You've reformed a subchondral plate. You've left behind some fibrous tissue that's gone on to form cartilage. But up here, you've got pretty good cartilage formation filling that defect with a fibrous material overlying it. So it's a feeble attempt to replace a defect in the articular cartilage with new articular cartilage, albeit very poor quality cartilage. And with time, if this is in a weight-bearing area, this would break down very early and will not persist. OK, primary osteoarthrosis, the earliest change and the earliest morphologic change that one can recognize in osteoarthrosis is the lesion of fibrillation. In this articular surface, and this is from a sentry dog, there's a defect right here, a little cleft-like defect in that articular cartilage. Probably can't even appreciate it here, but it's in this subgrowth specimen right in this region here. No change in the subchondral bone, just a minor defect in the superficial area of the articular cartilage. Here's that lesion. You see it at higher magnification, normal articular cartilage, and these cleft-like extensions down into the underlying cartilage. Notice the tide line is normal. The calcified cartilage is normal. Everything is relatively normal in, in appearance, except for these clefts. And if you look at it at a little higher magnification, you have the clefts. But you begin to get some clumping and cloning of chondrocytes in the region. The matrix is paler than it normally is. So you lose proteoglycans. You begin to have loss of the ground substance into the synovial cavity and into the synovial fluid, along with the degenerative changes now that are beginning to occur in terms of the cells and the matrix. And well, this is happening. The synovium being phagocytic begins to take up the proteoglycans that are being extruded into the synovial fluid. And so you begin to get early reaction of the synovial membrane. A little bit of edema, perhaps, but increased numbers of inflammatory cells and synovial proliferation on the synovial membrane. The next stage in the development of this condition is chondromalacia. And here you begin to get greater destruction of the articular cartilage. You begin to get softening and focal degenerative change in a larger area of the articular cartilage. You can see that defect in the subgrowth specimen cratering out about a half of that articular cartilage. And notice the subchondral bone beneath. You're beginning to get some reactive change in the area beneath it. You're getting some reinforcement, probably as a result of mechanical stresses that led to the degenerative change in the articular cartilage to begin with. In this case, we have the malacia extending down through about 50% of that articular cartilage. It began as clefts extending into the articular cartilage. You can notice the paleness of the cartilaginous matrix right here beneath the area where we've lost the cartilaginous matrix, and the remainder being relatively normal articular cartilage. Now, as you begin to shed fragments of degenerative articular cartilage into the synovial space, the synovial cells begin to phagocytize this to a greater extent, and you begin to get an even greater inflammatory reaction in the synovial lining, and to the point where you get focal accumulations of inflammatory cells and so on. So you begin to get a pickup in the synovial reaction that's occurring as you go to this stage of the condition. The next stage is that of hibernation, meaning ivory-like. And the reason for that, I think, will be obvious. You get complete destruction of the overlying cartilage to the point where you expose the subchondral bone. And here, the entire thickness of articular cartilage has been denuded, at least down to the mineralized cartilage. So now all of the unmineralized cartilage has been shed off and stripped away. And we have mineralized cartilage here and subchondral plate beneath that. Higher magnification showing the margin of the articular cartilage down to the tide line with normal mineralized cartilage beneath. In other situations, you'll strip away not only the unmineralized cartilage, but also the mineralized layer 
and completely expose the subchondral bone. As you begin to do this, the degenerative changes in the articular cartilage above and the spilling of those degeneration products into the intertrabecular spaces in the subchondral bone beneath, in addition perhaps to driving synovial fluid down into this intertrabecular space, you begin to get chondroid metaplasia in the spaces, the marrow spaces in the subchondral bone. And that's what's happening here. And you begin to fill in then any open spaces where there would have been marrow spaces normally at the time the bone was exposed. And as you get wear on that surface, it becomes very smooth and polished in appearance and therefore the term ivory-like. But this begins with proliferation and granulation tissue proliferation and out of that chondroid metaplasia and the smoothing over of this surface. And again, because of extensive destruction of articular cartilage, you begin to get intense inflammatory reactions that picks up even more. And in some situations, because of the tremendous phagocytosis of proteoglycans and cartilage fragments, you begin to get chondroid metaplasia within the synovial villi themselves. And here's a synovial villus, and these are adjacent ones. And you're getting intense chondroid proliferation within the synovial membrane itself. And this often leads to the formation of the so-called joint mouse or loose body, where you get these lamellated uh, structures that are simply free bodies of cartilage, which survive and persist because they get their nutritional supply from the synovial fluid and are avascular. Higher magnification showing this laminated appearance that you see in a typical joint mouse. I think this is a good point to take a break and we'll come back and finish the next hour and finish up subchondral cysts and the remainder of the discussion on osteoarthrosis. The next stage in the development of osteoarthrosis is the formation of subchondral cysts. Here in a human humeral head, you can see a large lytic area in the head of the humerus, smaller ones adjacent to it, and even some in the distal scapula. Here's another lytic lesion here, one here, 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 multiple subchondral cystic spaces. These begin, and they may begin before you have complete destruction of the overlying articular cartilage. In this case, we have an ebernated surface. But even during the period that the cartilage is undergoing degenerative change, you begin to get changes in the marrow spaces in the underlying subchondral bone. It begins with a myxomatous degenerative appearance of the fatty marrow and the connective tissue in that region, followed by organization, granulation tissue, vessels grow in, and from that you then begin to get chondroid metaplasia and so on, and that progresses. As that occurs, you get resorption of the subchondral cancellous bone so that you create this lytic lesion, and that's what's happened here. These spaces become then filled with fluid that forms as a result of the degenerative process, so you come to have a fairly thin-walled, multi-loculated cystic structure in the subchondral region. Here's one in the early stages of development. These are much better developed. The other thing you should note is that when you have mechanical stresses applied to the end of the bone, those stresses can't be transferred across an empty space, so that stress force is applied around the margin. And in response to that, you get a reinforcement of bone around the margin of the subchondral cyst. 
The next stage is the development of osteophytes, or so-called marginal lipping. The mechanisms for osteophyte formation are basically three. Re either remodeling of articular cartilage, which is the most common, localized subperiosteal new bone formation, in other words, bone forming beneath the periosteum, or chondrification and then ossification of the insertions of tendons or joint capsule into the bone. Those are depicted here schematically. You get thickening of articular cartilage and then remodeling of that cartilage to form bone within the center. So you get a cartilage-covered osteophytic proliferation. In B, you have subperiosteal new bone formation within the confines of the joint cavity. Or you get chondrification and ossification of tendons or insertion of joint capsule in the bone. Here are marginal osteophytes, or so-called marginal lipping, these cartilage-covered knobby proliferations that you see along this one line here and a second row beginning in this region. Now, these look to be totally cartilaginous from the surface, but in fact are really osseous proliferations that are covered with cartilage. The way that they develop is that as you have extensive erosion, if we think of the condition of hip dysplasia as a classic example where you're getting articulation only along one surface due to the incongruity or luxation that occurs within the joint, you get destruction of articular cartilage. The normal cartilage surface originally extended out across like so, so that this was the arc created by the head of that bone. We've now destroyed articular cartilage and subchondral bone to the point where we have exposed subchondral bone, in other words, evernated bone here. Since all of that articulation is occurring here, we continue to get cartilaginous proliferation. The articular cartilage continues to grow in thickness. We're not wearing it off. It's very much like skin surface in that if you don't wear off that surface, just the same as you have uh, the situation that he develops beneath a cast on a leg, you get increased scurfy skin thickness beneath that cast. Same thing happens in the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage increases in thickness, and you then get ossification in the middle. And this becomes a marginal osteophyte, or a marginal lip. Here's a femoral head. Here's an ebernated bone surface here, subchondral cyst present over in this area. All of the gliding motion and all the articulation is occurring over this ebernated surface. And this surface has continued to proliferate, the articular cartilage has, to the point that you now have ossification occurring in the center. The old footprint of the subchondral plate, the original subchondral plate, is right here. That's the arc that would have followed on up out like so. But here is the cartilage that's continued to proliferate. It hasn't ossified in this region. But here we've got bony formation. So you get these knobby proliferations as you see them from the margin at the junction of the articular surface and the underlying bone. Higher magnification of the same, showing the old footprint of the subchondral plate, the cartilage that's proliferated here, and ossification within the center. Still higher, remnant of the old articular cartilage. Here's the old subchondral plate. This is original articular cartilage that's becoming degenerative. That was entirely cartilage out to this surface, but now we've gotten ossification in here. Why? Because this cartilage becomes so thick that the chondrocytes down here in the center are removed from their nutritional supply. Mineralization occurs. Degeneration of the chondrocytes occurs. Vessels grow in, and you begin to get ossification of that cartilaginous matrix. A schematic showing the areas where the majority of these osteophytes form at the margins of the acetabulum, as we talked about and discussed when we referred to hip dysplasia, at the margins of the femoral head and along the subchondral area, and even within the joint cavity, and down in deeper areas of the reflection of the joint capsule. Question. Yes. They're coming in from 
the subchondral plate extending up through. You got to bear in mind we showed the old remnant of articular cartilage. You got you're looking at something in two dimensions. It's really three dimensional. So you have an area where the vessels grow up through a bony bridge, and then you have a vascular supply up within that area where the chondrocytes are degenerating, and you go on and ossify it, and you continue to have vascular proliferation within that area. So they come from the subchondral region. But it seems like sometimes, I guess I don't really get the principle, it seems like sometimes the, the, when chondrocytes aren't getting what they need for nutrients, bone form, and yet it seemed like before what you said was that when the chondrocytes weren't getting what they needed, they slumped. Uh, with the uh, osteochondritis disappearance. Well, the question is uh, why in one situation when chondrocytes aren't getting their nutritional supply do they slough? In other cases when they're not getting their blood supply they don't undergo mineralization, right? That, right. What, that's what? Okay, I, I think the point is that we're talking about two completely different conditions. We're talking about nutritional supply and how that relates to survival of chondrocytes, but in the one case, we're talking about cells on a surface that depend on fluid transport through the ground substance to maintain the viability of the cells, in the case of the articular cartilage and the synovial fluid. And if they're cut off from that, they degenerate, you get degeneration of the cartilage, they slough because you've got continual motion and wear on the surface. And so the gliding action of those, the, the joint a action results in sloughing of those cells and matrix and so on into the synovial space. If you go back to the growth plate or the subchondral plate, there when you don't have blood supply that brings in the essential nutrients to allow for mineralization of the matrix, the chondrocytes don't degenerate and die and therefore they persist and grow into the metaphysis. But the one's dependent upon a vascular supply, the other is dependent upon other factors other than any vascular supply at all. And in this instance, you have a thickened articular cartilage. The cells, it becomes so thick, they can't, the diffusion of nutrients can't make it to that deeper layer of cells. So those cells undergo degenerative change there's enough vessels in the vicinity. Again, it's three-dimensional. You may have a layer of cartilage here and it looks like there aren't any vessels getting up there, but if you took another section, you might have vessels coming in right behind that. There are vessels there that allow for mineralization to occur, and when that happens, you'll go on and convert that, that mineralized cartilage to bone. So I think the answer is that you're, in the one instance, you're talking about synovial fluid nutrition, and the other, you're talking about a blood supply providing that nutrition. <clears throat> this subgrowth specimen simply illustrates everything that's been shown to date through the condition of osteoarthrosis. The destruction of articular cartilage, both on the acetabulum and on the femoral head, the subchondral cyst formation, multiple beneath the area where the articular cartilage had been present, osteophytic formation here at the margin here, up here in the acetabulum, the remodeling that's occurring here, the old subchondral plate and a marginal osteophyte here, subchondral cysts forming here, and all of the stages of osteoarthrosis with the possible exception of the early stages of fibrillation and chondromalacia being present within one specimen. I've put these slides in just to illustrate that we don't necessarily have to be talking about the, uh, the diathroidal joints of the long bones to witness osteoarthrosis. This is a vertebral facet from a horse that was a wobbler horse. And you can see the linear lines in the articular cartilage here. These are areas of fibrillation. As you get gliding action over these surfaces, the collagen fibers that come up into the tangential layer that run parallel with that surface articular cartilage arc down into the radial zone. And as you begin to, begin to get continued wear and tear on a cartilage that begins to undergo this degenerative change, you open up clefts that extend down into that articular cartilage. And that's what's happening here. And that's the reason for all these linear lines in the articular surface. Here's an area that is bordering on chondromalacia at this point in time. And these are all 
marginal osteophytes out at the margin. So you got a number of varying conditions occurring back here on the original articular surface, and in addition you have these marginal osteophytes. A subgrowth of that same region, here's the articular cartilage. You've got fibrillation, the clefts out here in the surface, another one up here, a subchondral cyst in this region, and here's the marginal osteophyte. It's connected down here in this region, and it's covered with articular cartilage. And a macerated specimen to show the appearance of these subchondral cysts and how they undermine and extend back in and underneath the articular surface. Here's one going in here and running down below, another one here, another one here, and a smaller one here. And the marginal osteophyte and the proliferation at the margins has given this a disc shape or a concavity that normally wouldn't be present. Instead of being fairly flat and smooth, you've got a, a concave surface to that vertebral facet. Okay, that concludes uh, osteoarthrosis. I think there were a couple questions, one relative to OCD and, and another relative to osteoarthrosis that we should try to answer before I go on and since we have a little time, pick up a couple other conditions that we've alluded to, but I didn't insert in the series of slides because I wasn't sure we'd have time to cover them. Uh, okay, question is, um, the pathogenesis of the osteochondrosis with this failure of endochondral ossification, is that related to a primary defect in cartilage matrix versus a primary vascular Okay, the question is, in the pathogenesis of osteochondrosis, is the uh, defect in cartilage matrix one of a vascular defect or a primary defect in the cartilage matrix? And the answer is, I don't know, and I'm not sure that anyone knows. The, some aspects of the lesion suggest that as a result of vascular destruction, you get increasing thickness of cartilage. Others would suggest that due to the increasing thickness of cartilage as it extends into the metaphyseal region that you then develop a cleft around that area. The thing that speaks against that is that in some of these the cleft is up in the between the mineralized and unmineralized cartilage and not always down in the subchondral region and that if it does extend on down you get the granulation tissue you cut off the blood supply and you get thickening of the cartilage in that area but in those areas where there's a cleft within the cartilage itself, you don't see that thickened articular cartilage. Uh, an, any number of factors have been suggested from hormonal to nutritional and in the nutritional category, everything from protein deficiencies to uh, mineral imbalances, vitamin uh, deficiencies and so on have been suggested. Uh, trauma, hereditary tendency, uh, any number of things. The point is that it's usually seen in the better doing individuals, in these rapidly growing, well doing pigs. You very seldom see osteochondrosis in poor doing uh, pigs, and it's a very common condition when you start looking at large numbers of pigs and simply split long bones. You'll see this lesion uh, in good doers a lot. Um, so I'm not sure uh, which one it is. There, you can find evidence to suggest that it could go either way. Uh, the lesion has many similarities to the lesion that you see in the Alaskan Malamute, where you have focal islands of cartilage extending down, and you will get some cleft-like formation around the margin of those islands of cartilage. Uh, the same way with uh, rickets. And uh, you can have, if in fact this is some uh, genetic uh, trait or if it's some uh, metabolic factor, uh, it you can't rule that out on the basis that these are fairly focal lesions because if you think back to rickets and the Alaskan Malamute, there are generalized conditions where you still get focal abnormalities in the growth plate and the articular cartilages. It's not necessarily uniform involvement of all articular surfaces. The growth plate in rickets is not uniformly thick all the way through. It's, it's focal and there are islands where it's uh, uh, very abnormal and other areas where you have a fairly normal thickness to the growth plate. So you can't rule out because these are somewhat focal in nature that it may not be systemic or metabolic or genetic in, in, uh, uh, in its cause. So I don't think the answer is there. I think a lot of people have looked at it from a number of different ways and I don't think we know the answer at this point in time.
you know, the question is the, the time sequence that it takes for these various stages of osteoarthrosis to develop. And the point to be made is that <clears throat> in a primary osteoarthrosis where we don't have any inciting cause, uh, it may be some focal degenerative change in, in the cartilage. Uh, it may be some very insidious factor in the cartilage itself that allows this degenerative process to begin with fibrillation and progress on through chondromalacia and so on. In a case like that, it may take years. In man with primary osteoarthrosis, it may take 20, 30 years for those various stages to the progression through those stages to occur. On the other hand, in uh, secondary osteoarthrosis, due to traumatic episodes or severe incongruity or luxation of a joint, you may pass through all of those stages in a matter of weeks or months. So it all depends on the inciting cause. It can be a very long, drawn-out uh, sequence of events. Uh, the dog that I showed you with the fibrillation, if that's a primary osteoarthrosis and that dog had continued on, it may have been four or five years before he would have been to the point of hibernation. On the other hand, if it's a severe uh, traumatic episode or something that's caused uh, uh, luxation or incongruity in that joint, you could pass through those uh, processes in a period of uh, 8 to 12 weeks, 2 to 3 months, and you could have severe hibernation and osteophyte formation and so on. So it all depends on what the inciting cause is as to how quick you, quickly you pass through those stages. You cover? Okay. Let me just cover a couple other things that we mentioned as we went along, and uh, I'll take a few minutes now and, and cover them. I mentioned when we talk about, talked about craniomandibular osteopathy, the fact that in the bull mastiff there had been a condition observed that was very similar to the lesion seen in CMO. And here is that lesion grossly, and you can see the tremendous thickening of the calvarium, even to a greater extent than we see in the craniomandibular osteopathy. And we don't have lesions in the tympanic bully or in the mandible in, in these animals. Here's the change radiographically. And you can even here appreciate some dense lines and bands radiographically, suggesting that there's increased density of bone here, less dense bone in this region, another line of density, and another line of density, and so on. Looking at the histologic changes in this, which is a markedly thickened periosteum with focal accumulations of inflammatory cells, and here and there some inflammatory cells within the marrow spaces of the bone beneath, that we're dealing with an osteoperiostitis, that it's a periosteal inflammatory reaction giving rise to all of this new bone. And if you could look at a subgross specimen and see this, you'd have areas of extremely dense bone here then spicular bone, and then another band of very dense bone and spicular bone, suggesting that there's been succeeding waves and bursts of inflammatory reaction and bone formation, and then another burst of activity, and then it slows down, and then the spaces begin to fill in, the same as it does in the subperiosteal reactions in long bones, and you get this, these waves of increased radiolucency and radio or radiopacity and then radiolucency. So that's the lesion that's been observed in the bull mastiff. Maybe this disease and this condition will shed some light and lead, give some uh, ideas about the possible etiology or the pathogenesis of the condition in the terriers with CMO. Hypervitaminosis A. We mentioned this when we talked about osteoporosis and said that it was one of the conditions that was characterized uh, as an osteoporotic condition even though we normally think of it as, uh, particularly in the cat, as being a disease that's characterized by exostoses. And I thought I'd just elaborate and clarify that, hopefully, a little bit. Hypervitaminosis A inhibits the formation of hydroxyproline and the production of mucopolysaccharides. At the same time, it increases both the number and the activity of osteoclasts. In the presence of excessive vitamin A, osteoclast numbers increase and their activity is increased. And at the same time, it tends to increase the lability of lysosomal membranes, having an opposite effect from that that steroids have on lysosomal membranes. The result of all of this is reduced synthesis of proteoglycans, less, fewer mucopolysaccharides in the bone matrix, increased degradation of chondroitin sulfate, reduced synthesis of hydroxyproline, 
and increased resorption of bone, increased osteoclastic activity, increased osteoclast numbers. The end result of all of that is osteoporosis, one, removing bone faster than you're forming it, and premature closure of the growth plate, or the physis. In the cat specifically, the excess vitamin A is usually from uh, eating diets high in liver primarily, and these individuals are good candidates for developing nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism because liver is severely imbalanced in calcium and phosphorus to a ratio of about 20 to 1. Over supplementation of vitamins and minerals uh, and perhaps restricted exercise because the cats that often develop this are cats that are pampered and, and fed the, the liver or the meat diets and over supplemented with minerals and so on. So the combination of all these factors may be what give rise to the clinical signs and the lesions. The clinical syndrome is characterized by stiffness and rigidity of the neck and as you'll see the exostoses explain that. Uh, the animals are often depressed, anorexic, they have dull hair coats, hyperesthesia, and it usually occurs in animals two to five years of age. The gross lesions are that of primary osteoporosis followed by secondary exostoses, usually in the area of the first to the third cervical vertebrae and in the ribs and, it's, and at insertions of tendons and ligaments. So the genesis of this condition is one of beginning with osteoporosis, but usually by the time it's seen, characterized by one of severe secondary exostoses over these osteoporotic bones. In addition to that, in the soft tissues, you have gingival hyperplasia, and as a result, loss of teeth, and a reddish pigmentation uh, of the hair. Here's a not so good uh, macerated specimen to illustrate the exostoses that have occurred here in the cervical region, virtually ankylosing all of those cervical vertebrae. It's been suggested that the gener that, that lesion occurs as a result of these animals constantly licking and grooming themselves uh, as a result of the dull hair coat and the changes in the skin and hair coat and that the constant stressing and turning the neck in doing this are what gives rise to these. That's logical and, and could be the case, but on the other hand, it may be an oversimplification of what's actually going on. Uh, but at any rate, these bones are weakened in structure and it's not, would not be surprising to see exostoses develop as a result of increased mechanical stress. Here's a long bone from a cat with hypervitaminosis A. You can appreciate, I think, the cancelization of the cortices, so you're getting increased resorption within the cortex and at the same time you're getting some subperiosteal new bone forming on the outer surface. Right here is a little line of new bone. The cortex is beneath and that's new bone formed subperiosteally on the surface. And that's a relatively minor change. Here's a more extensive lesion with a severe exostosis in the joint region. So they can become fairly extensive at times as well. Same one again. Pathogenesis, excessive vitamin A, its effect on osteoclasts and lysosomes leading to the osteoporotic change through all those uh, biochemical changes that we talked about. Superimposed mechanical stress, whether it be weight bearing or the grooming in the area of the cervical vertebrae and whatever, resulting in the subperiosteal exostoses that result and usually are the